Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Orr, and I'm the Director of Compliance with the New South Wales Resources Regulator. On behalf of the regulator, welcome to the 2021 Mine Rehabilitation Forum. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. It is great to be able to conduct this forum via this online virtual platform and connect with you all during these challenging times. We have over 300 participants today, and I thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend. Today's agenda has been developed to provide you with key insights from a range of presenters from the resources regulator and the mining industry. I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to all the presenters for making the time to speak to us today. I would also like to thank my amazing team and our wonderful industry engagement team who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make today's forum possible. The resource regulators presentations today focus upon transitioning to the new operational rehab reforms and showcasing new resources and technologies to support industry to comply with the new regulations. We're also excited to share the lessons learned from our regulatory activities and targeted assessment programs. I'm also looking forward to hearing from industry about geomorphic landform establishment, planning for mine closure, waste rock and tailings management, and corporate governance and risk management. And a special mention of our keynote speaker, Professor Greg Hancock, who will speak to us about the use of landform evolution modeling in constructing long-term stable landforms. This morning, I want to give you a brief overview of the regulator's strategic priorities for the next three years. Our strategic plan was recently published on our website and sets out our key regulatory priorities, which I'll share with you now. Our vision is a safe and responsible mining, extractive and petroleum industry. Our mission is to enable and support industry to understand and fulfill its obligations. And I can assure you the regulator is strongly committed to achieving these aspirations. Our strategic objectives include increasing stakeholder and community confidence in our compliance programs, supporting the responsible operation and development of regulated industries, and minimising harm to workers, the environment and the community. Our strategic goals include promoting confidence in the way industry is regulated, making it easier to comply and helping industry to get it right, uh, providing excellent excellence in regulatory service, services and being an employer of choice. We have five industry performance goals, but for the purposes of today, the two relevant goals um, that I'll, I'll speak to in more detail are increase the amount of amount and quality of progressive rehabilitation undertaken over the life of a mine and reducing the incidence of serious non-compliance with the Mining Act. In relation to increasing the amount of progressive rehabilitation, the regulator will improve the regulatory framework by implementing the operational rehabilitation reforms. These reforms will form the foundation of our regula regulatory activities moving forward and enable industry the flexibility to pursue best practice rehabilitation within the regulatory framework. We will focus upon security deposits returned as a key performance indicator and monitor and enforce progressive rehabilitation outcomes and rehabilitation sign-off. We will build on our technical and compliance publications to share information and learnings and clearly articulate our regulatory expectations. We will focus our regulatory efforts on critical controls and key risks to achieving successful rehabilitation. We will continue to enhance our systems to support industry and analyse and use data to inform our regulatory activities. We will monitor and enforce progressive rehabilitation over the entire life of a mine. In relation to reducing serious non-compliance with the Mining Act, we will adopt a risk-based outcomes-focused regulatory approach 
and focus our finite resources on the areas of the highest risk. We will share information and learnings and continue to be innovative in our methods of communication. We will expand our proactive targeted assessment programs, planned inspection programs and audit programs to focus on progressive rehabilitation and rehabilitation methodologies. We will monitor and enforce compliance and act on breaches swiftly in accordance with our compliance and enforcement policies. We will publish information about our compliance and enforcement activities and we'll use the appropriate compliance and enforcement tools for the individual situation. Over the last 12 months, the regulator has worked with its key stakeholders to develop and finalise the operational rehabilitation reforms. This work has included extensive consultation with the community and industry in relation to the development of new regulations which set, which set the foundation for mine re rehabilitation into the future. These regulations came into effect on the 2nd July, of July this year. The reforms will strengthen the regulatory framework, encourage best practice rehabilitation, and ensure that title holders progressively rehabilitate throughout the life of a mine. The new regulations require title holders to prepare a rehabilitation management plan, carry out rehabilitation risk assessments, develop a progressive rehabilitation schedule, achieve rehabilitation outcomes, make information about rehabilitation publicly available, and report annually on rehabilitation performance. Over the next 12 months for large mines and 24 months for small mines, we will be engaging with mines to ensure they comply with the new regulations. To achieve this in the current pandemic, the regulator will commence online engagement activities with mines while the public health orders are in place. This will ensure that we have active dialogue with industry about our expectations for compliance and enable us to assist industry to meet the new requirements. If you would like to arrange an engagement session, please email us at our email address, New South Wales Resource Regulator at servicenow.com. And I'll ask one of my team to uh, insert that uh, uh, email address into the chat. Um, but I'm sure many of you would have that email address. To support the reforms, we have developed the Mine Rehabilitation Portal that allows input of rehabilitation spatial data into a centralised geo database. The portal under, underpins key requirements of the reforms and provides mining companies a spatial tool to submit, analyse and report on their rehabilitation activities and track areas of disturbance and rehabilitation progress. The portal also assists the regulator to monitor and regulate rehabilitation requirements at mines. You will hear more about the portal later and we'll be holding a series of webinars for industry about the use of the portal. And we've run a number of those to date. If you haven't attended one of these, there are two more being held in the coming months. You can register on our website and the two dates, upcoming dates are listed on your screen in front of you. So please, if you're interested in attending, register on our website. We have also launched our Mining Act user portal and new online forms to improve the way we assess and respond to applications. Online forms allow data to be submitted directly into our management system, making the assessment process faster. Today, you will hear how the portal and new forms will support you to transition to the new regulations. I strongly encourage you to use the portal. To assist industry, we'll be running a range of webinars over the coming months to familiarise users with the new forms as they come online. Please embrace these new technologies and check out our feedback that you can see on your screen there. And most pleasingly, we've had many positive reports that you can, you can see there for yourself on the screen. We will continue our proactive inspection and assessment model and our compliance programs will monitor and enforce progressive rehabilitation. Our on-site inspection activities will focus on critical controls and risks to effective rehabilitation. We will act on non-compliances and take proportionate and balanced action in accordance with our compliance and enforcement policy. 
During the pandemic situation, I've asked my team to develop virtual inspection and audit programs to monitor and enforce compliance and assist industry to comply. We'll continue to publish a range of information and distribute this information broadly via our mine rehabilitation newsletter and biannual exploration and mining rehabilitation reports. We now have over 1,750 subscribers since the launch of this initiative in 2020. And I, I would encourage you um, to encourage your networks to subscribe uh, to our, our newsletters to ensure that they have access to all of this valuable information. Another key priority for the regulator into the future will be regulating, uh, sorry, will be, will be re rehabilitation sign off for mining areas that have been fully rehabilitated. There are many examples of where rehabilitation has been successfully achieved and approved as meeting the required rehabilitation criteria and the final land use. However, there are many areas where rehabilitation has been completed but has not yet been signed off by the regulator primarily because the sign-off process has not been instigated by the mine. If you have areas of rehabilitation that have been completed, but haven't been signed off, I strongly encourage you to engage with the regulator about achieving rehabilitation sign-off. We are continually looking for good examples of rehabilitation and publish positive rehabilitation outcomes via our rehabilitation information releases. This will be another key focus moving forward, and we look forward to sharing these positive rehabilitation outcomes with the community and industry. We will also publish investigation information releases into alleged non-compliances with rehabilitation requirements. We will build on innovative approaches to publishing rehabilitation outcomes and build on the use of novel and innovative ideas like our time-lapse mapping, virtual bushwalks, drone flyovers, and 360 degree photography, photography of rehabilitated mines. This initiative has been well received by the community and build both credibility for the industry and the regulator. And we look forward to advancing many more innovative examples in the future. In conclusion, I look forward to working with industry and key stakeholders to implement the operational rehabilitation reforms. I hope you enjoy today's forum. I'll now hand over to Matt, Matthew Newton, who is the Principal Inspector of Environment and Rehabilitation, who will chair, chair today's events. Thank you, Matt. Thanks very much, Steve. And um, bear with us, everybody, as we start to, to get used to this technology this morning. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, can people see my screen? Steve, you give me a nod. Yep, fantastic. So welcome everybody. It's just not full, not full screen mode, mate. No? Okay, I'll just um, zoom that up a little bit. Now this is just the, um, so welcome everybody. 333 participants, uh, which we within the Mining Act Inspectorate are pretty proud of, pretty chuffed. In fact, it, it's given us some bragging rights over our sisters and, and brothers in, in Mine Safety Inspectorate, because um, that sets a, a new resources regulator record for um, industry participants. So just a reminder that the, um, the forum um, uh, brochure is now um, online, um, but Bronwyn's also included that um, within the chat and Q and A boxes. So go and th go through that, and you actually see what's on throughout the day. Just to quickly give you a bit of an understanding of, of how we're going to structure today, um, I'll just go down to the program. Um, so essentially, this morning we're talking about uh, the rehabilitation reforms. Uh, what industry should be doing now to actually um, prepare so that they're ready um, to transition with new reforms when all the requirements go live come 2nd of July um, 2022. Um, but also um, provide an overview in terms of what we're doing as a regulator to prepare for that as well with our online forms and, and mine rehabilitation portal. Uh, we'll have a, a quick morning tea break um, then get into a session in the morning. Um, and you can see there's a large focus around risk management, which is a key principle that, that underpins uh, the reforms. Um, a 45 minute session for lunch. And then uh, we'll have our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Greg Hancock, talking about um, landscape evolution models. Um, and we also had some industry speakers around tailings and corporate governance, um, risk management, rehabilitation. Have an afternoon tea session. Um, then I'll be talking about our guidance on, on reasonably practicable. Um, but throughout the day, uh, we'll have 
you know, we're expecting various questions that come up. We will we will try and answer those questions and have a session at the end of each presenter's um, talk. Um, but where we can't um, answer all those questions, we'll actually start to bank those questions and, and have a panel session at the end of the day where um, we'll invite all of the speakers throughout the day to um, uh, to have a really good discussion. So um, have a think about some of the questions you might want to uh, throw at us uh, that afternoon. So um, that's that's a list of what's happening today. Um, to introduce this morning's session, I'd like to introduce you to uh, David Humphreys. Uh, David Humphreys is the Principal Compliance Officer of the New South Wales Resources Regulator. David started his career working as a town planner in 1991, taking on a variety of roles in South Africa, the United Kingdom and Australia. This included working in both the government and private sectors, undertaking environmental impact assessments for a range of building, infrastructure and mining projects. Since 2014, David has held various operational and management roles within the New South Wales government, focused on the regulation of exploration and mining operations. This work included the recent amendments to the mining regulation to introduce standard rehabilitation conditions across all mining leases in New South Wales. And David was a, you know, an integral part of that process. David is currently in the role of Principal Compliance Officer with the New South Wales Resources Regulator. So before I just go to, um, to David, I just want to uh, quickly go through some um, protocols. So essentially, um, obviously we're utilizing Zoom today. Uh, so during the presentation, attendees will be on mute. Uh, participants may use the, the Q&A box to ask questions or give feedback. And remembering this is an open forum, so please be respectful and use appropriate language. Uh, sim simply click on the Q&A icon in the, in the menu and type, type in your message. Questions uh, that we do not get throughout the day, as I said, uh, will be carried over to the panel session in the afternoon. Uh, and we're also looking to build more Q and A's um, so that we can actually publish that on our website. So anything that we don't get to today, we will endeavor to answer and, and publish that on our website if it's not already to date. Uh, so during the panel sessions in the afternoon, uh, participants may raise their hand if they wish to speak. Uh, we will then unmute you and you'll be heard by all attendees. You will need to have your computer audio enabled to do this, to raise your hand, Click the, uh, the raise hand button from your menu at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, if you're dialing into the session, please use star nine to raise your hand and star six to, uh, to mute and unmute. But I will go through this again this afternoon um, before the, um, the panel session. Um, so just a reminder that uh, this program, uh, this, this meeting is being recorded. So Dave, I'm gonna stop sharing now and um, welcome you to the, to the stage. Thanks, Matt. So just let me know when you can see my screen and then I'll kick off. Right, to go, Dave, that's good. All good, thank you. Right, welcome everybody. So today I'm gonna to give you um, a quick overview of the changes to the mining regulation that were introduced um, on the 2nd of July, 2021, and give some guidance to, to mines and industry about how you can start um, preparing for these, um, for the changes. Um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to um, have references to what we are terming large mines and small mines. Um, a large mine is essentially a mine that has an environmental protection license from the EPA under the Protection of the Environment Operations Act. Uh, and a small mine is, is obviously a mine that is, um, does not have a, an EPL. Um, so the changes to the mining and regu uh, regulation are going to introduce a new standard rehabilitation and reporting conditions across all mining leases in New South Wales. Um, it doesn't apply to expiration leases, just mining leases. Um, so in summary, the holders of mining leases are gonna be required to prepare rehabilitation risk assessments and implement control measures to eliminate, minimize or mitigate those risks um, to rehabilitation. Um, you're going to need to develop and seek approval from the Secretary of Rehabilitation Objectives uh, rehabilitation completion criteria, and for large mines, a final landform and rehab plan. You're going to need to develop and implement and publish a rehabilitation management plan, again for large mines only. You're going to need to develop and implement a forward program, and that provides a spatial progression of your rehabilitation and your mining activities for the next three year period. There's a requirement to undertake progressive re rehabilitation over the life of the mine 
and submit an annual rehabilitation report, which demonstrates how your rehabilitation is progressing against those uh, benchmarks and those milestones set out in the forward program, and also how um, you're progressing towards achieving um, your approved final land use. Um, the achievement of the approved final land use is a requirement to obtain uh, rehabilitation sign-off and, and relinquishment of the, of the lease. There's also a requirement to maintain records of all your actions um, to demonstrate compliance with the conditions, uh, to provide us with a written report of any um, non-compliances within seven days of becoming aware, um, to also nominate a contact person with whom the department can communicate with in relation to the mining lease. And finally, there's a requirement to give us uh, notice within 10 days of making a development application or a modification to a development consent and that requirement only applies to non-state significant development projects, because obviously as a state agency, we're involved with the state significant development um, projects already. Just to recap what Steve's really touched on, but there's a range of guidance material and fact sheets on our website, and this includes all the information that I'm presenting today. So, there's, um, so don't worry if you miss anything or you need further information, it's all available on the website and we'll be adding new material through the coming weeks and months um, as we develop those um, additional guidance um, bits and bobs. Um, on the website are also what are called form and way documents, which might be a, a term that people are not familiar with. Um, throughout the legislation or the changes to the reg, you'll see the, the um, term, the need to prepare something in the form and way. Um, these are basically documents which outline the content requirements um, for some of the rehab documents that you're gonna to need to prepare, such as your rehab management plan, um, your rehab reports, your forward program, and so on. So when will the new conditions apply? Um, so even though the regs commenced on the 2nd of July, 2021, there's a transition period to enable industry um, to prepare and obviously get ready for the changes. So in summary, the new conditions will apply to existing large mines on the 2nd of July, 2022. So that's 12 months from the date regulation commenced. Uh, for ex existing small mines, it's commencing on the 2nd of July, 2023. So that's two years from the date. And for any other mining lease that um, is granted um, after the 2nd of July, um, it's actually on the, that's incorrect. So I've got 2022 there. So basically any lease granted from after 2nd of July, 2021, it's from the date that the lease is granted. So that allows a transition period for people to sort of get ready for these reforms. So what's gonna happen um, with your mining, your existing mining lease? So for um, each current mining lease, uh, we're gonna review, and this, this has started already, we're gonna review all the existing conditions on your leases. And as a lot of miners know, those can, vary from 13 conditions to up to 30, 40 conditions on leases, depending on how old your lease is. Um, and we're gonna identify um, all the conditions that are not only required. So in, in essence, what are the conditions that already dupli duplicate or are inconsistent with the prescribed conditions in the regulation? Are there any special conditions that we need to keep? And then what we'll do is gonna prepare you with a, um, uh, provide you with a draft revised instrument we're going to provide that to the holders and there'll be a, a period of time to make a submission back to the department um, of at least 28 days. It's likely to be longer than that um, so that you can review those conditions and provide us with any feedback um, about them. And um, after that process is finished, we'll issue you, you with a new um, standard mining lease instrument prior to the um, commencement date, depending on whether you're a large or a small mine. So what, what this means is that for most mines, your mining lease is really gonna only have um, three conditions. The first one is the standard requirement to give notice to landholders where your lease includes surface rights. So that doesn't apply to underground mines. Um, secondly, there's gonna be a standard clause requiring you to apply um, to the department to undertake exploration activities on your mining lease, and that only applies to exploration activities that aren't already approved in your development consent. And the third condition is gonna be in relation to your, your security bond. So that will um, set out the dollar amount of the security that each 
um, title holder needs to to provide to to the department, and those are those are conditions that are not not included in the reg primarily because they they vary between um, different mines, particularly with regards to the security amounts. Obviously, different for um from different mining operations. Um, one of the questions we get asked um, or have been asked is what happens to your current um, mining operations plan. Um, so the requirement to comply with your mining operations plan will remain until your um, until the new conditions apply to your mine. So when the new conditions commence, um, the requirement for a mop is uh, will fall away and will be replaced by the requirement for um, a rehab management plan and a forward program that um, provides the timing of the um, of, of the of the rehabilitation and mining activities. So the dynamic component of of the MOP is now um, the forward program. So if your MOP is going to expire during the transition period, um, we're encouraging you to apply to the regulators for an extension to ensure that you remain compliant during the interim period. Um, and we're really trying to encourage mines to focus their efforts on preparing the new documents to get ready for the commencement of the regulation, as opposed to preparing and updating in, um, their, um, their current mining operations plans. Now, if um, mines have got any questions about particular circumstances with their with their mops um, about to expire or needing to to change, uh, we're just encouraging you to get in touch with uh, with the department, and we can uh, walk you through that process to make sure that you remain in compliance during this um, transition period. So, what should um, large mines do now to get ready? So, obviously, large mines are going to be the first cab off the rank, and there's um, a range of things that they can do between now and the commencement date um, to get ready. Um, the first thing I need to do is, is prepare and submit their rehabilitation spatial data themes um, via the mine rehabilitation portal. So in summary, to do this, um, the first thing they should do is register for and attend one of our mine rehabilitation workshops. Um, we've already had three workshops, um, which have been extremely well attended. Uh, we've got another two workshops coming up um, and those details are, are on our website, as Steve said at the beginning. And Will Mitri in his, in his presentation today is going to touch on that as well. Um, obviously, review the guideline documents on our website that deal with the rehab portal. Um, create your user account within the portal. Um, and then you can start submitting all your required spatial data themes. Um, and those requirements are set out in the guideline um, or the form and way documents that are on our website. So there's form and way documents in, in relation to the uh, final landform and rehab plan, and there's also spatial data requirements relating to your um, to your forward program as well. And then finally, once you've done that, um, you're able to generate a, a PDF of the of the plan, which you can include in your in your rehabilitation management plan, which I'll I'll touch on on the next slide. Um, in addition to your spatial data requirements, um, large mines should also um, start preparing your rehabilitation management plan. Again, look at the form and way document on our website, which provides the content requirements for that plan. Um, ensure that your plan includes the specific matters outlined in clause 10, brackets one of the, of the regulation. Um, uh, make sure that it also includes your rehabilitation objectives and your completion criteria. And again, there's guidance on the website about um, those two um, statements. Um, ensure that it includes the PDF copy of your final landform and rehabilitation plan, which you generated out of the portal. Um, and the final requirement is, um, is a requirement to publish the, uh, the plan on your website in a prominent position. Um, and for those companies that don't have a website, um, there are alternative provisions in the regulation in terms of making that publicly available upon request within a certain period of time. So that is not a plan that's submitted to the regulator. It's just a plan that's made publicly available and can be a record that we may use to um, in our compliance activities across the across the particular mine. So, in addition to those requirements for large mines, all mines um, have a range of things that they can start doing now to get ready, and that includes preparing um, a rehabilitation risk assessment and commencing to implement the risk control measures that are identified through that assessment. Again, there's guidelines on our website regarding rehabilitation risk assessments and um, also in relation to identifying the, the controls, the risk management controls. 
Um, you can also start preparing your rehabilitation objective statement and the rehabilitation completion criteria statement. Again, there's guide, guidance documents on our website in that regard. Um, and also start preparing your forward program for the next um, three years of your, um, your mining and your rehabilitation activities. And again, there's guidance on our website about the form and way in terms of that um, particular report. So in the next presentation, um, and Steve also talked about it at the beginning, you'll um, hear more about our resources regulator portal, uh, which is currently being upgraded to enable the mines to do all the things that are required under the new regulations. Um, so this includes um, applying to us to have multiple leases treated um, as, a, as a single lease. So obviously for mining, uh, mining operations, um, most of the large mines have multiple leases. So there's an opportunity to bring those, those leases together um, for the purposes of all your reporting um, requirements and plan requirements. Um, you can also apply to change the annual reporting period and the submission date of the annual report, um, which can align to, um, for instance, your annual review required under the development consent. Um, you'll be able to lodge your objectives, uh, your rehabilitation completion criteria, your forward program and your annual report to the department through the portal. But you'll be also able to lodge any amendments to those rehab documents through the portal. You'll be able to report non-compliances. You'll be able to nominate a contact person and also finally give us notice of any applications for non-SSD consents, including any modifications that are, that are made. Um, so the updates to the portal will be done incrementally. Um, the first change is gonna be the ability to uh, nominate a contact person, um, as well as treat multiple leases as a single lease. Um, and um, my understanding is that, we, that that update is, is imminent and, and will be released soon to industry. Um, what about expiration on a mining lease? So this is a particular change um, that will occur as a result of the, the change to the regulation. So as you know, expiration on a mining lease was previously approved as part of the mining operations plan. Um, with the mop condition being removed, um, there will no longer be an approved mop and the requirement to obtain um, approval for expiration will be included as a special condition on the mining lease. Um, so in essence, if you wanna undertake expiration on your mining lease, um, you'll need approval um, from the department unless that expiration is exempt development under the mining step, which covers a lot of the low impact expiration activities. Um, or the activities have already been approved in the development consent, which is a case for a lot of the, the SSD mines. Any existing approvals uh, under the MOP that have not been completed uh, when the transition period is over it will lapse when the, when the regs commence. And we're in the process of working with mines to facilitate the completion of these expiration activities using a new approval pathway. So again, I encourage you to get in contact with the department if you have um, existing approvals that have not been completed, um, get in touch with us and we'll work, um, work through that with you to have a seamless transition into the, into the new regulations. So that's really it from my side. Um, if you need more information, there's the website. Um, you can send us an email, you can give us a call. I'd also encourage you all to get on our website and subscribe to Mine Rehabilitation News. That comes out every every month or two, and it always includes um, updates regarding these reforms, as well as any publications that have been uh, been put on the website. So, um, thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, we do actually have a couple of questions. Um, so we have one from Claire Smith here. Um, so, do existing leaseholders need to comply with a mop in the period between the imposition of the new condition and the submission of the rehab objective documents? In particular, if a lease has say six months and, uh, for an extension for preparing the rehab objective docs, does that mean there'll be significant period after the imposition of new conditions where there is neither an effective MOP or applicable rehab objective documents? What happens during this period? Does the title holder need to continue to comply with a MOP? So I responded essentially saying that um, your MOP continue, continues um, up until the end of the transition. So um, continue to, continue to um, comply with the mining operations plan. Yeah, that's right, Matt. And there's there's information on there's a fact sheet on the website about transitioning to the reforms, and there's a whole section there on on mobs as well. So. 
And a similar question from uh, Chris Schultz. Um, do you only need to apply for an extension to a MOP that expires during the transition period to the 2nd of July? Um, or do you need to account for an additional period until the RMP is approved? Uh, so similarly, what I said here in, in the response was that um, we are encouraging leaseholders to apply for extensions of their MOP, MOPs over that time. Um, but come and talk to us in, about any site specific details. Yes, I think the question there was up. It's really up to that date that the regs commence. It doesn't need to go beyond that date. That's right. Uh, this next one, Dave, was, um, it was from Kelly. Uh, does any applica does an application need to be made to group MLs for reporting purposes or can holders rely on a pre-approved group reporting? So no, the question is you need to reapply. Um, to have those multiple leases treated as a single lease for the purposes of the of the regulation, and that'll be a pretty simple process with the portal when that's um when that's up and running. And that essentially that'll come out in some correspondence between um, resource regulator and Meg in the coming weeks that will outline that process. Are there any other questions? I uh, have another one. The QA. Okay. No other questions at this point in time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, sir. Very good. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so I'd just like to introduce our, our, next, our next speakers. So, Mr. Jeremy Arnott, who's the Inspector of Environment, uh, New South Wales Resources Regulator. And Mr. Will Mitri, Senior Inspector, Environment, New South Wales Resources Regulator. So Jeremy has been employed by the New South Wales Resources Regulator and formerly the Environment Sustainability Unit for eight years. He has assessed hundreds of mining and exploration applications and is currently the design lead for the regulator's move to the online forms and functionality. Overall, Jeremy has more than 14 years of environmental compliance, auditing and management system development in the mining industry, both internationally and across Australia. Uh, Will Mitri uh, has worked in environmental management roles in heavy industry, blue scope steelworks and coal mining, underground coal, before joining the resources regulator as an inspector of environment in 2013. Will's work in the regulator has been focused on improving systems for the regulation of mine rehabilitation, with a keen focus on improving situa situational awareness of the resources regulator through bespoke GIS-based systems. Uh, Will is passionate about improving the rehab outcomes of the mining industry and is inspired by the great outcomes being achieved in mine and rehabilitation across the state. So hopefully what you'll see from this, this session is that the regulator is really getting the new century and um, hopefully making a lot more streamlined for run the industry to, to utilize. So without further ado, um, Jeremy, um, welcome to the podium. And then meet Jeremy. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm just sharing my screen now. Um, so Will and I, and please let me know, we can all see yeah, the screen. Can, yep, see the screen Perfect. And hopefully it's on the presentation one and not on my window. Um, now, as Matt said, yes, we are pushing the regulator and um, into the new century, and we've got to give us credit, New South Wales government, and it is 2021. So we're 21 years into the new century, and we're pretty much getting ready to do it. So that's that's pretty good for us. Um, Will and I are going to sit and talk to you briefly about the two portals. Um, one's called the Re Regulator Industry Portal, or just commonly called the Portal. And Will will be talking about the mine rehabilitation portal, sometimes referred to as the GIS portal. Just thought I'd quickly clarify that language just in case we, in my nerves or whatever, we, we, we give you the wrong ones. Um, essentially, and, and again, sorry, two quick things, just two or three housekeeping things before we get really into this talk. Um, my neighbor has decided that he wanted to, to work on his NBN and is currently digging holes near the NBN cable as we speak. So if I suddenly disappear, it's not because I don't love you. Um, it's simply because someone's hit the wrong chord. Uh, third, secondly, my screens are separated from my from my camera. So if you see my ear a lot, I'm just because I'm looking at the wrong screens. And thirdly, I know Matt described the protocols for asking questions and so forth. Um, in about five or 10 minutes, I'm going to finish talking to slides and actually show you some of the portal. 
if you have questions, please raise your hand straight away. And Bron or Matt, if you could let me know what those questions are, because hey, if we may as well ask them while we're seeing them, so I know what to show. Um, please bear in mind that these are, this is only a 20 minute, 30 minute talk. Uh, when we get closer to releasing the forms, we're going to have larger, longer, more interactive um, forums, but this will just give you, you know, a, a view of what we're, what we're doing. So, whoop. new online technology, while working in partnership, Will and I and, and the rest of the regulator have um, designed the two portals, the, the, I suppose the consensus or the emphasis and priority of this is data. Um, not using an online system, not having a, a database software available means that the data that we get is in PDF form, in paper form, and is completely isolated from any sort of centralized system. And it is practically useless when we are dealing with such time pressures and the amount of data that we, we now need to capture. So what we're trying to do is to ensure that all the data is essentially added once, as required, and that data can be reclaimed by us or by you whenever needed and um, manipulated or interpreted or, or, or investigated at how we see fit. The, the way to see the separation of the two portals is the rehabilitation portal is for all your spatial data, your, your essentially mapping information. And the other portal is all for your, your words to accompany it, essentially. It's, the, it's, your, it's your forms, you're your, your more of a boring bit. So um, I probably should keep going to get you to the more exciting part. Um, so the industry portal, and we started building online forms last year for the exploration world. We've pretty much finished the exploration side of things. Um, most of you should be familiar or uh, will likely be familiar with the portal for because Mind Safety have been operating in this space for quite some time. Uh, we are packaging probably close to eight to 12 forms to be released July 2, when the bulk of you go onto the standard conditions. And I will talk to those forms pretty much for the next 10 minutes or so. And we are going to start with all the things that you necessarily will need to use with associated with Schedule 8A. The, one of the benefits of using the forms is that they're, they're automated and as automated as possibly can get. Uh, for instance, any information, static information that you need to add for your mind, for instance, we're going to ask you things like your life of mine, uh, when, how far away are you from closure, um, just your, your development consent numbers, project approvals and so forth. You're only going to need to ask us once. That information will be carried over every time and be, can be accessed. So gone are the days where you need to complete mindless data PDF uh, application forms. Plus, any information that relies on your GIS data will be automatically uploaded into the form every time you open it. Hopefully, and presumably, uh, saving you a lot of time in, in double handling data. Once uh, the application is submitted, you can actually open a dashboard on that application. You'll get updates on the status of that application, and you'll even get the officer who is, who is looking after it. There will also be a chat um, availability communication process for you to, to, to talk with that inspector and that inspector can chat with you and say, look, we're needing some more information, this is missing or something like that. And that hopefully will also eliminate the stop the clock more information provision that we've been relying on for a long time. Uh, we have a, a, a draft function with majority of the forms. The draft function allows a user to op open the form, add information that they need, they can then close it down and another user from the same organization who may be on the other side of the planet can open it up and then uh, complete the form. We'll also add uh, all of the guidance material that David spoke of uh, that you can find on the net with respect to the rehab reforms. All of that information is embedded in the form at the point in which you need it. And I'll be also including videos and, and other how to's as we go along. We're also hopefully, and, and this is not something that's going to be happening very soon, but we will in the long term hope to have an interactive uh, section there that you can interact with members of um, the regulator as you go if you need like a, a help function. You often see that in online shopping or um, those sorts of interactive forms. And 
once you've actually got that data embedded into the system, you then will have an easier opportunity to update it. For instance, once you've submitted your rehab objectives and something changes along the line, you will be able to just pull out that objective and manipulate it as you see fit and resubmit it for approval. Uh, the forms that we are going to prepare ready for July 2 are listed on the screen. Um, essentially, the, the, the top four are coming straight out of Schedule 8A and the, and the new reforms. The, um, the rehab completion and rehabilitation cost estimates are essentially a replacement of the old ESF2 form that are currently in use as we speak. And it's important to note that the blue uh, forms have actually already been released. We did a soft launch of these forms over the weekend. Um, I believe someone asked David in the previous uh, seminar of whether we can, whether um, everybody needs to group into a single lease uh, for the purposes of Schedule 2. And yes, well, that form is actually available as we speak. So you can you can get on there now and, and do it as you as you like. And if there's any dramas, issues or comments, just, just, just let us know. Um, once the forms have been created and well, essentially they have been created, we're, we're now in the process of refining and testing, but we will be delivering a lot of uh, industry workshops over the next year or over the probably the first six months of next year. And I will deliver um, talks on pretty much every new form as it gets released or a suite of forms. And I'm not exactly sure how we're going to, to or when those times are going to happen, but we will give plenty of notice. Um, I'm going to ask for a lot of feedback. One of the things about these forms is that you guys will be the ones using them. So I would love to hear if there's any issues or any dramas during these feed, uh, during these workshops. So please keep an eye out for that. We'll advertise it through the portal and all our usual communication needs. Um, and lastly, just before I get on to just whipping around and showing you some of these forms, we will be doing, we're doing two uh, sets of testing. A lot of the forms are currently under testing as we speak, but next uh, year we'll be ready for beta testing and we'd like some help from, from industry. Uh, this is the best time for us to find out, yeah, are there, is there a better way of presenting this information? Does it work and does it co coexist with your systems? Um, with the exploration forms that we released last year and earlier this year, we've, we've we took on a lot of feedback and found out a lot of good information and we're actually currently doing that as we speak, uh, putting CSV and, and Excel up, uploads with our drill holes and so forth for exploration. So yes, so next year, if you are very keen to, if you've got, I know this is a funny thing, and but if you do have some available time, please get in contact with the regulator. We'd love to register you for interest and I can guide you through testing. Um, even if it is just 10 minutes and looking through the form and saying, yeah, I don't like the color, that'll just anything to do will help. Um, yeah, and like I said, you guys are using it, so please let me know. Um, so that's pretty much all of the talking part for my section. Um, I thought I'd just now run you through what, what they look like, and I believe, where is my, aha, uh, share, new share. Um, Matt or Brown, am I showing right one okay? Yeah, that's up on the regular Excellent. portal. Excellent. So, so hopefully most of you are familiar with the portal in some aspect. Uh, believe that um, most of you should have that with some sort of mine safety experience or in our exploration world. But for those who are uh, uh, are brand new, this is the the regulator portal in its new guise. The Stuff associated with the Mining Act Inspectorate or the Mining Act is under the title holders portal. There are other links, for instance, or obviously the GIS or the Mine Rehab portal here. Um, but this is essentially where, where you can go and this is your homepage. Any announcements or news, art, news information that we need to provide with you, we're based here. And we have one of the biggest search um, sections on, on websites. So if you have any issues or you need to go straight to a question or something like that, whack it in there. Ah, excellent. 
I have just realized I've just been timed out. I won't be a second. Jeremy, just while you're um, sure. yeah. looking through that, um, we have had some reports that people are having issues with the sound. Um, we're still hearing it okay, but if you are having issues with your sound, um, just encourage you potentially to dial out of the webinar and then come back in, that might clear it. Um, it could be a bandwidth issue. So, um, but um, we are recording this well in this, this um, today and, and it will be up online as well. Um, but um, apologies if you are having sound issues, but um, hopefully that, that will help. Thank you. That was a deliberate technical issue to give Matt opportunity to make the perfect announcement. Now, this is essentially the home page for all the title users, uh, title holders or authorized users on behalf of the title holders. What you can, um, what you will notice is that we have a, a series of widgets and um, what we're going to do now is just show you where the forms live. And, in the, the Mining Act sphere, these are the forms that we have on, and will be available July 2 next year. Some of these are associated with the exploration world, but the majority of these will be mining ones. For instance, the nominated contact person and rehab cost estimate. Uh, if I wanted to launch a non-compliance, it is a very straightforward process. Um, you click on here, it automatically loads up and you fill the data. It is very, very, very straightforward. And I suppose now in pandemic and everyone's used to online shopping and interactive play, it is it is very much follow the bouncing ball. So for some of the smaller forms, this is um, that's essentially the straightforward nature of it. There are the more complicated forms. And I thought considering one, the majority of the mining forms haven't been fully finalized and they're still in testing. I don't want to give any bump steers. I don't want to, someone to open up the form and go, oh, that doesn't happen or, or whatever. I thought I'd show you one of our more mature forms, which is in our exploration world. And this is the accessible prospecting operation. The reason why I wanted to show you this one is that it shows you the major breakdowns of the forms and how that they're going to function. We have the form proper, which, is tabulated and follows you down a path as you need to complete each question. There are important things like such as save and save your draft and, and, and to prevent loss or that if you want to leave, that data is captured. But also we have a guidance section which provides information relevant to that section of the form. And if we feel or we hear that it's a bit complicated or it may need further instruction, we provide demonstration videos. Um, and that's something that I do apologize because the majority of them will have my voice, but hey, it's, it's, it's what we can do, I guess. The, so essentially that is how the forms are going to break down. They're going to um, follow you along and then eventually you just sign your life away and submit. And then they will return back to our Waiting for. Now, let's say, for instance, I have submitted a. Form and I have all the information pertinent to this. I have the uh, who is operating it. This is essentially what I described before as a, a the dashboard for that submitted um, application. And. I can now type a message to the inspector. Um, I can find out the status on how it's going. I can obtain further documentation. And one of the functionalities that we're going to include and we're testing as we speak is the ability to withdraw the application or to cancel it or modify it. That's something that's coming well into the future, but that's, that's there as well. Um, I suppose that is essentially the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, unless there is any, are there any questions, queries or comments straight off the bat, Matt? Yeah, Jeremy, just a quick one. Can companies have multiple portal logins? Uh, yes. So the act provides for a nominated contact person or the, the new reg, sorry, uh, for a nominated contact person. That is the recipient of any formal information from us. The 
input of information, which we, we, we call an authorised representative. The title holder can nominate as many authorised representatives as he or she sees fit. Um, and we have found that in the exploration world, there's usually, you know, the exploration manager, the enviro, um, drilling, the geologist, they've all have a login themselves and can get on. The one thing to just note is that the uh, portal doesn't differentiate anybody. So if you are an authorised rep, you have the same access as everybody else within that within your title holders, uh, maybe. So yeah, um, and to your question, yes, you can have as many uh, logins as you as you wish. Um, if that's it for questions, Matt, I might just pass on to. Yeah, um, no other questions at this point, sir. Sweet. I'll just go back to the presentation and. Head over to Will. Thanks, Jeremy. I'll just wait for that presentation to come up. So this will just be a very brief introduction to the mine rehabilitation portal. Uh, as David indicated, we've run three training sessions for the mine rehabilitation portal. Um, Jez, I'm still seeing your regulator portal page map, not the slides. That's it, thank you. Um, so we've run three training sessions, which are more in-depth, step-by-step um, training about how to prepare data and how to submit the data to the mine rehabilitation portal. And I'll, my last slide will, will cover some more info on that. So today, really, it's about introducing the mine rehabilitation portal, what it does, um, and what types of data we're requesting of you as part of these new regulations and how to access it. But I would encourage anyone that hasn't been to the, the training sessions today, which I think probably most people in this session, because we've had 180 or so people attend the sessions up until now, um, potentially more GIS based people rather than what we've got today. But um, yeah, enrol and we've got two more live sessions in the next two months. And then uh, there is also some re recordings of previous sessions on our website already. Now, the mine rehabilitation portal is split into two key components. We've got the upload portal, which deals with the data management. So that's where you upload your spatial themes. It's where you will validate your spatial themes via our validation um, geoprocessing tools and then submit those spatial themes to the, to the database. It also has quick links to different aspects of the map viewer component of the portal and it um, manages our user management as well. Um, the map viewer is a, another component of the portal and that handles lots of workflows associated with the actual data. So that's where you will view your data that you've submitted and you can run various workflows such as uh, generating your KPI reports, printing your plans and other workflows that we've built into the system. Next slide, thanks Jess. So for those people that don't have access yet, um, you need to generate an account. You need to create an account. If you're a, a title holder or a title holder representative, um, you we will go through a process of approving you for access to the portal. And for consultants that will are required to submit on behalf of the title holders, then currently we've got just an email um, approval process that you must follow. Um, so that's basically just an email through to me from the title holder approving your access um, if you're a consultant. Now we are building that approval process into the regulator portal. Um, it's, it's not ready yet, but it will be coming very sh shortly. And that'll be a very straightforward process where the title holder will nominate people that they approve via an online form. Um, for access to the mine rehab portal. There's 
10 themes that are required to be submitted to the mine rehabilitation portal. Six of those themes, the, the top themes in that table, are submitted annually as part of the annual rehab report and forward program. And the bottom four themes are submitted as part of the final landform and rehabilitation plan. Both, all of that data gets submitted via the same process on the same form. Um, it's just a matter of you loading up a different uh, zipped shape file uh, onto, onto that form. There's a range of guidance material um, on our website. So I would encourage you to jump onto the website, have a look through the guidance document, have a look through the videos that we've got um, in that, on that webpage. Um, there's also sh shapefile and file geodatabase templates that uh, basically templates for all of those themes. And if you're using those templates, then you're gonna have a much easier process of submitting data to the portal because the validation process will be auto automated um, and the validation process will be, sorry, much simpler because you've used a compliant um, template to, to get started. So I very much encourage um, you to jump on and download, download those templates for use. Um, on that, via that link also, the, the, that's where you'll get the video of past um, uh, training sessions that we've run. So it's, it's, it's a two hour training session and the, the, the video is, the video link is on that webpage. So if you can't make it to any of the future live training sessions, I would encourage you to uh, review that, that video at any time. And you can always send through an email if you've got any questions about anything that's covered in that training session. Now, these are the training, the last two training sessions that we've got planned at this stage. Now, if there's further feedback that comes in about specific aspects of submitting data, we may have follow-up um, follow sessions where we go into potentially more detail around certain areas that people need clarification on, but I don't think that will be um, required. I think we cover most of the material that you'll need in that training session. So, uh, but as always, there's always questions and, and things that come up. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll play that by ear and don't be, don't be scared to send us through an email. We understand there's a pretty, pretty large learning curve and, and change process that needs that mine sites need to go through to come up to speed with these new requirements. And we want to be here to help you get through that process. Uh, we, the first year is going to be the biggest, uh, biggest challenge to get up to speed with the, what needs to be done. But subsequent years the, the should be relatively straightforward in terms of submitting that, that spatial data because you'll already have that compliant data set. Um, that you can go to each year. Now the webinars cover the following topics. So we go through an overview of the mine rehab portal, the look and the feel, and go through each of the different workflows that we've created. We look at how, um, what the key requirements are for creating your data sets, then how to submit those data sets via the mine rehabilitation portal. We look at the reporting capabilities, um, for example, when you submit your uh, data to the mine rehabilitation portal, there's an automatic KPI report that's generated. That KPI data gets stored in a database and that data is automatically sent through to the regulator portal. And that data will then pre-populate your annual rehab report and forward program form uh, with those KPI, KPI numbers. So, We've taken a lot of the grunt work out of that for you through this um, automated online process. Um, but obviously, we're, we're, our requirement is that you do submit that GIS data. Um, so a bit of a, a two-way process there. But we hope, yeah, we hope that the value 
you guys get out of this process is uh, as much as what we're going to get out of it as well and ultimately help us all achieve good rehabilitation outcomes. Next slide. Thanks. I think that's it. That's it for me. So if there's any questions, Matt. That's not very good. Um, thank you, Will. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I, I guess some of the key take-home measures um, messages that I want to get out from, from that presentation is that um, uh, form and way documents for the annual rehab report and forward program for both large and small mines, uh, the, annual, uh, the, the form and way for the, the rehab objectives and completion criteria, uh, they will become online forms. So um, whilst we've got those in a PDF form on, on the website at the moment, they, that they will change to the online forms um, when they become available. So that, that is how you will submit uh, those documents. Um, really, I think it's best in everyone's best interest uh, as leaseholders that they get on and actually start to register for the, the regulated portal uh, sooner rather than later. And we'll have some further advice coming out to, to industry in the couple, next couple of weeks in terms of how to, how to do that. Um, but if you start to actually um, register for that, um, then you can really stay tuned in terms of where things are up to um, so that your transition is a lot more seamless. Uh, similarly, if you're a large mine, um, make sure you, you register for the, for the mine rehabilitation portal as well. Um, so that in itself, I think, is probably the, the biggest um, work that needs to be done by industry to actually come up to speed with um, their GIS data requirements. So don't leave it to the end. Start really turning your minds to that now. So that's um, come, come the end, end of the transition. Uh, that should be all sorted. As Will said, um, you know, there, there is a little bit of work up front, uh, but once you've done that once, um, further submissions as part of the annual reporting process um, should be a lot more um, streamlined. I know. People love to hear that word from government streamlined, but um, uh, that, that's what we truly believe. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's that's the key messages. Um, there were some there were some questions um, that I've answered online as well. I'll just go back to those. So there was a question there around the, how does public get um, access to the to the GIS data. So essentially the, the mine rehabilitation portal, that's an industry facing portal. So that's how they actually um, uh, provide that GIS data to, to government. Um, but the government as a whole has a, a, a portal called the Sharing Enabling Environmental Data, the C portal. So what that portal does is actually gathers all the relevant GIS information um, from various government websites, including our, including our GIS portal. So if you're a member of the public, You'll be able to go up onto that portal. It's quite user friendly um, and actually search any mine um, and interrogate in terms of where they're up to from a, from a mine, mine rehabilitation point of view. So, um, and that that will evolve over over time as well. Um, so at the moment, that that's, that'll be just view only initially. Um, but further consultation in terms of um, what what data will be shared in, in the future um, as as our process matures. Um, just looking through the questions here, I think um, I've got most of that. I can't see any other questions in the chat at this point in time, and we are really going well on time. Um, sorry to interrupt, Matt. I just wanted to John's question that said, for auditing purposes, does the portal notify you that forms have been submitted? Um, I just wanted to reiterate that yes, um, you do get a confirmation email. You will then also receive a um, some sort of documentation regard or depending on the application and you will be in constant contact and if anything changes to your application you to get notified straight away so there's probably on any given um, form anywhere between one and three communications and it's the same for the mine rehab portal when you submit your themes to the mine rehab portal you'll receive an email on the outcome of the validation process so sometimes the validation process once you start that, um, it'll take some time, maybe between minutes and um, if you've submitted all 10 themes, it might take uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes to work validation process through in the background. Now you'll receive a separate email for each theme about the success of that particular validation for each theme. And then once you submit that data, you'll also receive an email when those submissions have been 
successful. So I will reiterate Steve Orr's comments earlier in the day and, and Bronwyn has actually since put the, the link in the chat so that if you do want to book a session with us um, on any aspects of the, uh, the rehab reforms, um, please, please don't hesitate, hesitate to do that. Um, we're really keen to make sure that um, English is well underway to, to preparing for the reforms. Any questions you do have, I know it's a lot to take in. Um, we're quite happy to take you through that process. Uh, we just have another question uh, from Chris. Uh, is there any vetting process as to who can submit documents on behalf of a mine. Um, the DPI and major project portal has an authorised person who can approve users for a project approval. Will there be a similar process and then we, will you be approved to submit documents on behalf of a number of CCLs? So Jeremy, did you want to take that one? So the, the vetting process is essentially up to the title holder. We have supplied all title holders with a unique code that um, allows access for that specific title holder to all access for them. Um, we will most likely resubmit those and, and re-deliver those to title holders in the coming months. Um, and our view is the title holder can then pass on that login details or login information as they see fit. It becomes uh, a, a bit of a, a too hard, too messy situation where we, if we assume control of who or who this person is, a environment manager or this person is the general manager, what can they see? What can they not? It's we we like to ensure that you know the title holder controls their own their own destiny. Um, so yeah, so if the and we will hopefully in the in the in the incoming time, maybe in the next year or so, try to have a super user for the title holders access. But at this stage, no, no, it, it is essentially um, the title holder has uh, ac ha has the access and has the control and can disseminate how, how they see fit. So um, there's no further questions at this point. So I'll, I will draw a close to this morning session. We're, we're being on time, which is great. So we're, um, we've got a session, the morning tea session now, and that goes to, um, to 10.30. Um, we will be starting right on time, so please um, encourage you to come back then. Um, this this portal will remain open, uh, so um, encourage you not to shut down and um, just stay on. Um, but we'll see you back here at ten thirty. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, welcome everybody to our um, second session for the for the morning. Um, if you're just joining us. Um, please remember to uh, use the Q&A session um, if you have any particular questions. Uh, when you're utilising the Q&A session uh, or, or, the, or the box, um, if you're not shy, um, put it to all um, conference attendees so everybody can see the question. That way when um, we respond to the questions, um, you can see our answers, which, which may answer some of your questions. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, Brian, I can still see that morning tea break session. There we go. I'll share my screen again. Ronnie, you can see my screen okay? Yep. Okay, fantastic. So um, the, this morning session um, is really around um, risk management. Um, so that's, again, as I said this morning, is a, is a fundamental um, principle that, that underpins our, our, our rehab reforms. Our first session is around the implementation of geomorphic design and quality assurance quality control processes, processes and establishing final landforms um, at uh, TC's Mount Pleasant operation. Now, this is subject to a recent rehabilitation information release that we now have on our website, and uh, we'll put a link to that um, in the website, on, on the chat and um, Q&A boxes. But I guess importantly, um, when you have a look at the form and way for rehabilitation uh, management plans, when you're preparing those, um, there is a couple of sections devoted to quality assurance, quality control processes. And I think this is a really good example of um, how this can be applied to a site. Um, and where we see good practices, it will be our objective that we will put that through um, our rehabilitation information releases so that we can share those learnings across the industry. So just to introduce our next speakers, I'll just flip down here. So we have Chloe Annandale, Senior Environmental Advisor, Mac Energy, Mount Pleasant Coal Operation. Chloe has 10 years experience in environmental management, compliance, rehabilitation across Queensland, New South Wales and the Northern Territory. 
as the Mac Energy Mount President Operations Senior Environmental Advisor, Colonia has spent the last three years with a focus on best practice rehabilitation and land management, including working closely with the mining services provider TEAS in both meeting regulatory requirements and exceeding company rehabilitation goals. Chloe has been the project manager for research projects within the University of Newcastle and topsoil stockpile viability and site trials to increase vegetation connectivity and fauna presence within the area. Chloe holds a Bachelor of Science from James Cook University and a Master of Environment Environmental Protection from Griffith University. Now Chloe, Chloe will be joined today with by, uh, Michelle Ecclesley. Um, Michelle is the Environment and Community Officer for Tees Mount Pleasant Operation. Michelle has eight years experience across conservation, land management and mine site rehabilitation. She joined Tees in 2017 as an Environment and Community Officer at Mount Pleasant Operation. Michelle is responsible for helping deliver the mine's rehabilitation program, ensuring it meets statutory obligations, client commitments and, and land use objectives. This includes driving compliance of more than 100 hectares of rehabilitation to enable long-term landform stability and the restoration of self-sustaining ecosystems post-mining. Michelle's commitment to build authentic collaborative relationships with the MAC Energy team and local stakeholders extends her ability to deliver enduring environmental value for the Upper Hunter region. Michelle holds a Bachelor of Applied Science, Integrated Resource Management from the University of Queensland. So Chloe, I think you're sharing the screen. So um, welcome Chloe and welcome Michelle. Thanks, Matt. I'll just pull up the presentation. If that's come through. That has come through. Brilliant. So good morning, everybody. My name's Chloe, as Matt's just said, Senior Environmental Advisor at Mac Energy. And with Michelle, we'll be running through the Mount Pleasant operation, implementation of geomorphic design, and the QA, QC processes in establishing final landforms. So for those of you who don't know, Mount Pleasant operations located approximately three kilometres northwest of Musselbrook in the Upper Hunter. So this is Musselbrook here and the Mount Pleasant operation is up to the northwest. The mine has approval to operate till December 2026 and we've got an SSD currently submitted for extension. Coal was first mined in July 2018 and rehab has been progressing in the eastern section since with over 100 hectares rehab to date. So this is our open cut pit. And this is the rehabilitation that we've completed to date on the eastern section. First rehab was completed in 2018 in the southern section before first coal was produced. And our geomorphic landform design has been completed from the ground up. So Mac Energy is the owner of Mount Pleasant and the holder of all the environmental approvals. The entire Mount Pleasant operation team is involved in rehabilitation in one way or another. And the Mac team is extremely proud of the results. So best practice rehab is in our culture with a do it once, do it right attitude. And we've got closure in mind from the start. We've engaged TEAS as the tier one mining services provider to execute the rehabilitation design. And their team is pivotal to our successful rehab from design through to implementation and research. So our focus is on progressive rehabilitation on the Eastern section of our overburden emplacement, which is the view towards Musselbrook as Mount Pleasant holds the almost entire Northwest view from town. So as you can see in the photo, the front section of the photo is our rehabilitation, delineated by the drain that runs through here and everything in the far ground is natural ground. So as Matt said, in February, 2021, the resources regulator came to site and completed the landform establishment tap at Mount Pleasant. And during that, they identified best practice rehabilitation that we were doing on site. So in conjunction with the resources regulator, we released that rehab information release on geomorphic landform establishment, which as Matt said, he'll chuck the link into the chat. So our rehab and closure outcomes are detailed in our mining operations plan and rehab management plan and involve a final landform that's safe, stable, non-polluting and sustainable, integrated with surrounding natural landforms and includes micro relief and drainage lines consistent with the surrounding topography. As part of this, we've also completed detailed risk assessments to ensure successful rehabilitation is achieved. So some of the things that we do differently is we set targets in our mine planning and in our mock commitments for the area of rehabilitation. We think about closure from the beginning with research-based decision-making and development of landform for our life of mine, including our proposed SSD, and our social license to operate, 
So community and stakeholder, external stakeholder considerations are taken into the final design. So Life of Mine rehab plans are completed using the GeoFloof landform design model. These two figures are two screenshots from the model, the one on the left showing slope stability and the one on right showing erosion risks and also outlining the major drainage lines. And again, this is for the full Life of Mine in the model. So our comprehensive rehab control systems include significant input from a number of parties. The GeoFloof landform design model, the Siberia erosion model, water management structure design, and regular site visits by Chris Wagel, who designs the rehabilitation in the GeoFloof model, and Associate Professor Greg Hancock from the University of Newcastle. So as you'll hear shortly, Greg's been heavily involved in the rehab reforms with the resources regulator, and he's currently undertaking a number of research projects at Mount Pleasant, including an erosion landform establishment trial, ground truth in the GeoFluv model assumptions. So quality control and quality assurance are major parts of having successful rehabilitation. All quality control information is incorporated into our GIS systems to ensure that the controls are maintained and recorded for accuracy. Maintaining strong records from design through to completion assists to facilitate continual improvement also. We have monthly inspections and drone flyovers, detailed annual rehabilitation monitoring programs, and we also do post rainfall drain flyovers of the major water management features after rainfall events. A social license to operate is also critical to all aspects of our operation. Some of the challenges that we've overcome at Mount Pleasant include the weather conditions, including our EPL dust shutdown condition, noise constraints with our close proximity of residences, especially at night, and obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of the opportunities we've taken for optimization of our rehab include optimizing mine sequencing, dumping to design, completing dozer maintenance at night where possible, and doing additional connectivity and visual tree screen planting programs between site and the Muskbrook town. So I'll now hand it over to Michelle, who will run through the Mount Pleasant inspection and test plan process. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, as everyone's already introduced, I'm Michelle, um, the Environment and Community Officer at TIFF Mount Pleasant. And we'll be talking about how we take uh, the Mac Energy landform design and we um, and our construction process and the quality assurance and control process we have implemented on site um, to provide Mac with uh, the assurance that uh, the landform has been built according to design. So just jumping onto the next slide. Thanks, Chloe. Um, so basically, what what do we do differently is take this design and we incorporate it into our short term mine planning, which then flows into our quality assurance and control process, um, which is a set of agreed standards between the client Mac Energy and ourselves. And we look at how do we validate the benef benefits of completing rehab? How do we talk about it within our own team to ensure that we remain focused on this critical part of the mining operation? So. At Mount Pleasant, TIS has been contracted to uh, provide construction services, including bulk, bulk profiling and shaping of the overburden material, the construction of drainage networks, erosion and sediment control structures, final surface preparation, and the installation of habitat features, topsoil ripping, seeding, and planting. So as Chloe's already mentioned, uh, we commenced rehabilitation in 2018 prior to the first extraction of coal. And since then, we've worked collaboratively with Mac Energy to deliver over 101 hectares of industry leading rehab using contemporary rehabilitation principles. So if we just move on, Chloe. So this just shows how we take that short term mine planning um, and incorporate those designs into our daily and weekly plans. These plans are developed by our technical services team in conjunction with our production teams to provide supervisors and those undertaking um, mining activities a clear picture of what we need to focus on to achieve the rehabilitation. So in that image there, we can see we've got our PAP and CARB limits clearly demarcated and identified, and those are uploaded into our GPS dump dozers. And then we've also got the GeoFluve tone 
and in that plan as well, we've identified areas where additional material is required to dump out to the geoflu tow limits in order to optimise our bulk shaping when we reach that stage. In addition, uh, MAC Energy organises and undertakes audits of our management processes to ensure that we're meeting the plan. One of these activities included management for PAF and carb waste against our MOC criteria and set PAF limits. So that came back within compliance and just demonstrates our commitment to manage material to ensure that our landform is stable and non-polluting over the long term. So moving on, before I quickly jump into the ITP process, uh, this is just another view of our rehabilitation. So in the Southern section, uh, we've got our very first rehabilitation that was completed in 2018, um, compared to the Northern section where you can see the brown bare dirt. Um, and that was recently completed in the last couple of months prior to our mop conditions, which are at June 30. Um, in the middle section, that's our ac active bulk shaping area. And while this might look, look slightly different, why don't we just move from south to north? Um, again, that was taking into consideration of our impact on the community. We look to dump out and rehabilitate the gullies first before tackling the ridges. So this allowed the dump system to progress um, almost at a consistent rate, um, protecting Muzzlebrook from mining impacts and uh, reducing the risk of operational downtime to the mining um, activities. So our ITP process, to ensure that we um, meet the required design, we have a five-stage process. So that incorporates our landform design, construction, topsoil placement, ripping and seeding, and drain construction. <clears throat> Each of these ITPs have a critical control point, um, which is verified before moving on to the next step. And the idea of an ITP or an inspection and test plan is to be able to provide that assurance um, to, in our case, our client, <clears throat> or in the case of an owner operator, um, to the resource regulator, that we have a detailed process and can prove that we have constructed um, the landforms accordingly. So, on the screen, we've got examples of two of our ITPs, our landform design and our landform construction. <clears throat> so in the landform design, it is issued to us by Mac Energy, and that provides us a chance to review the design and identify any potential issues um, and raise those with Mac before we reach the construction phase of our ITP program. And that, again, minimizes the reduce uh, and reduces the risk of rework uh, if we got into the construction phase identified an issue um, so we prefer to pick that up in the design stage so mac energy um, approves those designs and approves the targeted area that we are working on for our rehabilitation and once that has been finalized we move on to the construction phase so this is where the mining engineers then incorporate the designs into those weekly plans and um, work with the survey and the rehabilitation supervisors to provide weekly geoflu updates and to ensure compliance to design. Once we're satisfied that, uh, and we believe that we've completed those designs um, accordingly, then again, we'll give Mac Energy an opportunity to review our progress and sign off the landform construction as complete. So if we move on to the next slide, um, this is an example of our ITP process for landform design. And as I've discussed, it's got those critical control points of um, identifying the site we'd like to target for rehabilitation. Um, the landform design, does it meet, uh, for example, mop boundaries? Um, is there any issues in, in the way the area has been dumped out? And then the verification by uh, Mac Energy. So moving along, we've also incorporated in that um, the area that we're targeting and um, the contour and the gradients that should be achieved during the construction phase. So again, this is all information that's provided to Mac Energy. And you can also see there the cut fill balances identifies um, areas 
for material movement and where we need to move material to and from. So jumping onto the construction ITP, again, very similar thing. We've got, has our design been approved? Um, have we pre-started our operators and our supervisors? Have the plans been uploaded to the, to the dozers? Um, then survey providing those weekly updates. And again, finally that approval um, by Mac Energy. So going on to the next page, this is probably the critical thing in achieving the landform design is the weekly geofluve updates produced by the TEAST survey team. So we operate within a 500 mil tolerance um, when we're constructing these surfaces. So in this image, white is on grade um, within that tolerance, red is high, blue is low. And obviously the objective is to push the high material into the low areas. So we use these each week um, to ensure that we're tracking towards progress. And we also keep track of the productivity um, of our dozers as well, just to ensure that we are heading in the right direction. So jumping onto the next slide. Again, this is another example of what we include in our weekly plans and our daily updates as well, is a little bit more detail around uh, the bulk shaping push, push plans. These are uh, issued to supervisors. And again, it just provides operators and supervisors more information about where material needs to go to optimise uh, bulk push. Moving on to the next slide, this is the point where we would uh, approach the client, or in this case, Mac Energy for sign off. Um, and depending on uh, Mac's level, level of satisfaction, they could either direct us to do additional works or it would be signed off and we would move on to the placement of topsoil. So moving on to the next slide. Again, we also provide uh, the as constructed contour lines and the slope gradient as well. So the third ITP I'm going to talk about in this process that is related for, to this landform design and establishment is our drainage ITP process. So we are currently constructing the bottom of section of drains which have been designed for life of mine. So they're quite significant structures. Um, they are all lined with geofabric and we use imported rock to ensure that they meet the standard as set out in these plans. So if we move along to the next slide, again, a very similar process. Um, we've got the design. Um, we review the design with our rehabilitation contractor Robson's to ensure that it meets the surface um, and the drains will tie in and will function as per the design. Um, we then have our, I guess, construction phase. So as we flip through the next couple of slides, we have our base of excavation, again, targeting 100 mil compliance in, in these drains. Um, and then we have our placement of our geofabric according to the New South Wales Blue Book standards and our rock sizing. So for this, we use an abridged form and count method. And basically all it is doing is checking the grade of the rock, um, ensuring that it meets the specifications as per the supply. So that it's coming from SCS Hebden quarries. Um, they've given us a particular grade for the rock. We just um, do this additional check to ensure that the rock is per that grade. And moving on to the next slide, this is our final overview of our drain process, the rock placement. So we do a survey of top of rock and basically what this allows us to do is identify high and low spots within the drain system itself. Um, and again, Mac Energy can review this and run it past uh, the designer, so Chris Waygood, um, to determine if any localised high or low spots will impact the drain performance and flow. And again, if MAC is satisfied that uh, this drain will function according to its design, we will sign it off and move on to the next set of works. So what does all of this mean for us? Um, when we're talking about re rehabilitation, what do we talk about on site? So basically, when we're talking to our mining activities, we look at um, visual bonding that by achieving our rehabilitation targets, 
we also reduce our impact on the community, which can reduce our complaints and operational downtime due to dust and noise. Um, we can also tie the rehabilitation to particular incentive schemes if necessary to, again, just provide some more encouragement um, around rehabilitation. We talk in terms of productivity, we tend to move away from talking about rehabilitation and talk in terms of material move per shift. Um, that top photo up there is an example of our GPS tracking on the bulk shaping dozer. So we try and check that daily to ensure that it is on the rehab doing its set tasks. Um, we schedule the maintenance for that particular dozer on night shift wherever possible. Um, with our rehabilitation crew running generally from seven till seven, um, we try and utilize that productivity as much as possible and scheduling maintenance for night shift is a good way of reducing the, any impacts on that time. We provide regular updates between um, Mac Energy and uh, the different teams within TEAS and that's at daily meetings, weekly meetings, um, planning meetings. So we're constantly talking about it and it's at the forefront of what we do. And most importantly of all, we have developed a team approach. So no one person is responsible for the rehab. It is driven by the environmental teams on site. However, each individual team, production, tech services, mine planning, everyone has a part to play in achieving this rehab. Um, it's also helped in our case, we've got a pit soup services supervisor who also part of his portfolio is to manage the rehab. So we've also found that's um, critical is to have someone dedicated to spend time with the operators um, and working to achieve that bulk shape and compliance to design. So if we move on, I'll just hand back to Chloe um, to wrap up our talk. And, and while we're doing that, we've also got a short video um, to show you of our rehab. Yep, so Mac would like to thank Tees and all of our rehab contractors who are critical to having the best practice rehab that we do. Um, and like Michelle said, I'm stop sharing that one. And I'll pull up the drone footage and we'll just, this is only a couple of minutes, Matt. Um, we'll run through this, talk through the processes that are shown on the screen, and then we can answer any yeah, questions. So basically, in the foreground of this video, we have our uh, topsoil placement and spreading operations ongoing. Um, as you can see, the light vehicle moving down the slope is that the supervisor I mentioned completing um, daily inspections uh, on the work area to ensure that it's tracking towards um, its intended progress. As we fly over, you can see that we have bulk shaped a particular area. And as we fly over, we're in the process of actively bulk shaping this particular area. So this was part of the previous rehab campaign from 2019 to 2020. Um, and we'll come back and Chloe will explain a bit more what we've done in that area. So again, this is moving back through that rehab. We just saw topsoil placement occurring. Um, and we've got the installation of our habitat features occurring. We've installed over 590 habitat features over 101 hectares. And another key feature that we can see on this particular slope as we move across is our deep ripping. And we've found this in conjunction with the landform design has significantly reduced um, the potential for erosion to occur. And any erosion that does form is in uh, drainage lines where drains are to be constructed. And again, as we move across, um, this is some of our earlier rehabilitation seeded in December 2019. And as we fly back over that area, I'll hand over to Chloe. So in the, in the close ground there, you can see that's the 2018 rehab. This footage is now from March 2021. Previous footage was from 2020. Coming up, you can see that's our first drain that's fully completed. And again, like Michelle said, it's a life of mine structure. So it has the capacity to take the water management from all of the lifts um, in our proposed plan as well. So once the area has been shaped, we topsoil it um, and adding gypsum in as we load the topsoil into the trucks. We then add the habitat features as Michelle discussed and deep root the area. 
Then once the weather's suitable, which is usually spring or autumn, the area is then seeded and Heiko tube stock planted. So most of these areas are only 12 to 18 months old. And you can see that we're getting really good vegetation growth, um, which is credit to the rehabilitation teams and also the change in the weather that we've had over the last 12 months. So we're working on three different PCTs, which is the grey box, white box woodland and a couple of different narrow life leaved ironbark communities. And we're also trialling a different PCT of a dry rainforest that we're trialling in some of the drainage lines and the ponded areas. So thanks everybody for listening. And Matt, I'll hand it over if there's any questions. Uh, very, very good presentation. Uh, I think um, just a couple of key points from the regulator, which is why we like to share this type of practice is that the do it well, do it once principle. Um, I think it's something really important to, um, to put forward to, to the rest of the industry. Um, the adoption of geomorphic uh, principles, I think there's, there's great benefit of that. Now, uh, if you have a look at the rehab information release, the photos that really don't do this justice. I mean, this is pretty juvenile rehab, but um, it's certainly got the hallmarks of heading in the right direction. But I guess the comfort we have as a regulator is the data that they're getting as part of their quality assurance processes and um, constructed plans to give some confidence that this type of landform is going to be stable in the long term. So certainly advocate that you build that into your, your completion criteria to actually support um, you know, um, that you've, you've achieved that component of your, of your completion criteria. So um, yeah, no, really good presentation. A couple of um, questions. Um, so Karen Fogarty, um, thanks for a great presentation. Um, what is the post mining land use and how did this inform your landform design? So post mining land use in this area is um, grazing and natural ecosystems, depending on the portion of the site that it is. Um, and part of the design as well is based on, we have Commonwealth EPPC Act requirements for an endangered ecological community as well. So we're tying those requirements into our state requirements and making sure that it's a continuous landform that kind of ticks all the boxes as we go through. So that's mostly part of our the different seed mixes that we choose, which are based on some really good research that our rehab contractors and ecologists are working through with Tees and Matt. Yeah, very good. Next question is, does your landform design cover any older or traditionally constructed landforms? No, due to the age of the site, we've been extremely lucky that from the original landform, um, we've been able to do the geofluid design. There's an extremely small area that we redid at the start of a couple of hectares while we we're waiting for our modification for the change to geomorphic design. But all in all, the majority of it has been done. So we've been lucky in that respect and it's worked incredibly well. Good. And last but not least, just to, to wrap it up, is um, were there any practical issues with implementing geomorphic design, such as steeper slopes? Um, I'll hand that to Michelle. Yeah, so we do have um, a few steep slopes. In terms of the construction uh, with the bulk shaping, it wasn't too much of an issue. Um, that only became um, highlighted when we reached those, uh, I guess, ongoing stages of topsoil placement and uh, deep deep ripping. And um, that was heavily risk assessed and that um, influenced uh, the type of machinery we used. So for example, we use uh, articulated water carts um, to run up and down some areas where needed. We use um, ejector trucks again to place out the topsoil um, and all of our rehabilitation is connected so that eliminates the need associated uh, with equipment operating on softer slopes. Oh, very I think good. Just, just to add to that it's also really important the road network for light vehicles to go through for both the rehab supervisor and inspections once the rehab is done and making sure that they have a good path through and you know, you're on the right angle going through all those steep areas as well. So planning that in from the start during the uh, bulk shaping, I think is quite critical for the full life of mine rehab. Very good. Well, um, at the end of the talk now, that's um, a really good presentation. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Max. Um, and we'll um, hand it over to Chris Rudin. So while Chris is coming up, I'll, I'll introduce Chris. So Chris Rudens is the uh, Principal Officer for Rehabilitation um, with the regulator. 
Uh, Chris is an environmental engineer who started his career in consultancy before joining New South Wales government in 2006. Since this time, Chris has held various positions, primarily focused on the regulation of the mining and petroleum operations. In his current role as a principal officer of rehab, uh, Chris provides technical and strategic input and supports the functions of the New South Wales Resources Regulator, including risk-based compliance activities to support successful mine rehab. So Chris has had quite a bit to do in terms of the development of these target assessment programs, which is really that paradigm shift about how, how we're regulating going forward, being you know, going from you know, being bogged down and proving mops to actually getting out on the ground and actually evaluating how, how industry is effectively implementing trolls against against critical risk. So um, we'll, um, Chris, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Matthew. Um, kind of just check if you can see the screen, the, the presentation that I've shared. Yeah, certainly can. Okay, excellent. So uh, good morning, everyone. As, as yeah, Matt mentioned, I'm Chris Rudens. So I'm the Principal Officer of Rehabilitation within the Regulator. Um, in this presentation today, uh, we'll look at the key learnings from the recent rollout of the targeted assessment programs, or TAPs as we like to call them, and the um, implications for rehabilitation risk assessments. So let's make sure this is working. So here's a, a, a brief description of what I plan to cover today. So um, I'll, I'll provide an overview of the regulator's requirements for rehabilitation risk assessments and also the regulator's risk-based approach to the use of TAPS. Um, then I plan to briefly discuss the key learnings um, from the TAPS undertaken so far. And then lastly, uh, we'll discuss the implications of these findings for rehabilitation risk assessments and updates to this process uh, with the rollout of the rehabilitation reforms. So currently, there is a requirement for each mine to undertake a, a rehabilitation risk assessment as part of the preparation of the mining operations plan. Uh, section three of the MOP guideline provides the requirements for these assessments. Uh, they need to be done in accordance with ISO 31000, which is essentially you know, the, the risk assessment um, framework. Uh, consistent with this standard, they need to identify both the risk and the risk treatment or, or risk control. Um, then information on how the risk will be managed, that is the implementation of the risk controls is to be included in the MOP. And there's also a requirement to monitor risk control effectiveness. Um, the MOP guideline also provides a summary of specific risks that should be considered. For example, um, you know, like geochemical, geochemistry of waste products. Now, as part of the rehab reform, the requirements for mines to undertake rehabilitation risk assessments has been elevated to a provision of the regulation. Um, there's also a, we, we do have a specific guideline now for rehabilitation risk assessments. And I'll get back to this towards the end of the presentation. Now, separate to the requirement for mines to undertake their own specific risk assessment, the regulator has conducted its own assessment. Uh, we conducted bow tie rehabilitation risk assessments back in 2019, and these are published on our website. Uh, this was done to provide guidance to industry on the range of risks uh, that can be considered in their own site specific risk assessments. Um, and as part of this process, we had, um, both the preventing and mitigating risk controls were identified. And then from this, the regulator identified critical controls, which are the ones that we believe uh, should be considered by all mines um, to address a particular risk. Now, I, I don't plan to go through these risk assessments as part of this presentation, um, but just be aware that, that they exist and they are published. Um, and they're also acknowledged in our updated guidance as a resource that should be reviewed when you develop your own specific risk assessment. Now, from, from the critical controls that I mentioned that we, we identified, we've developed targeted assessment programs or the TAPS. And as you can see the diagram on this, on this slide, this forms a key part of our risk-based and outcomes focused approach uh, to compliance and enforcement. The TAPS, uh, assess how industry is defining and implementing um, risk controls. And these, um, these are developed around the identified critical controls. We, we, what we've done is we've grouped the critical controls into compliance priority categories to form the TAPS. And that is, um, you know, tailings and storage facility management, materials and soils management, landform establishment, decommissioning, rehabilitation, and surface and groundwater management. So, 
by taking this approach, TAPs are considered a proactive as they, they aim to assess the effectiveness of each mine's rehabilitation risk assessment. That is how, how they are identifying risk um, and defining the risk controls and then implementing the control and then for, uh, for a particular compliance priority, for instance, tailings management. If risk controls are effective, they will prevent the unwanted event occurring. Um, in our bow tides, we identify this event as being um, rehabilitation land not being able to support the final land use. Um, in addition to looking at how each mine is managing risks, the TAPs help the regulator identify industry-wide knowledge gaps. And we, we also publish reports on the outcome of each TAP and key learnings. And we've done this recently for tailings management and materials and soils management TAPs. So now I'll, um, we'll briefly discuss the key learnings from the TAPs undertaken so far. Uh, the tailings management TAP was undertaken in late 2019 and went into um, 2020, and we assessed 19 mines. Um, it was intended that we would, uh, that a larger number of mines would be included in the program, but it was pulled back due to COVID restrictions at the time. And as I mentioned before, the final report has only just been released in August, and I've included a link um, on this slide is where that, that um, report can be found. So generally we found that tailing storage facilities are managed well during the operational phase with most sites implementing measures to maximize desiccation and consolidation settlement. Um, and this includes good decamp management. With regards to tailings characterization, we noted that improvements are required for mines to implement ongoing testing programs, especially for geochemical characteristics, rather than rely upon testing done early on in the project. In some cases, we found that no testing had been done, um, undertaken since the project development um, EIS. With regards to risks associated with facility closure, we noted that there is a requirement to understand the extent of long-term settlement of tailings. Um, this risk appears to be more relevant to the coal sector due to the common practice of using relatively deep uh, mining voids to dispose tailings, um, as you can see in one of those photos in the slide there. Um, also, previous poor practices um, could, can contribute to this, you know, for instance, for poor consideration of desiccation and consolidation. Um, where modelling has been undertaken, long-term settlement up to 20 metres has been predicted at some sites. And, and this obviously has implications for how this is managed in the final landform um, to prevent localised depressions. And, and obviously the, you know, the, the result would be increased seepage. Uh, it also has implications for how the surface water management will perform. Um, but it's also worth noting that some metalliferous mines may do, need to consider um, differential settlement for tailings facilities, uh, especially if these facilities are constructed over a deeper void such as those formed by block caving. Uh, we also determined that improvements are required uh, for the consideration of the final landform design of these facilities. Mines need to undertake assessments to under, under, um, need to undertake assessments to determine how the final landform will perform. Um, how will it contain the surface water runoff? Are spillways and drop structures uh, required in the final landform? Uh, especially if the tailings facility is a raised turkey's nest type facility. Um, tailings facilities uh, are a mining domain that uh, deserves special consideration in this regard. Um, as long-term erosion will deplete the capping and, and this may lead to, to a catastrophic failure and release of tailings if not considered appropriately. Um, that is why we look to industry accepted guidelines that provide specifications for closure, uh, NCOLD and the recent global tailings review. Um, based on my understanding, um, based on the regulator's understanding, both suggest consideration of surface water management for one in 10,000 year events for closed facilities. Uh, unfortunately, we noted a reliance um, when we undertook this tab, we, we noted a reliance on conceptual landforms with no or minimal assessment of the science to determine if the final landform is appropriate to contain uh, the long-term surface water runoff. And similar to this, we also noticed a reliance on, upon conceptual capping design. Now we require mines to understand how the cap is required to perform um, to support the final land use. Um, this could be to minimise seepage, um, or in some cases to build a strength profile over low strength tailings. Um, these considerations are required in to, you know, to be included in the rehabilitation risk assessment. 
Um, for instance, depending on the location of the final land use, it's likely that trees will inevitably grow in the tailings cap. Has this been accounted for? It's, it's another consideration for the risk assessment. Once performance um, is known, then the cap design can be developed and should be developed early in the mine life cycle. As, cap design, as the cap design informs what materials will be required, um, their, their quantity and, and their source. The earlier this is established, the sooner mines can quarantine adequate amounts of material for capping. And based on our assessments for this tap and other taps undertaken, this is an area that needs significant improvement. So the next tap undertaken was the materials and soils management tap. Um, this was undertaken through 2020 and uh, it resulted in 51 mines being included in the program. Similar to the tailings management tap, the final report has only just been released and is available on our website um, at, at that link provided. Now, now, based on the key learnings of this tap, we noted that mines had good rehabilitation material salvage and management practices. Um, this was more evident in the coal sector than metalliferous. Um, similar to the tailings tap, material characterization analysis was, was noted to be an issue. Um, there was a number of sites relying on baseline soil analysis undertaken during the initial um, project application um, and development with no follow-up testing. Uh, rehabilitation material is another key issue that which has also been identified in other taps, um, such as what I described previously for tailings capping. Oops, pardon me. And also the um, quality um, assurance process for materials management was varied across the mines included in the program. And the lastly, um, the, the, the last tap that we've just conducted has been the landform establishment tap, and it's only just been completed. Um, it was initiated earlier this year. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID restrictions, once again, it, it has limited the number of mines included in the tap, but it, it did end up, the program ended up including 40 mines. Um, as it's only just been completed, we expect that the final report will be made available either later this year or early in 2022. So based on the key learnings so far, we uncovered similar issues to other, other taps for capping design and quarantining material for capping. Um, just noting that this tap included all waste emplacements, not just those associated with tailings. Another key issue is how mines determine their final landform. Uh, as part of this tap, we assessed how mines determine, um, how mines design and uh, the final landform, um, taking into the account the need to have um, rehabilitation that is stable in the long term. Um, we found that consideration of final of landform design was variable. Some mines have embraced the use of leading practice assessment tools, such as landform evolution models or LEMs. Um, look, as Greg Hancock will likely talk about these later today, I won't discuss them in detail here. But what we found is that in using these tools, mines are more likely to adopt geomorphic design principles with natural relief and natural and landforms with smaller catchments, rather than traditional engineered landforms with linear slopes and a reliance on contour drains to break up the slope length. Um, there, there are risks associated with linear landforms and contour banks that are, are not well defined until you run an LEM to show that they are likely to require a high level of maintenance and those based on geomorphic design and significantly more than the surrounding unmined landforms. Um, these risks need to be assessed uh, and the controls determined. Um, for instance, what type of maintenance is required? Um, the, you know, maintenance to remove sediment collected in contour drains and for how long and how is this erosion monitored? Um, are these types of landforms appropriate for a low maintenance land use, final land use, such as native woodland? Uh, consideration of long-term uh, long-term stability for rehabilitation land is a key issue that is required to be addressed in each mine's rehabilitation risk assessment. Now, we accept that all landforms erode, but risks associated with a rehabilitated landform is different to erosion risks for the surrounding natural landforms. And, and this is probably another topic that might be covered by Greg Hancock later today. Um, one more point on this is that we consider these LEMs a useful tool to help with the design of the rehabilitated landform, but they can also be used to identify high risk areas of existing landforms. 
in most cases, it's not the expectation of the regulator that this will result in a need for a major rework or retrofit, um, but rather localised works to address these high risk areas. Uh, for instance, preventative rather than remediation works um, before the erosion scour or, or area of instability occurs. And lastly, landform construction quality assurance. Um, how mines are ensuring that the constructed landform complies with design, both landform shape and required thickness of cover materials. Um, the earlier presentation from Mount Pleasant gave an indication of leading practice in this regard. So from the TAPS, what are the key learnings for the rehabilitation risk assessments each mine is, is required to prepare? Look, we found, we've, we did find that risk assessments were variable. Uh, Although we observed some that would be considered high performance um, or you know, leading practice, um, a significant portion were also considered uh, broad brush. For instance, we found that some risk assessments tended to refer to a, a management plan as a control rather than nominate a specific control. We, we also noted that a portion of these assessments were dated, in some cases, several years. And, in, in doing so, they weren't reflective of the current operations and the risk controls utilised at the mine. Uh, there's also an issue of how risk control effectiveness was assessed. For instance, if the TAP identified a significant erosion was occurring and likely to result in an unstable landform, we would assess how the mine has responded. Do they have a risk control nominated? Um, how do they monitor the erosion? Um, has the risk control effectiveness been questioned? And has this resulted in a reassessment of the risk control applied? Another issue we looked at was who was involved in the risk assessment. assessment. Um, I would suggest that based on the risk profile for each mine, consideration should be given to getting input from suitably qualified persons in the assessment. For example, um, experts in geochemistry, if, if there's significant AMD issues that need to be managed or an expert in landform design and assessment of stability for those mines that have large and complex landforms. Um, as a result of each of the TAPs undertaken, uh, we, we issued assessment finding letters um, provide, and these provided recommendations that need to be considered, um, especially as mines prepare for the transition into the, um, the operational rehab reforms. And in some circumstances, we identified a risk or knowledge gap that was likely to result in a, an adverse risk to the environment. Directions to undertake further works or, or assessments were issued. Uh, the tailings tap uh, resulted in seven notices. There were seven again for the, um, for the materials and soils management. And so far, far for the landform establishment, we've issued six notices um, with some for, under further consideration. Now, I won't go into any further detail here about what, what was in those notices, but um, just note that our notices are published in our business activity reports. So um, for mines included in the TAP program so far, please take note of the information provided in these assessment finding letters. And a lot of the information in those letters was also discussed during the TAP assessments we undertook. And also, as I've already mentioned, please take note of the key findings in the TAP reports that have been published. As, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the need for mines to undertake rehabilitation risk assessments is now a requirement of the regulation rather than the guideline. Um, uh, these provisions of the, of the regulation require mines to identify, assess and evaluate risks that need to be addressed to achieve the rehabilitation objectives, completion criteria and final landform. So rather than broad brush assessments, identify measures to eliminate, minimise or mitigate risks. And for large mines, that is those that require an APL, incorporate the risk assessment into the rehabilitation management plan that is required. And lastly, we have included we have, in, we have improved guidance for undertaking rehabilitation risk assessments published um, in this guideline here. Um, the link is also um, on the, to, uh, to the web page is also included on this slide. Um, as part of the transition into the rehab reform, mines will be required to become familiar with what is included in the guideline. Um, in summary, 
it provides guidance on keeping and maintaining risk assessment records. Um, be aware there is a separate and related guidance on rehabilitation records. Ensuring the effectiveness of risk controls are routinely evaluated uh, through the life cycle of the project. Recommend that mines review the, the mentioned, um, the before mentioned um, bow tie risk assessments um, to inform the preparation of their own site specific risk assessment. It, it recommends that risk assessments are undertaken by appropriately skilled people. And it provides a non-exhaustive list of potential risks for consideration. Um, and also acknowledges that the RMP, the Rehabilitation Management Plan, must incorporate the risk control measures that come out of the um, rehabilitation risk assessment. Uh, so that's, look, that's the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to add them to the Q&A section in the Zoom page and I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Chris. Um, we do have one question here. So um, thanks, Andrew Butler. Um, so the question is, how will the regulator deal with old traditional bench land forms that have been developed over a long time through approved NOPs? Will operations have to assume that they will be expected to re re reshape and retrofit large areas prior to closure rehab sign off? Did you want to take that one, Chris? Yeah, so um, good question. So we, I think there's always an ex, at the very high level within the, um, within the condition of the mining lease is a requirement for mines to um, have a stable landform. And so what we, when we're looking at those traditional landforms, we're gonna ask the question, well, how have you assessed that they are stable? Um, in, some, in some circumstances, if you, if you run a, an assessment over those, as I mentioned before, if you run a landform evolution model, that, that might pick up that there might be areas, a high risk area for erosion. Um, now, as I mentioned before, we don't expect that there will be, you know, a complete retrofit or rebuild of that whole facility. It might mean that you, once you identify that risk, you identify what the risk control is. There might need to be some minor works or, or works required to address those high risk areas of erosion. Um, there will also need to be monitoring to be, that needs to be undertaken to determine how those landforms will, are going to perform, especially as the vegetation is established on them as well. So does that answer the question, Matt, or did you want to add anything to that? No, I think, again, it's, it's also the conditions of consent as well, um, that there should be a negligible stability risk in the long term as well. So there's still that overarching, that obligation to, to actually demonstrate that that's going to happen and um, demonstrate that you've, you've put all measures in place to, to, to you know, reduce that risk to as low as reasonably practicable. Um, so that, that's our key message there. But, but yeah, certainly in most cases, I don't think that will result in major retrofit. As you said, Chris, um, might be just more localised works to, to address those high risk areas. Mm. Very good. I think that's, that's the only question we have, Chris. So um, yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again and introduce the next speaker. Yeah, so while, while Andrew's um, coming on board, um, and I'll talk more about this this afternoon in um, the reasonably practicable session, but under, under the reg, there is the obligation now to rehabilitate as soon as reasonably practicable. And when we're talking about rehabilitation, we're not just talking about spatially on the ground, we're also making sure that um, industry are, are appropriately addressing knowledge gaps. Now, well in advance to, to closure. So um, I think as you hear Andrew talk today, um, I think it'd be recognised that in some some cases, mine closure planning can be com quite complex, um, and can require you know studies assessments uh, that are not uh, not too unlike the level of assessments required when you're actually opening up a mine with um, EISs etc. So um, yeah, really keen to hear from Andrew today, and perhaps um, have some more discussion in the panel session this afternoon around this. But so Andrew Hutton, he is the principal consultant for Integrated Environmental Management Australia. Andrew um, has 25 years of experience in mining, agricultural and the extractive industry sectors in both operational and consulting roles. Andrew specialises in facility closure planning. He has extensive experience in decommissioning and mine closure planning, including development and delivery of mine closure plans and assessment of rehab liabilities from the preliminary phase through the digit to detailed closure planning. Andrew has performed the role of technical study manager responsible for engaging 
and managing special study teams to deliver detailed closure plans for several key clients. Um, his topic today is mine closure planning. It's a risky business. Um, welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much, Matt. I'll, I'll just um, share my screen. Uh, make sure I get the right one. So just confirming that's that's right to go, mate. Yeah, I can see that, Andrew. Great. All right. Well, th thanks very much, Matt, and, and, and good morning, everybody. And thanks for the opportunity to um, uh, come along and, and present and share some things today. Um, I'm one of those uh, one of those weird guys that loves risk assessments, and um, I, I'm actually you know really do enjoy the process. And so, when I was preparing for this um, presentation, I did a bit of self reflection, and I thought, well, what are the key things that really make um, risk assessment, I guess, an important part of what I enjoy, and, and one of the key reasons for for the projects. And, and really, it was, came down to two things. It came down to um, there's so much to learn um, going across looking at all different sites and working with different clients across different uh, different sites, looking at rehab and closure risk and, and able to sort of learn and share those things. But I think the, 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 main, the main thing is really that risk assessment is an excellent opportunity to form the basis for what's important on a project, um, set your priorities uh, and, and enable you to allocate resources. And, and I really wanted to talk today about um, the risk assessment work that we're doing in the mine closure planning space. I'm really hoping that I can make risk assessment cool again and talk about that by integrating that with some of the stuff that we're doing um, in, in the mine closure space. And, and I, I'm quite keen to get um, to some of the practical applications that we, um, we use um, and, and try and share that with you. Uh, and then obviously leave some opportunity for some discussion um, a little bit later on. Just bear with me while I get my arrows in the right place here. So moving along. Um, very quickly, uh, Matt did do an intro, but you know, I've been knocking around the mining industry for over 25 years. And I, I guess I come from a background of both operational uh, and consulting. I did spend the first bit of my career working on mine sites in Queensland, but also here in, in the Hunter Valley. Um, but spent most of my time, or most of my career consulting back. And I sort of fell into mine closure planning in probably 007, 008, when um, there was some pits going into care and maintenance and people were starting to think about what mine closure might look like. And it was probably pre, predated um, corporate standards and guidelines and things. So I was part of the group of people that were sort of looking at, at mine closure planning more broadly at, um, early in the piece. I, I have uh, just finished a, a six year period as a commissioner with the IPC. And I, and I mentioned that because it gave me great insight into what, um, what government's thinking about it, but also what stakeholders are really thinking about in respect to their expectations around mine closure planning. So I think you know, there's some relevant experience there. And, and of course, I've got some um, qualifications in, in risk facilitation. From an experience um, sense, I'll just put this up, I guess, as context. We've, we've been um, working with a number of companies uh, over the time working in, in two different areas, essentially. Um, We've been fortunate in a short period of time to work in projects here in New South Wales and New Zealand, and I really wanted to take that experience and share that with you today. Our core roles have been, I guess, around um, assisting companies with corporate standards, so either reviewing or, or providing some um, peer support in, in, in updates of standards or, in some cases, preparing corporate standards for, for companies, but also working across a, a range of different uh, companies and projects um, assisting in the project management um, of, and delivery of, of mine closure plans. And I, I really do want to try and bring that experience today to the, to the process. In terms of, um, in terms of the, um, the presentation itself, I just want to really touch on the, the role of, of risk assessment in rehabilitation and closure planning. Um, I want to, um, you know, talk about how the mine closure a uh, risk assessment process should be integrated into the, the, the LOM and what, where that's important and, and where it should be, um, would be considered. Um, definitely want to talk to the benefits um, of, of risk assessment in mine closure, touch briefly on residual risk, talk about critical controls, and then get as quickly as I can to the practical approach. I've only got 30 minutes, there's a bit to cover, and I'm the before lunch guy, so I want to make sure I finish on time. Starting at a, at a high level, I know Chris has just um, articulated, I guess, the, the, the reasons behind risk assessment and rehabilitation and now the change to the regulation, making that an expectation. But 
many of you will be working, um, I guess, under a corporate standard that um, uh, talks about how someone might go along the journey of presenting a mine closure plan or developing a mine closure plan. Um, and if you're not under a corporate standard, then, then I can recommend to you the ICWM Good Practice Guideline on Integrated Mine Closure. It's a, it's a great document. Uh, it's generally where I would start um, in terms of um, recommending people to have a look at um, mine closure. They have some core elements in there, knowledge base, um, the closure and, and vision. They have elements around design, design and closure activities. Um, they have elements around um, cost and having an estimate that um, is not only a rare cost estimate from a security bond, but also runs adjacent to your, your core design and implementation of your closure activities. Having your agreed success criteria, implementing a closure plan that can be executed that identifies the resources and actions as a process of monitoring and obviously the goal of, of relinquishment. But our core, a core piece here in this standard is talking about identifying risks and opportunities. And, and I think that's uh, a key driver for our consideration. Uh, there's a section in the introduction which identifies um, the importance of risk assessment um, and that there is a wide range of um, risks around closure. And by formally undertaking a risk assessment, um, you know, it helps set priorities and shape many aspects of a closure plan. So, you know, in addition to, I guess, expectations under the regulation or corporate standards, when we're looking at um, other guidelines, there is certainly guidance around um, the, the benefits of integrating you know, risk assessment into your mine closure planning process. If I look at um, it in a, in a long context um, and where risk assessment and mine closure planning, particularly risk assessment is, is to be part of the long process. Um, it, it, the short answer, it's, it's through the whole process. And at its core, um, a risk-based approach to mine closure planning really aims to do a couple of things. It aims to reduce uncertainty and therefore um, translate to re a reduction in, in, I guess, that cost exposure by avoiding any um, unplanned events. So it's important in that process. I think what's also key is it's, it identifies key issues early in the process. So you've got a chance to address opera, uh, operational issues um, before you arrive at the, at the gates of closure and, and, and have left with no time or, or no flexibility within your operation to sort of change or address key issues. And so when should mine closure risk assessment be undertaken? Well, the answer is early, early in the process. Um, and right up front um, with exploration effectively. Moving through that concept phase, um, looking at an EIS, presenting up some post mining land use options, identifying some of those core risks um, at that EIS phase, and then having a risk register that rolls with your operation as you move towards closure, whatever that, that long period might be, and recognising that there is a need throughout the process to update that risk register the closure risk register when you have a, a key change to your LOM. So that might be a, a new or modified approval. Uh, you might find yourself in sudden closure or you might find yourself in a state of care and maintenance. Um, that's a point where I think the risk assessment needs to be updated. Or there may be some sort of material non-compliance or environmental incident that drives the need to review your risk assessment. Um, it's important that um, you try not to leave it till, till the end. As I said, it gives you the opportunity to, to mitigate and, and look at options. Um, but for the purposes of today, I really do want to focus on, I guess, risk assessment at that detailed mine closure planning stage and, and share some of, the, um, some of the experiences that we've been through. From a, um, from a, a, a benefits perspective, um, I beg your pardon, um, just to look at some of the key risks. So this is a bit of a busy slide and, and it's not exhaustive. It's not meant to um, uh, ex exhaust all of the risks that might be around a mine closure project, but it's to sort of demonstrate the point that there are a large number of aspects that need consideration in, in mine closure planning. And, and this is not any one particular project. This is a, a combination of, I guess, elements that we've pulled through from some of our other projects. Um, things like leaky seals, um, you know, underground scenario, uh, not having adequate topsoil volume, not having adequate material to cap and cover, not understanding your contaminated sites profile, um, you know, jumping down to things like not being aware that the, the, the community support programs that are in place are relying on the mine contribution. And so there's some level of social, potential social impact, um, understanding 
the, the underground mine and whether the groundwater is going to, to fill and spill discharge at the surface. Um, obviously elements around geotechnical instability, um, void geometry, high walls, you know, fill and spill stuff and subsidence are all, are all key issues. And I said, it's not meant to be an exhaustive list. It's just meant to, um, I guess, demonstrate the point. Interestingly, these are typically the complex issues. These are the ones that have long lead times and can take um, you know, quite a bit of effort and, and often require a lot of investigation to unpack them as part of, as part of, the, uh, as part of the, the closure process. And invariably, these are the ones that can cost you a lot of dough and can blow your closure cost estimation apart if, if we don't understand the, the core, core assumptions here. Um, sometimes these, these risks will give us a bit of a steer in the early part of closure planning. Excuse me, my slides are jumping along there. In the early part of, part of closure planning, uh, a bit of a steer on residual risk. And we can start to understand at the end of our process, mine closure planning process, what are the key things that might present themselves as a residual risk and, and how we might manage that as we move through the process. Uh, I have to say, uh, when we start a mine closure project, uh, these risks are often um, you know, not well understood and there's some knowledge gaps that need to be addressed as part of the process. What I'd like to do today is, as I move through my presentation, is just present or well, demonstrate, I guess, a, a robust risk assessment approach that, that we've pulled in to have a look at a number of these, um, number of these key issues. Before I get there, I did want to just touch briefly on this concept of residual risk. Um, it's something that we think about all the time in mine closure world. Um, we work very hard to mitigate and, and manage uh, the risks as we identify them along the process, but there, there may be a, the potential that there is a residual risk um, retained at the end, and we just need to manage that. So what is a residual risk? Well, the definition that I've adopted here is, is not mine. It's one that I've... Um, I've picked up and, and adapted, but it's really, if your rehabilitation areas fail to perform as predicted, so you do your modeling, you do your predictions, if it fails to perform as predicted, then that, that is um, uh, uh, potentially a residual risk element. And then where that, and where that failure results in some form of environmental harm or a need to come back and do some repair and maintenance. And importantly, where there might be a liability that extends beyond closure for the landowner, potentially in perpetuity. They're the sorts of things that we, we think about in residual risk world. Examples, again, not meant to be exhaustive, and, um, but more just an example. Mine voids uh, have the potential, certainly the, the groundwater uh, issue when we look at underground mining operations and the, and the, and the filling of, of the void space, landform instability, capping failure, um, leachate from overburden in placement, acid mine drainage, those type of things. In terms of benefits, um, just to have a look through um, the benefits um, of, of undertaking risk assessments as part of closure. Well, I think that the key thing is that it gives us a, a greater chance of, of, of understanding our risk profile nice and early and, and mitigating that risk. It really does help us get an understanding of our knowledge gaps. And, Early in the process, when we start a mine closure process, we identify a range of knowledge gaps and we use the risk assessment process to do that. Um, it informs technical studies. So when we're looking at trying to close some of those gaps and we're getting uh, subject matter expert people involved to address some of those issues, it helps us scope up and prioritise those issues. Um, but equally, as we move through the process, the technical studies can then inform back into the ongoing risk register as they um, develop mitigation strategies um, to minimise risk, they, they feed back into the process. It certainly shapes the, um, the study design or shapes the study definition um, of the project and, and gives us some priority. Um, an important piece I think is that it also demonstrates, uh, is able to be used to demonstrate that our mitigation um, uh, strategies are, are effective. So if we can demonstrate through a risk profile that the controls that we put in place are managing that risk by reducing it, then that's, that's a great way to not only um, uh, have a discussion internally, but also externally with stakeholders about the, the benefit of what we're proposing to do. Certainly at a project level helps around allocating um, priorities and resources. And I think if you look at the risk profile through the lens of a stakeholder, it gives you a chance to have a think about um, some of the issues that they might be thinking about 
and, and tailor up how you might engage, who you might engage with, when you might engage with them around your risk profile. So that's an important piece, I think, that can sometimes be, uh, sometimes be missed. Obviously, informs a selection of, of closure criteria. And as I indicated earlier, can start to give us a steer on, on some of those emerging residual risk elements. Just to talk now to, to our approach and what we, what we um, do typically at a, at a pretty high level. Um, it was a key objective of my presentation to demonstrate, I guess, some tools. And, and this is really uh, an approach that we've adopted. Um, there are a number of ways to tackle risk assessment in my enclosure planning. And this is just what's worked for us. And I think, um, you know, we are refining this and working through this as we work on specific projects, but um, this approach just works, works for us. Um, we effectively rely on three key stages in risk identification inside the mine closure process. We have a stage one, which is really about baseline and early identification, trying to get on top of some of those um, early risks. We then have a process of a, a midpoint review, typically where after a body of technical work has been completed that we can steer that information back into the risk register to understand what our profile looks like. And then of course that rolls through the project to end up being um, a risk assessment at the end of the closure process as we develop up our mitigation strategy and to demonstrate that what we've done has reduced the risk profile. And again, referring back to residual risk just provides um, uh, the ability to get a handle on, on some of those elements as well. From a, uh, a stage one approach, um, initially we would have a, a bit of a discovery workshop with clients. We, we encourage um, as many site stakeholders as possible to come along and then be involved in a, in a workshop that is really just setting the base, the base pillars, if you like, for the development of a closure plan. And we would do things like review base case closure obligations. Uh, we'd have a look at um, the domain structure and see whether we can, we can sort of rework those. We'd have a conversation around post mining land use. We'd identify stakeholders and try and pick some of those knowledge gaps. But importantly, we have a session in this discovery workshop around the risks and opportunities. And it's a brainstorming session. It's not meant to be ranking risks. It's about um, just having people in the session warts and all throw up all of the issues that we think might impact on us achieving a point where relinquishment of the tenements is appropriate. Um, and we certainly encourage everybody to contribute and, and we find all, all sorts of things. And we nearly always dig up something different that's not on a, a current risk register um, that we can feed back into the process. Um, it's also important that we keep our eye on this initial brainstorming process as we move down through the closure plan development because there's nuggets in here that we need to make sure we don't forget and that we bring those forward in, into the, uh, the closure planning process. It's also often the session where people start to go, okay, I'm getting a sense now of where our knowledge gaps are and what some of those big risks are and we can start to have conversations about the work that we might need to do um, to close some of those knowledge gaps. The next part of the risk um, process that we adopt, uh, this stage two process, then brings in this concept of critical controls. And, and this definition is straight out of ICMM, the one that Chris uh, identified earlier in, the, in, the presentation, in his presentation. And we start to bring in this critical control concept. It's, it's important because it's these controls that are crucial to preventing an event or mitigating a consequence, uh, mitigating the consequence of event. And it's these controls that in their absence or if that control fails that we would expect, reasonably expect that um, you know, event, the event's going to occur or it's in a, con a control that is one or more, controls one or more um, events or one or more consequences. We, we take some time in our risk assessment process to identify critical controls. The, the reason is that by identifying critical controls, it really does provide a practical approach to ensuring that um, we ensuring that we manage those significant threats um, that are identified as part of the risk process. I, importantly, we, we spend some time talking about good control definition, using that critical control process to identify what it looks like who's responsible for the implementation of that control, 
and when that needs to be put in place as part of the closure process. The implementation is almost as important as the identification in terms of making sure that you implement those controls at the right time in the right place in the process. And then without a doubt, understanding how effective that control has been and having a bunch of records that you can support the implementation of that critical control. When, uh, when we're in a risk assessment, often we, we, we can identify those critical controls pretty easily in a number of cases, but also there'll be some debate. And so I rely on this tool from ICMM again, and I would, I would encourage you to, if you wanted to do a deep dive on critical controls, to go and have a look at this particular reference. But this is used in the risk assessments processes that we, we use to, uh, I guess, um, resolve a debate around whether or not a control is critical or not critical. Um, it's a simple yes and no type style um, um, flowchart, and, and, and you can pretty easily come to a landing on whether or not the, uh, you know, the critical control is in fact critical or not a critical control. As we move into our second stage, um, our, our preference uh, has certainly been to embrace the bow tie methodology. Uh, it's something that we found um, very effective uh, for moving through those initial mine closure risk assessment sessions. Um, the bow tie methodology really provides you with an opportunity to assess multiple threat lines, um, look at multiple scenarios, and look at those controls that you can put in place, um, both that are preventative, in other words, before the unwanted event, but also that you can put it on the right-hand side of the bow tie, which is around um, reactive or, or mitigation in, in, in the case where the event might occur, but we want to put in place controls um, to, to manage, I guess, that unwanted event. Typically, we would, we would identify the unwanted event as you know, not achieving satisfactory closure of the site, which results in the inability to complete lease relinquishment or something along those lines. And it's not always lease relinquishment. Sometimes there are other unwanted events, but typically with the end game being tenement relinquishment, we look at, the, look at it from that perspective. Why bow tie? Well, our experience has been that, um, you know, um, bow tie is really useful for um, identifying a lot of risks um, quickly, identifying a lot of controls quickly. And I'll talk a bit about some of the other flexibilities um, shortly. It, it's fast, you can get through a lot of material. Uh, it's easy to communicate. We've found that there's increased engagement from the participants compared to say a more traditional rack approach. Um, whilst we've got a whole bunch of people in that early stage contributing to, to what the risk profile might be. It's quite easy to replicate and, and use multiple threat lines or attributes for multiple threat lines um, throughout the process. Um, and there's also an ability in the software that we use to be able to assign attributes and do some fairly robust reporting um, against some key attributes as well. If I move over to the, um, just an example, just to drill in a little bit deeper and have a, have a bit of a deeper look at the bow tie. This is just an example that I've worked up to sort of talk through the process. Um, I think what's important is when we do our, our, our bow tie approach in this early stage, we, we make sure that we, we address um, a, long, uh, a long risk assessment. So go across the remaining mining, um, go across um, what's left in the current LOM and try and identify those opportunities to, to guess, do things now while we've got an operation. We also have a look at the, the, de the decommissioning and demolition um, phase of it uh, as well. And then we would typically roll through those, those five or six phases of rehabilitation aligned with what the department has identified as their, as their key expectation. This one, this example here is a, a risk assessment um, on, on the LOM and we identify that core uh, unwanted event of not achieving satisfactory closure of the site, um, which results in the inability to, um, to uh, relinquish the lease. On the left-hand side, then we have a series of threat lines. Um, we can identify one through to 50, depending on, on what, what's appropriate. In this particular case, it's around uncertainty uh, around the agreed landform um, and um, 
sorry, uncertainty around the, agree, the, the agreed uh, landform from an approval sense or whether in a land use sense. And so we would go through um, that particular uh, threat line, looking at what controls we could put in place. So the blue there represents, I guess, the core controls that we might discuss. So consent outlines, what our obligations are. We've got our MOP in place, soon to be an RMP. We can do some consultation around the, 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 um, the modification at landform if that's required. And we've got our core completion criteria. What, what this is demonstrating here is that the, I'm just gonna try and pause the timer. So what, what, um, what this demonstrates here is in the risk assessment, we're able to actually do a bit of a drill into each of the controls and assign responsibility. We're able to make an assessment of whether or not we think that control is satisfactory. So it's a discussion around the effectiveness. And we're also about identifying whether or not there it's an existing control or a proposed control. And that's important because if it's proposed and it's work to do, if it's existing, we need to be satisfied that it's 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 appropriate um, and, and does the job for us. What we've also identified here is um, this critical control piece. We've looked at the controls that um, are preventing this event and we're putting in place a critical control. In this case, we've identified that for this particular issue, we need to um, do the consultation piece with stakeholders around the potential or not for a modification to, to the landform. When we identify a critical control, we also escalate that down to say, well, because that's a critical control, how do we make sure that it's not forgotten? Um, sorry, I think when I practiced this last night, it's got a time, anyway, I'll crack on. Um, so we put in place a control here that says, um, uh, what's, our, what's our consultation? We need to make sure that happens. We need to make sure we put in place certain things to manage uh, that consultation and make sure it occurs. So we identify their responsibility around that. We put that into a stakeholder management plan, and then we wind that up into a project execution plan. So it's all about identifying that critical control, making sure that in the process of, um, of, of reviewing the critical control, we put in place additional controls to make sure that doesn't fail. I'll just quickly run back through this and I apologize the slides taken off on me there a bit. What we're able to do here also is just assign action. So for each of these controls where there is, where it requires improvement or it's a critical control, we're able to assign actions. Um, and in this particular case, it's about the consultation. It's undertake that consultation. There's a responsibility. Uh, and again, those attributes are, are, are sort of maintained um, inside the software and able to be reported against. When we move past that early, early stage of identifying both through the workshop and um, moving into um, the bow tie, the initial bow tie, we then do a, a, a midpoint risk assessment, which is a bit of a different approach to what we would do in the beginning. And, and it's a different approach because we want to look at it a little bit differently. The reason we want to look at it differently is that we now have the benefit of input from the technical studies. We've closed some of those knowledge gaps and are able to bring back into the risk assessment now the benefit of, of some of the outcomes of some of those studies. We've also had some new risks uh, emerge as part of the process and we're pulling those back into this, into this uh, risk register as well. So let's take a look at this one. So this is the unwanted event. I've just used a different example this time. This is about um, not achieving satisfactory closure um, uh, Oh, sorry, the same on one of the band, apologies, not achieving satisfactory closure to which results in an inability to complete leash relinquishment. I've identified a, a new threat line. In this particular case, we're, we're looking at this threat around having suitable quantities of material available to execute our, our rehabilitation process. The control that was identified initially was that we needed to undertake an assessment of uh, material and do a mass balance it was identified as a critical control, which meant that we had a series of um, escalating controls in place. And the risk was that perhaps the material balance is not, is not accurate and, and there's some errors in there. So to mitigate that, we've identified, um, you know, using an appropriately qualified engineer to do, be part of the design process and undertaking a peer review of the design. The reason we escalate that, as I indicated earlier, was it's been identified as a critical control. 
There's a range of other important controls there as well, um, and that we can identify things that they've either come through from the original risk assessment, part of an output from a technical study, or part of a response from the peer review. And we're able to record that, that information. What's also useful in this particular, um, I guess, more, more traditional style risk register is that we're able to bring that information through, um, but to start to assign some actions, start to put some responsibility around those actions and, and start to put some due dates in there as well. The other thing is that we, um, we always try and understand in, our, in this risk assessment process as we move to the midpoint and then this carries through and rolls to the final risk assessment is we start to capture now a bit of, a, a bit of an assessment of the actual risk profile. And the benefits for this is that it's demonstrating that the controls that we've identified are driving that risk profile down. It, it demonstrates that when we're going, talking to, uh, I guess, internal stakeholders, that there's been value in the controls and the money spent to drive that risk control down. And I think that's an important piece. It's also important to understand that if we can't drive that risk profile down um, far enough, that we might be starting to see an emerging residual risk here. And, and in doing so, um, we have to start thinking about that. So we may go back and revisit some of our controls and mitigation strategies, um, or we may have to start to think about, um, you know, carrying that forward as we, as, we, as we move through the process and we start to get some visibility on, on that risk process. All right, I think I've pretty much got to the end, Matt. I'm, I'm happy to um, have a conversation or answer some questions, mate. Yeah, not a problem. So we do have one here. Um, so uh, this is from Kevin Jacob. So he says, I have a problem with risk assessments being completed without HAZOP, where the risks are identified, addressed, and controls put in place for the risk assessment being the outcome of the system along with updated P and IDs. One can argue that the risk assessments do not always contribute to system changes, but that it's just a standard work instruction. Why are risk assessments complete in isolation? You want to answer that one or? Uh, I don't fully understand that question. Um, Bron, can we, um, can we um, unmute Kevin? Is that possible just to just go to Kevin, just to have a quick chat? Oh, no problem. You there, Kevin? Yes, I am. Hey, Kevin, uh, do you want to take us through that? Um, are you aware of the uh, HAZOP process? Uh, in general terms, yes. Okay. Um, look, the, basically the, the HAZOP is there to identify risks um, to, to processes. Yep. And um, essentially the outcome is the risk assessment. But what you're doing is if you're um, doing the risk assessment, um, you're obviously highlighting elements which need to uh, change in the process by implementing controls. Yes. So, you know, you, you, you're fixing the problem right there. Um, now, if, you, if you're not making changes to the system, you, um, it's basically just a standard work instruction. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a laborious task which, which, you, which you're doing every day. Um, and the, the 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 whole thing for me is that a risk assessment cannot be done in isolation without looking at a process, or there must be some sort of formalized procedure which um, which makes you interrogate um, the system as well as the environment. Um, there, there must be an outcome additional to the risk assessment. Yeah. Well, in the context of my enclosure, I think the the, and I accept what you've said, but the, the risk assessment really helps us identify um, some of our, our knowledge gaps, things that we don't know. And it, it does feed into, I guess, um, working through some of those, um, those technical studies to close that gap. Um, it helps us uh, demonstrate that the, um, the effectiveness of our mitigation. Um, and quite often, you know, we don't have 
we don't have good visibility on on the key issues as, at the commencement of a mine closure um, process, and so we 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 get a lot of benefit out of this risk process by by identifying those and identifying controls. So I think it's probably a little bit of a difference to perhaps taking an approach um, that we might take in a safety sense um, versus, um, I guess, informing the closure the closure process. Can I, can I argue with that, if you, yeah, if you don't please. mind? And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, for me, um, look, in terms of mine closures, um, in the beginning, when, when a mine approaches um, uh, the, the, the regulating authorities to start a mine, they do an EIA. And part of the EIA is land rehabilitation. So the risk assessment is that they're not going to um, be able to... Um, uh, reclaim that land properly and um, they're not going to be able to successfully um, I don't know rehab rehabilitate their tailings rehabilitate um, their uh, uh, water water um, water dams mm -hmm. and that that is a that there, there's there must be some sort of process because there's as soon as water comes into contamination with rock it, it forms it forms an um, acidic compound and that's very corrosive and it's obviously it, it pollutes the underwater tables so there must be some sort of process um, or some sort of uh, um, outcome to, to actually rehabilitate that that land successfully so it, it, there, there is an outcome there is a process yeah okay yeah. I think everybody. I think we're actually running out of time. We're going into that lunch break, but appreciate that um, that question, Kevin and, and Andrew. I really appreciate your presentations. I might call that session there. Um, our lunch session goes from uh, twelve to twelve forty-five, so we'll start um, right on twelve forty-five. Um, but Andrew, from the resource regulators perspective, um, really appreciate your, um, your your presentation today. Thank you, mate. Thanks very much, everybody, and um, uh, thank you, Kevin, for your question. And we'll be back here at twelve forty-five. So Brett is the uh, Senior Geotechnical Engineer, um, Principal for Colm Crippen, Burger Australia. Uh, Brett has 30 years of experience in mine environment and re uh, water resource projects spanning throughout Australia, Canada and internationally. He has a registered professor engineering in Australia, Canada and the United States. Sorry, professional engineer. His experience includes tailings dams, water supply dams and associated infrastructure. Brett has been working on the planning, design and construction of tailings and water dams over for the last 20 years. He is currently or has previously held the role of design engineer of record for several extreme and high consequence tailings dams. He has also participated in engineering audit and assessment of over 100 tailings and water dams worldwide. His topic today is tailings and waste rock management considerations for mine closure. So um, over to you, Brett. So, so um, just making sure I've got the right presentation up. So mine, um, just a bit of background on me, I'm a geotechnical engineer and my primary role is really the design and uh, construction and operations of tailings dams. So where I fit in the uh, life cycle of, of reclamation and closure is that my, my role is to try and provide a, a closure landscape for all of these other parties who do the uh, closure covering and and put the caps on. So we we try to design what we call a reclamation ready landscape in a, in a mine um, for the waste facilities, including the tailings. So we'll just talk about, I'm gonna talk about that little part of the, the process. Um, as part of that, I'll just talk, give a bit of a background on, on, the, on the current trends in tailings. And I'm not sure if there's a lag at the moment. Uh, Hopefully you see the next slide. So, so I'm going to talk about idea. recent trends in tailings management. Um, I'm a tailings engineer, so I'll probably always move to where I'm comfortable. And we'll talk about reclamation to relinquishment. When is it possible? And how do you close the tailings facility? Very difficult to, to close the tailings facility unless you actually plan it from the beginning. Um, and I'll provide uh, at the back of the presentation some examples of some risk-informed closure design. Um, a lot of them are biased for my most of my experience um, in that in this sort of side is actually in the oil sands in Canada, so I'll talk about that and some key takeaways when you're um, looking at these tailings dams. So, um, really, just 
a bit of an overview on recent trends in tailings. Um, unfortunately for the industry, there's been some high profile tailings facility failures. Um, you know, one of them, you know, three of them have uh, are sort of out there and, and had a, a profound impact on the industry. First one was uh, Mount Polly Dam in British Columbia, Canada, which was a, a failure of a dam during construction through the foundation. Um, and that re re resulted in a, in a significant upgrade in the guidelines for tailings dams in, in Canada. Um, followed closely to that was actually the Fundau Dam in Brazil, which was a uh, another foundation failure um, of a dam in the iron ore. And, and then the third dam, which is the Fajau Dam, which is which was very visible because it was captured on camera. And uh, I guess of note to the to this proceedings is that was a closed facility that had actually um, failed because of an increasing piezometric surface in the in the tailings, um, very weak and brittle tailings. Um, as a result of this, um, regulators, um, investors, and insurers um, sort of have taken a, a look at all the tailings management and really the global industry standard on tailings management was a response to that, all this investor inquiry and they've set up that and we'll talk about the standard and what its impact is going to be on tailings going forward. Um, it's really an increased focus on the management and governance. It's a, it's a framework to work in. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't preclude the, uh, the current regulatory requirements, but it puts in a, an increased you know, focus on the management and governance. So, Part of that is that the companies and the mining companies need to appoint an exec accountable executive who's going to be responsible to ensure the safety of the dams, and they must respond. They, they must re report to the, the CEO or equivalent, and they need to ensure safe closure, which is demonstrated. So closure is very prominent in this document that it needs to have the end in mind, and it needs to design to as alert principles. And there's a much higher focus on auditing of all of these facilities. And that includes demonstration that you, you meet not just the design and the governance requirements, but also the closure principles at the start of the process. So um, as part of this process, there's also an engineer of record. So having worked in North America for about 15 years um, and being an engineer of record, it's, a, it's sort of interesting to come back to Australia where that term isn't really used, but really the engineer of record is a qualified competent engineer who's supported by a team which is proportional to the complexity of the project that needs to be worked through. So the engineer record is the accountable professional engineer that they head a multidisciplinary function team. So that needs to include geoscientists, you know, geochemists, hydrologists, um, closure, closure people to actually run through and actually pull together a single, a single project for this. So um, the engineer records responsible for risk assessment and also for change management because um, the failure at Fundau, Fend which was the second failure I showed you before, was a, a function of poor construction and the change management wasn't, wasn't managed properly and resulted in uh, the failure of that dam. Um, the intent of this engineer record is to force the clients and the design engineer who's responsible for the design, who's accountable for the design and, and where that all works. Um, I'm gonna put a pretty confused slide up here, but I really wanna talk about consequence class in, in the design of tailings dams. So when we design dams in, a, in Australia, we design to ANCOLD and ANCOLD is really, we set our design standards according to the, the maximum plausible failure that this, uh, this dam may cause. So we, we look at the severity of the damage of loss in terms of uh, a number of factors, including population at risk, economic, environmental, societal, and then we look at the population at risk and where those meet, we, we actually pick a design criteria. Now, that doesn't mean that this may happen, but it really helps us uh, set the design criteria that we need to work to. So in this table, which is very confusing, um, we, we have actually the, the ANCOLD consequence categories in black, but we also have the, the global standard categories below that. Um, so basically, what we're seeing is that there's a, a push in the industry to, to go to more conservative design and design criteria. And one of the outcomes of this is designing for passive closure, which is basically a tailings dam that's going to be handed back to the um, society 
it really needs to be designed to an extreme consequence and the highest standard of design. Um, as a result of these failures, obviously a lot of us will have seen a push to dewatered tailings and filtered tailings. So instead of having these fluids pushed out into these dams, looking for these dry stacks and commingling of disposal, um, there's a number of uh, studies that have been completed in the last sort of five to 10 years after these failures. Um, some of them, you know, uh, like the MEN study in uh, Canada and the oil sand tailings technology, which I'll throw some photographs I saw some pictures out of that as part of the presentation. I, I was on the working group for that, that project in 2012. And I'll just look at some of the, the case studies. Um, I suppose the takeaway for me as a practitioner in tailings is that you need to understand how these filtered and commingled systems work as an integrated system. And it needs to be looking at the life cycle. So I think you'll have heard life cycle planning and looking at the end in mind and do it once, do it right. I think that theme is 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 um, ubiquitous in tailings and waste management because if you don't get the planning right, the costs and the risks and the liabilities aren't there. So I'm a big advocate for forward planning and repeated planning cycles to come up with the right answer because uh, repeated trial and error beats uh, planned perfection every time, especially in the mining environment when there's so many variables we just don't know at the start. So again, this is really just talking to that. The earlier we get these cycles of planning in and the earlier we identify these risks and opportunities, and, and particularly the earlier you can get some, some test plots of, of closure and reclamation out there for all of these stakeholders to look at and see the more confidence the regulators have. And, all, and of course, the more confidence the, the stakeholders and the society has and the more confidence the company has that they've got a, a closure solution that meets every everyone's needs and that just makes the whole process easier to implement and easier to apply. So when is a tailings facility closed? Um, that's the big question. So that's the question everyone asked me, how do we, how do we close a tailings facility? When, when can we walk away from it and not have any, any issues in terms of risk? So that's a big, that's a big question. And that's the, you know, the, where we are, we're moving to as an industry. Um, so we need to demonstrate the closure is not going to be a problem. It's stable in terms of landform. And that means the tailings in it aren't going to flow. They're not going to deform or not going to release um, either physical materials or chemical materials with time. And that's very difficult to, to establish. And, and I think that's setting that goal up the front is really key. So you need to determine the maintenance and level of surveillance required. And, and as, as I'll show in some of these examples, some of these dams are hundreds of meters high it's very difficult to go and take a 100 meter dam and, and turn that into something that's a passive closure um, outcome. Um, a LARP is also trying to show that this is low as reasonably possible is very difficult. You've got to communicate that to a lot of people. And a lot of people have a different risk tolerance and uh, if anything, um, the COVID response has shown us that a lot of people have different risk toler tolerances in our society. So setting that risk tolerance and that judgment works and. I believe these risk assessment tools that we're talking about today is one of those keys to numerate the, make the risks numerate and allow us to, to talk about them on a, on a standard basis of what acceptable risk is to society. So we, so as I said before, we need a stable landform with low residual risk. We need societal acceptance of that. It's gotta be physically and chemically stable. So there's no point having a stable dam if it leaks acid drainage into the, into the landform. And it's not really a static system. So these two bar, bars down the bottom is, is really the, the area that I operate in, that I, I provide a physically stable landform. Hopefully it's chemically stable. We've, we've got and managed all of the um, materials in the, um, in, the, in the pile. And then really what we do then do is we hand that over to the next steps in the, in the team to come up with an ecological, an ecological and a social transformation of this landform to meet closure needs. Um, so I'm not gonna go through this slide, but these are just some of the elements that need to be looked at in the context of when it needs to be closed in terms of physical stability and chemical. So as I said, I'm just throwing that up there. There's a lot of, lot of points that need to be looked at. So it needs to be a, a structured look at how these, how these systems work. Um, so, I think this is a more interesting part of my talk. I'm going to just talk about some examples of risk-informed closure design. 
um, that I've that we've been a, a part of as a, a company and we're informed about. Just closure in terms of active care, passive care, a little bit of permitting from a project I'm involved with in the US at the moment. I'm going to talk about progressive reclamation that's occurring in the oil sands, which is is probably akin to some of the, the coal work that's here in, in terms of scale and the problems they're dealing with and the regulatory um, scrutiny to they're under. So this first one is in the southwestern US. It's a legacy site. It's a copper mine. Um, it's a cyclone sand dam. Um, it's uh, active care because the dam really has a risk of, uh, of flow and movement under both uh, rainfall storage release events and seismic. Um, so as part of this leg legacy assessment, we, we looked at this a few years back and we've carried out characterizations of these legacy sites, looked at the, looked at the um, dam break assessments and, the, and looked at the risk assessments. So we've carried out a number of risk assessments for these, which included failure modes, effects analysis, um, bow ties to inform these characterizations. And we've looked at all of the failure modes and, and in, as part of that, just helped eliminate some of the hazards and also characterize critical controls. So this is one example. So this is a picture of the dam here um, showing where the water is stored on it. Um, it's quite a dry environment, very similar to Australia. Um, and what we've done is we've, um, we've, we've got the, the, the middle picture there shows the tailings in the dam prior to mobilization of a seismic event. And this is the predicted flow simulation of this using um, an open source uh, code called MADFLOW, which allows us to do um, uh, flow modeling of, uh, of non-Newtonian of non fluids with a bit like dam break with water, but with, with soils. And the intent of this work is to try and understand if we do have a dam break, what's the extent of mobilization of these materials in the dams? And that helps us to talk to the regulators about here's the impact if this uh, seismic event occurs or if there's an overtopping event occurs. So we've done simulations with this for a number of different failure modes, be it seismic or overtopping or, or other methods. And so the intent is that we can characterize what happens and then we can make, make these tools useful to actually work out what controls we put in, what stabilization systems we put in, buttressing, drainage, management of water. So it's, a, it's a very useful to have these tools to help decision-making and, and, and look at the risk assessments. Uh, another dam in British Columbia, this is another active care dam. It's 140 meters high. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a modified downstream raise, which means it's basically being built out of cyclone sand. It's very well drained, um, quite a robust design. Um, but the, we actually have uh, an active water treatment required for this dam uh, that will, will probably be going out into perpetuity. So here's a picture of the dam before reclamation showing the, um, the construction of the dam through, through cyclone to sand tailings. So it's a quite a significant structure of sand. So it's very stable um, in terms of slope stability and it's unlikely to deform. Um, but again, we have this active reclamation requirement for the water treatment there which will continue. Um, here's another site in the Northern Territory. This is closed, it's in passive care. This is one of the easier ones to talk about because effectively as part of closure, the, um, the tailings dam was picked up and relocated into the mine pit and covered to, uh, to give a clay and a wet cap cover design. So this, this dam is, is gone. So the risk has been completely removed. There is no dam safety issues because we've got rid of the dam and uh, there's still ongoing monitoring as part of the, uh, the handover process. So there's a picture of the uh, mine pit full of water. So, uh, so this is the project I mentioned in the US. This is a project that's currently in regulatory um, preparation to submit and approve. We're looking, it's an underground copper metallic mine um, and the current tailings management on this is filtered tailings. Um, this project's been in progress for about seven or so years now. It's a very large copper deposit with uh, probably 100 years more of mining reserve available, but the, current, but the initial starting project is 20 years. Um, we've looked at PFA, the, you know, pre-visibility assessment of the site 
and and really we when we started off we it, it's in a very um, cold climate so the big issue we had when we started looking at alternative uh, um, tailings management for this site with with the client very focused on closure was that we couldn't get filtered tailings to work because unfortunately in three months of the year the temperature hovers around about minus 20 degrees at night so it's very difficult to place um, filtered materials and get them compacted at those temperatures and maintain the the operation at about 20,000 tons a day of tailing so it was initially considered to be unfeasible um, and then issues around water management which typically pushes us towards these um, these uh, filter stacks arose and that we couldn't actually manage the water of the wet tailings dam across catchments because of uh, regulatory issues so we went back to the drawing board and found that we had 40 percent of the tailings could be um, placed underground as backfill and we had the flexibility within the mine plan to do that over the winter period so what we now have on this project for permitting is a, a tailings dry stack that's um, going to be operated as a dry stack for nine months of the year and then in the winter years in the winter months basically December January and February um, we'll be placing that tailings as a cemented backfill in the in the stopes so that we don't have to be out there in the cold trying to compact uh, ice cubes so with this is just a simple section of of the dry stack it's built even though it isn't a dam we've built it through similar to a dam and, and the outer section of this is going to be engineered fill so this will be an engineered placed material which is going to provide us a, a compacted landscape and then this other area on here has a lesser compacted system in order for us to uh, provide something that's going to allow us to progressively uh, reclaim this area and reduce the water and dust issues around the operation. So the intent of this is that by the, by the time this is finished in 20 years, there'll be about 20% of the area closed as part of progressive, 20% of the area open only as part of progressive reclamation. Um, this one here is just a, this is a Alberta oil sands where I've worked for about 14 years. The oil sands are open cut um, projects, very similar to a coal mining in Australia. Uh, the, oil, the oil sands is basically a sand deposit where the voids are filled with bitumen. They wash the, the sand and bitumen with hot water and extract it. And then they turn that bitumen into crude oil through a refinery process. They're very large operations. They're quite large scale. Most of these mines mine about a million tonnes a shift and half of that is ore, half of that is overburden. So from the ore, they, they, they generate a significant volume of fines. They call these legacy fines mature fine tailings or MFT. Um, and in addition to that, because of the really poor geotechnical conditions there, the typical slopes for these external dams are eight to one and 20 to one slopes, really, really weak materials. Um, fortunately, the chemical, there's not a lot of chemical issues with these materials. Really, these naphthenic acids, which are polyaromatic hydrocarbons, they're quite uh, low dissolved solids. And then in the tailings, they actually wash out quite quickly with rainfall. So the environmental legacy with the oil sands, once you've actually had these materials have had time to flush, is, is very, very low. And so that, that, that allows them to be quite easily um, reclaimed, provided you can get this geotechnical stability for these very large structures. Um, if anyone's really interested in the technology there, there's a, there's a document called the Oil Sands Technology Roadmap by Alberta Innovates Energy and Environmental Solutions, a government body for Alberta in 2012. And that was a collaborative effort by all of the um, consultants working in the industry, along with the industry partners to go through and document these technologies that are used in the oil sands. And I'll show some examples of these in the following pages. But if you need that document, if you want to look at it further, that's available online and you can, you can download that document, some quite interesting reading in that, where it talks about how these technologies are applied in this environment. Typically the, um, in the oil sands, it's mostly sand with the fines that are generated. So you, you'll get these beaches deposited into these pits where we store them. And then you'll have this legacy MFT, which is that central area of that material. So as you're generating more and more MFT, you still have a water cap, but that legacy of uh, fines um, moves through with the mining and continues to increase. So 
Um, there's, there's a number of solutions that have been adopted in the industry. The, the initial solution where most of them are permitted is this end of, end of mine pit lake where they place these fines, the fine tailings is transferred into the final open pit that's left remaining and then they put a water cap on the site um, and then they and then have a wetland to rec reclaim and treat this material coming out. So that's been accepted by the regulators, but it has a lot of caveats in terms of um, having to demonstrate. So the, a, a number of the operators have spent a substantial amount of money in demonstrating that this end of, la end of lake, uh, end, end of mine lake, pit lake is going to provide the protection and the long-term landscape that they have there. They fortunately have a pretty good water balance and that they're net water positive, so this system can work for them. Um, a number of operators have worked through what they call composite tailings or combined tailings, or they've also called it non-segregating tailings. And what they've been doing is they've been taking this legacy MFT and they've been putting that into the pipeline with the tailings and with the view that they increase the fines content in the void space in the sand. So that means that the 30% void space, they try and fill with as much of this fine material and remove the legacy content of that. So instead of transferring this increasing legacy content of MFT from pit to pit to pit as they mine, the intent is to try and put as much of it in the pore space as you can. So it's a bit like commingling that we see in coal. Um, there's a, a number of different ways that have been applied. Each operator has a different way of looking at it. Some of them trying to do it to make, make sure the sand retains a, a trafficable surface to support the closure. And others, in this example, put the MFT in and make it almost like a soft soil. So, and they're, and they're looking at um, then doing capping and closure using covering methods and, and, and treating it like a fine tailings in the pit. So each operator has the different view on this and it really is a function with their area of the mine pit, the volumes of overburden they have, and also the resources that they have in hand. I'll show you some pictures at the end to sort of show what they both look like in the one photo. Um, so one of the other elements that's been tried up in the oil sands is what they've called thin lift drying. Um, and believe it or not, most of the thin lift drying up there is actually done in the winter time where they actually use freezing conditions to freeze the soil. It over consolidates the soil. And then in the spring, all these um, heavily frozen soils then release the water and allow it to consolidate and reduce the volume. So this thin lift drying has been applied and it's been done at significant scale with literally hundreds of people involved in the operation to do millions of tons. It's, it's not very economic, but it does work and it's been proven. It really just got a large area that they don't actually have, um, unfortunately. So just a couple of minutes, Brett. Just a couple of minutes. This is my last few slides. Um, so this is just the uh, examples of progressive reclamation. Um, so I'll draw your attention to the red arrows on the right-hand picture. This is present day off Google Earth. There's a scale there to show you the size of these cells. Um, the, the, left cell on, the left cell, which has got the sand capping, is Syncrude. And they've run com composite tailings using a sand base system. And the right cell, which is co-capping, is this weaker material where they've got the higher clay content. And that's for Suncor. They have coke coming from their system, so they're able to use that coke, which is a light material to cap and cover. So if you look down to the, just to the southern section where those two road signs is, um, there's a small area there that was actually reclaimed by Syncrude, and it's really a demonstration piece. So they went through to the effort of actually reclaiming a very, very small section of the in-pit and getting it approved by the regulators. So that was a quite a good piece of work in that they've demonstrated what the end of end of closure is going to look like. They've got the regulators to agree on the process and now they're moving forward with this reclamation system. So quickly, the key takeaways take for me, and I'll, I'll flip through this quickly. Really, the leading practice promotes a risk-based design for tailings and you need to, there's no silver bullet, bullet. You need to go and look at all of these different options. And a lot of these options that once you've done the whole life cycle assessment, didn't look um, reasonable at the start, actually start to look good that holistic design approach is required. Um, and it's a large scale engineering project and, and it needs more people than just engineers. It needs each year scientists and soil scientists and other people to, to work it through. Um, you've got to ensure that this, uh, this final landscape of a dump or a tailings dam is stable. And, and sometimes that needs to be designed at the front end. Otherwise it's very difficult to fix a dam at the end. 
and you need to understand these credible failure modes. Um, and it, basically some level of surveillance and maintenance is likely going to be required for tailing dams, especially these large ones, which are hundreds of metres high. Um, good time and planning up front. I put in this business cycle process. So this, this is an example of a project. They have identical net present value when you look at it from an economic viewpoint. But the second, but the lower value cost one even has got a higher upfront capital cost, but a much, much lower um, legacy cost for closure. So it's not just the, cap the capital cost that needs to be looked at. It needs to be looked at the operating paradigms for the project. You got to have environmental and stakeholder and to work out what the solution is. There's not more than one metric that needs to be involved. And uh, I think the, the, key, the key takeaway for me is that in the last five to 10 years, there's a lot more tools available for us to estimate what the impact of these dams are on failure. We can model these dam breaks a lot better now and slumps. We have a lot better tools to understand how, how we, how we um, these behave and the risk assessment tools therefore are much better informed because of that. I think ongoing, we're going to see much better, more structured assessments of these. And we'll be looking at these design bases at the front. Um, and I think uh, the framework will, will be there. Um, that's me done. Very good, Brett. Um, a question for me, I guess, based on your um, experience uh, in terms of those, some of these closure case studies, what would be your key advice to um, mine companies in the uh, design phase of the mine around more tailings management? not necessarily tailings dams. Oh, um, I, I, my, I keep saying it a lot, but I, I use the phrase, re, re, you know, repeated trial and error beats plan perfection every time. And that means you've got to go right to the end of the project to see if it doesn't work or it does work. So when the example in the US was, we, we, we had a, a, we looked at all these issues around freezing conditions and we, and we did the, the dry stack as an example, because we didn't, we didn't think it was going to work, but we did all the options. And, and really, once you'd actually gone to the end of the project and you looked at all of the issues and the regulatory issues, it ended up being the right option. So you've got to have an open mind. You can't be ruling out any of these technologies until you've actually done the work. So, and sometimes these things just surprise you. So um, you just, you, you've got to go and actually look at all of these options because it, it sometimes something will come out of left field. It doesn't make any sense. But once you've done all the work and you put the whole project together in terms of schedule and cost and material balance, something will pop up that you didn't really expect once you've done the work. And so that's that's where I see it. You just you got to have that open framework. Very good, very good message. Okay, well that's um that's the end of that session. I really appreciate that, Brett. And Brett will be sticking around for a panel session later in the afternoon. So um, if you've got any questions for him, um, yeah, feel free to throw those to him as part of the panel session. Thanks very much, Brett. Welcome back, everybody. Just um, give it one more minute. No, we're right on 12.45. So um, I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, um, who's Professor Greg Hancock. Um, he's from the School of Environmental Life Sciences, College of Engineering, Science and Environment, University of Newcastle. Uh, Greg has worked in the area of post mining landscape and assessment and mining for rehabilitation over the last uh, 25 years. Um, from, my, from my perspective, I've been watching Greg uh, speak at various industry forums uh, around this issue of uh, landform evolution modelling and been quite keen to see how that's evolved over time and <clears throat> certainly be a lot more accurate. Um, I guess what I'd like to do later this afternoon in the panel session is actually talk about the merits of this. Um, from the regulator's perspective, we see that as a, as a really important tool that doesn't have application for all scenarios. Um, and Greg will kind of drill into that today, um, where it can be used and what's some of the limitations, but what are a lot of the benefits of it. Um, he has particular expertise in the use of computer-based landscape evolution models, both current and proposed landscape assessment, in particular Siberia and CESAR. <clears throat> he has worked across a wide range of projects, sites and climates, both here in Australia, and internationally for government agencies, mining companies, and consultancy firms. He has published over 100 research and conference papers, as well as numerous industry research reports. Greg's also assisted the regulator um, as we prepared and developed our landform establishment cap. And we've also published some material uh, in terms of the land, use of landform evolution models on our website, and we'll actually put that into the chat as well. 
So without further ado, um, welcome, uh, Greg. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at the New South Wales Mine Rehabilitation Forum. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to present our work. Uh, now I've got the job of getting this up and going. I can see a present. It's, it's not in presentation mode at the moment, but. How's that? That's it, perfect. That's it, okay, okay. Um, quite a long presentation today. We cover a, cover a fair bit of country, but the focus is on landscape evolution models and constructing long-term stable landforms. Um, this work is certainly not conducted in isolation. Um, the original work with the Siberian model started off with Gary Wilgoose back in the 1980s. Um, I came along in the 1990s um, with a both a theoretical and, and applied use of the Siberian model. Um, and with that, we developed a team. Um, we've got Tony Wells, who's modeling at Lab and Research Support. Uh, we have Vermouth, who's the developer of the SPAM model. Um, I'll talk about the SPAM model later, the state space soil production and assessment model. We have in DISH, uh, who's GIS and modeling. Um, and Abraham Gibson, who's GIS modeling and has had superb field and lab support skills. A really good background to um, this work is in the Ozell IMM uh, start to finish book, um, where Gary Wilgus and I published a paper on 25 years of the use of Siberia. There's a, a, a compendium there of, of where Siberia has been used and how it's been used and, and, and a good background. So we're going to cover a, a lot of country today in this talk. I'm going to kick off with a bit of an introduction uh, in terms of the models. We're going to talk through um, some background to the models and how we've applied the models. And then I'm going to sort of sidestep into a case study about the ERA Ranger Mine, um, how we've got involved with, with the assessment there, and how useful landscape evolution models have been in assessing final designs for, for my enclosure there. Um, I'm then going to talk a bit about data needs and uh, what these models need and some, some direction for industry. Um, then a bit about future models with a focus on the SPAM model um, and then wrap it up with a conclusion. Um, what are the key considerations for landscape experiments and rehabilitation? Well, the goal of any mine is to operate with minimal environmental impact. And during mine operations, environmental impacts are largely planned and can be controlled. A key issue is that once a landscape is constructed, it is relatively costly to make significant changes. It's difficult to get, get equipment back and teams back um, post-closure. Um, even more difficult post-closure if there's any unforeseen issues that emerge. And a point that always strikes me about this work is that a reconstructed landform will be present forever. And it's of critical importance that we get the design right and get it right at the start. At issue is the increased waste volume of bulking as a result of blasting and handling and the inevitability that we'll have a structure that, that has elevations above the surrounding or the pre-mine landform. Therefore, slope lengths and slope angles will increase together with the issue of very different materials or likely very different materials on the surface that add the pre-mine landscape. There may also be the issue of the need to encapsulate hostile or, or unwanted materials within that structure, uh, a topic I'll return to later in the talk. So continuing with the key considerations, if we can design a landscape or construct a landscape, minimizes erosion, then we have a good chance that vegetation will be established, which will then reduce erosion and, and enhance long-term landform stability. But to do this requires an understanding of geomorphology and hydrology. That is an understanding of slope lengths, slope angles, hill slope curvature, and catchment area, all those factors that drive sediment transport. And this is where landscape evolution models come in. Landscape evolution models can provide insights into long-term landscape behavior. So what are landscape evolution models? Well, they originally developed um, back in the 1970s with the advent of computing when um, scientists, uh, scientists had access to, to computers. Um, they were initially developed to look at 
geological time scale of landscape evolution, the science questions behind landscape evolution. However, their uses were quickly realised outside of the pure science aspect. And since the 1990s, they've been extensively used to look at, look at other applications of which mine science are, are one of them. Um, this talk is not about any maths or, or, or any equations, but I just want to put up one equation that, that describes how these models work. And they all work off a similar type of sediment transport equation. The sediment transport equation consists of a fluvial transport term and a diffusive transport term. The fluvial transport term um, represents processes that, that incise the landscape processes like gullying. Um, whereas the diffusive transport term uh, represents those processes or describes processes such as rain splash, those processes that smooth the landscape. What the fluvial transport term consists of is uh, 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 a parameter Q, which is discharge raised to a power and slope raised to a power with a rate constant or a beta one out front. These parameters are critical for getting the erosion form and erosion position right. Diffusion is simply slope multiplied by diff diffusivity constant. So that's, that's, that's as much maths as we're going to get through in this talk. And the point I want to make is that it's critical to, to get those parameters to get a defensible or, or reasonable landscape as an output. So what can we do with landscape evolution models or what can we get out of? Them? Well, landscape evolution models provide an erosion rate and type. They provide a depth of erosion, as in millimetres to metres. They can operate over a range of spatial and temporal scales. Um, and when I say spatial and temporal scales, I mean we can run these models at sub-metre grid scales um, to, to, to grid scales of, of 10 metres plus when we're looking at large catchments. The models can operate at hourly time scales, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the Siberia model, for example, runs at hourly time steps or yearly outputs. And we can run these models at hourly time steps with, with outputs at hourly time steps all the way out to, to thousands and tens of tens of thousands of years, which is a requirement for some sites. There's a number of models that are used by industry at the moment. Um, the industry standard is the Siberia model um, developed by Gary Wilgoose. Um, the Siberia model is a 3D topographic evolution model. It simulates runoff erosion deposition at annual time steps. It predicts long-term channel and hill slope development. And the beauty of Siberia is it's relatively quick to run. Um, to run a, a 200 hectare catchment out for 10,000 years would only take a few hours, for example. So it's a, it's a relatively quick model to run. Caesar model, um, an absolutely brilliant model developed by Tom Coulthard at the University of Hull um, in the UK. It's, it has similar functionality to the Siberia model. Um, it predicts erosion and deposition. It evolves to landform, but the difference with, with Caesar is that it has a full-blown hydrology model in, in, its, in its formulation. And it brings in rainfall, uh, pluviograph rainfall at hourly time steps. So it's a model that allows you to, to bring in rainfall at hourly time steps and, and examine the impact of extreme events, uh, which I'll talk about later in the case study, or for example, here in the Hunter, the impact of something like the Pasha Volga storm. Um, the model, because it's got a, um, a hydrology model, it, you can also determine water quality in terms of milligrams per litres, uh, milligrams per litre of sediment um, exiting a catchment or, or even on a point by point basis within the, within the landscape. So CESAR is a very powerful and useful model. However, because of its complexity, it's quite slow to run. And the run time for in comparison to say the same catchment for Siberia, or landscape for Siberia is in the realms of days to weeks to get an output. The latest model uh, that's been developed in our team here at Newcastle is the model that we've called SPAM, uh, State Space Soil Production and Assessment Model. It's a model um, that we, we, we say is the latest generation um, of, landscape, of a landscape evolution model. It does everything Siberia does. Um, 
And it also has similar functionality to, to Caesar. We can run, we can run um, spam down to daily timesteps. So we can look at look at finer scale uh, rainfall events. But what we've realized, or one of the things that's become uh, important, uh, we've realized it's important over the years, is that landscape development, landscape evolution at the at the at the decadal to centennial timescales that we're required to look at re requires us to look at um, issues such as weathering, armoring, and pedogenesis, because landscape evolution is, is sure, it's, it's the, the surface um, is, is very, very important, but the subsurface is equally important. So SPAM um, has the capability to model weathering, armoring, and also um, our recent work has demonstrated that, that the model can actually produce soil horizons and soil profiles. So I'll talk more about SPAM at the end of this talk. So what are the advantages of landscape evolution models over other models such as the RUSLE and WEP? The RUSLE and WEP are fantastic models, um, but they're static models. They will only give you a, an erosion rate at the base of the slope. It won't tell you anything else other than that. Landscape evolution models link that equation together on a digital elevation model grid and calculate erosion and deposition at each point and then dynamically adjust the hill slope in a, according to that erosion and deposition. And I'll just step through a number of examples as, as to the power of these models and what we can do with these models. A really good background to these models and uh, the development of these models, the history of these models is um, in Gary Wilgoose's book um, that was published in 2018. Um, it, it's it's a, a really, really good book. It's a bit heavy in some areas, but if you want to know more about these models and the future of these models, um, I highly recommend this book. So in terms of how these models work um, and what we can do with these models, I've used this example numerous times and I keep coming back to it as the, the best example of a, of a, of a simple description of the, of the power of these models. Um, this is a, a rehabilitated waste rock dump in the gold fields of Western Australia. Uh, it was a project that I was involved with in the early 2000s, as you can see by the PPE that's been worn, um, been worn um, at, at the time. What you can see there is that contour bank is blown out and the vegetation is, is quite poor. And when you look at that, that hill slope, um, it's a, it's, it, it is, um, the prognosis for this hill slope is, is not good. And we were tasked with the question as well, do we go back and reconstruct the landscape as is, or do we do, we do other things? So what we did is we actually calibrated, developed parameters for the Siberia model for this particular hill slope and ran through a series of scenarios. So what we did is we, we generated a series of slopes. Uh, top slope is a landscape, is that, that same landscape with no contour banks. And um, you can see we ran the landscape through Siberia for 10 years with the, with the calibrated parameters. And what you can see is the landscape gullies. Similarly, um, that same landscape, but with the contour banks in place, um, we run the model and what we find is that the contour banks um, were, had no effect and the model was actually matching reality. So this gave the mine operator confidence to go and try other things that reproducing what they did before was, wasn't, wasn't practical. Um, some other work that we've been doing with, um, with the coal industry is developing a series of design landscapes or test landscapes um, with which to, to examine different design scenarios. Um, at this particular site, um, the, the, the requirement has been a, a 200 metre long hill slope, 100 metres wide, 15% um, slope, and the landscape has a 10 metre bench in the middle of it. A typical, a typical hill slope that you'd see on a mine site. And the idea is to run Siberia for, for 100 years to, to see how this landscape behaves. So at this particular site, there's a number of different rehabilitation strategies, a number of different targets, um, and a number of different materials. And I'm going to be very brave and see if I can show you a, um, a video 
of, of how this landscape behaves. So this landscape is a is a um, is a landscape with a material um, that has that is a good topsoil and and has good vegetation. So let's see if we can get this community to run. Can is yep, can you that's, see that moving? Yep. Yeah, okay. I, I can see that, Greg. Yep. So this is quite a boring animation. Um, you can see, I don't know why that's, that should have stopped at, um, at the end. Let's see if this one, I'll run it again, see if it stops at the end. But um, good topsoil, good veg, this conventional landform stands up. Um, it's, it's uh, and, and what this result shows is it actually matches, um, matches observation um, at this particular site. So a conventional design can work. So moving on to a uh, the same landscape, um, and this is this is poor topsoil with poor vegetation uh, with parameters calibrated for the site. Let's see if I can get this to. And you can see um, gullies develop after about ten years. You can you can see the gullies move up towards the bench, and I don't know why that's that's cutting out. Let's try this one. So gullies, gullies evolve quite quickly. The bench um, captures a lot of sediment, but um, both downslope of the bench and upslope of the bench. There we go. That one stays there. Um, shows extensive gullying, and 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 this matches reality. So the model, the model is doing the right thing. The parameterization is being correct in, in this case. Um, this is another uh, conventional landscape. Um, linear hill slopes with a contour bank, theoretical construction. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this construction later in the talk. Um, developed according to standard design. I'll see if I can show you a, a video of the, an animation of how this, this behaves. So this is using quite poor topsoil and quite poor veg. Um, the landscape, the, 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 the contour banks only last about 10 years. Um, so here we run so here for about 100 years in this case. And the gullies extend from the foot of the slope to, to, the, to the top of the slope. Okay, so moving on. Um, these models have not just been used in Australia. Um, they, they have been and are being used internationally. Um, I do quite a bit of work with Jose Martin Duke in Spain, and um, I've currently got a project with Jose. Um, it's a European Union sponsored project in Guadalajara province in Spain, looking at the restoration of former silica sand mines. This area in Spain is littered with these small former mines or quarries uh, where silica sand has been extracted for, for glass and for, and for pottery. Um, what we have here on the left-hand side is uh, the initial project, um, uh, been abandoned, um, no, no plans for restoration by the mining company. Um, and the, 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 the prognosis for this system is, is not good. The, um, this area is quite remote and relatively pristine and the stream down the bottom here, down the bottom of the hill slope is one of the most pretty picturesque streams you could ever come across with trout. So it's a, it's a, it's a remote location that has a lot of ecological value. Um, we've received funding from the EU to investigate um, the story. This, the, this site as a, this first one as, as a test case. So we're gonna, we've started off just looking at these two waste rock dumps here. Um, and we're just going to describe this particular one here that, that's been reconstructed according to um, um, geomorphic design. And what we have here is um, the, the, the surface has been reconstructed to have a small channel running, running through the centre with, with the channel delivering water to, the, to this natural creek or natural system over here. So this is what... The, the landform look like now. I'm going to talk more about geomorphic design and the geofield process a bit more um, in this bit later in this talk. But this landform went backwards and forwards in terms of getting the getting the, the design right. Like I say, I'll talk more about the design process a bit later. Um, but the big issue wasn't the geomorphology of this site. Um, the big issue was the materials. Um, 
And what we found was that the silica sands in this environment were, were highly erodible. And what we have here is that same design on the right um, with, with, the, with using the silica sand as a topsoil. Um, and after year one, you can see it's heavily gullied with the, with the main channel, um, having, quite, having a gully as well. And this is it after 20 years, um, the model predicts the landscape to be highly gullied. While, um, while we, we, this landscape hasn't been constructed, uh, hasn't been around for 20 years, our experience tells, it that, tells us that this outcome using silica sands is, really, is, is very likely. So this is, this is the same landscape, but with, with improved topsoil and vegetation. We actually brought in some topsoil um, and um, used the re-veg re -veg mix to, um, to literally glue that surface together. And we had everything going for us um, to, to get, the, get that initial veg established. And what you can see here is the model predicts with that good vegetation, very little erosion at year 10. There's a bit of a decision in the main gully, but um, at 100 years, we ran Siberia out for 100 years. There's, there is some gullying in the main channel. There is some gullying um, on the hill slope, but it is, it is commensurate with what we, what, we, what we see in the natural environment there. So this has been a good outcome. Um, moving on to the, to the span model and uh, uh, some, a local example. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with, with the coal industry to, um, to develop landscape evolution models and, and their, their reliability. Um, as part of a large project, we've looked at a, an open cut coal mine in the Bowen Basin um, to, to, to calibrate and validate the, the, the span model. What we have here is two sites. Um, we've just called them site A and site B. Site A has two major gullies um, in it, and site B has several smaller gullies and a lot of rills. So they're two different sites, two different materials. Um, both sites are roughly six years old. And we've put a lot of work into calibrating the span model, and um, these, these are the results. Um, to say two different materials um, at these sites. And what you can see here, here's, here's the, the gullies from the site. This is the span prediction of these gullies. Um, while you, you would never expect a numerical model to get gully form exactly right, but what I can say about this is the gully form, the triangular nature of the gully uh, that's been produced by span matches that of, of, of reality. And what's even more pleasing is the, these, these smaller gullies that, that, that move headwards onto the flat cap that again match reality really well. Um, SPAM is also able to capture the reels um, at roughly the same distance from, uh, from the top of the slope down, to the, down from the, uh, the break-in slope. Similarly for site B, uh, the model does a really good job at, at, um, at matching the, the reels. I won't spend too much time on this on this slide, but what all this shows is that the, 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 the gully morphology predicted by SPAM matches that of, of the field morphology. While the location of the gully is slightly different, one would never expect that the, that the gully, uh, the predicted gully to exactly match um, what, what's there in reality. But this gave us immense confidence in, in the SPAN model being able to predict such a large incisive feature on, on a coal mine. Um, and the other point that's, that this work demonstrated to us that is that this, this site is only six years old and we were able to match very well these, these erosion features that are, that, are, that are relatively young. Um, so this gave us confidence that if SPAM can match um, landscape evolution or erosion at an early stage, we've got confidence that it should be able to, to be reliable at, at longer time periods. So changing, changing tack and um, this kind of fits nicely uh, from, from what Brett was from Brett's talk just before this. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of work with tailings dams in the last couple of years. Um, after Brett's talk, I don't think I have to talk much about tailing dams and um, the concern over tailing dams. Um, we can use landscape evolution models to assess um, the erosional stability of tailing dams. 
um, our models have, can't can't um, predict geotechnical aspects, but what they can do is is predict erosion, and also with with the so with the season model, um, we can predict overtopping, uh, erosion of that of that embankment, and then scour and, and gulling of that dam wall. So this is this is a project. Um, that, that we did a couple of years ago now, where there's a tailings dam, a uh, well-constructed dam with a very well-constructed um, armoured surface. But upon examination, that, that, that armoured surface had some small gullies. And the question that was asked is, what's the longevity of this structure? Um, what do we need to do? Are these gullies gonna grow? Um, what, how, how should we cap the structure? How should we, how should we close out the structure? Which again comes back to questions that the was talking about. So there was two designs here um, that were that were on the table. One was a cap dam, uh, and this is the arid zone um, in Australia. Uh, low rainfall, 350, 450 millimetres a year. Um, the tailings dam was the design. It's a hypothetical design with 300 metres by 300 metres, 12 metres tall, not a big structure. Um, and there's two metres of cover over, over the dam. And we, we had some parameters for the site, which we're able to input into Siberia. We ran Siberia. In this case, I'll show you a movie, um, an animation in a minute. We, the requirement was to run Siberia out or assess the landform for 10,000 years because there was the potential that radionuclides would be need to be contained within the structure. And what you can see here at 100 years, um, there's extensive gullying moving up the break-in slope, moving up to the peak of the cap, and there's extensive deposition at the, at the bottom. And at 500 years, you can see that, that again, gullies have migrated towards the centre and there's a fair amount of deposition at the base of the slope. I'll see if I can show you this animation this structure. Yeah, there we go. So we estimated about 2,000 years it's likely that, um, that um, the tailings would be exposed. This was the other proposed design, uh, turkey's nest style tailings, design, tailings dam. Um, same footprint, 300 metres by 300 metres, uh, 12 metres tall. Um, store and release design, no, no spillway. Um, the, the numbers were done to, for this, for this um, design to handle a one in 100, one in 200 year storm. Um, all water would be, would be encapsulated, all, all rainfall would be encapsulated within the structure and, um, and, and um, managed that way. Interestingly, the, um, you can see that at 100 years, running the same parameters through Siberia, um, minimal erosion, and at 500 years, yes, um, there has been some, some erosion of the embankment, but considerable deposition, but at 500 years, tailings well and truly still contained. And I'll certainly I'll show you this animation. Yeah, so at 10,000 years, the, the tailings would well and truly still be contained within that, within that structure. So moving on from that, um, we've also been doing some work with valley fill tailings dams. Um, these are a common, common design. Um, this is a, another hypothetical situation that we were asked to examine. It's a relatively small tailings dam. Um, again, uh, store and release type design, no spillway. Um, and the dam, the dam wall and, uh, and the fill behind the dam wall was designed for a one in 100 year event. We were, we were asked to examine um, that, that one in 100 year event um, using, actually this time using the Caesar model because we could input hourly rainfall. Um, we weren't too comfortable with just doing uh, a single run with this, with this um, particular design, just one rainfall scenario. So what we did was we took that natural rainfall and then generated a series of synthetic rainfall time series that was statistically identical to the natural, to the, to the 
to the to the actually bomb data that we had. And I'll show you I'll show you the uh, CESA results from um, from these different situations. Now you see here we were out to about four hundred years, and then bang, um, there's overtopping, gullying, and then uh, erosion of the tailings and the migration of the tailings through the um, through the stream system. So we were quite at first at first run we were quite pleased that this structure would handle a one in one hundred year event with no maintenance. But moving on to our next rainfall time series, bang that um, there's overtopping um, and failure of that dam wall within the first fifty years. So um, we ran a we ran a whole series of these scenarios. Um, actually, ran a hundred of these scenarios so that we could put some some numbers on the likelihood of this particular design um, and its and its failure. Yeah. So moving on, geomorphic design. Um, been a lot of talk about geomorphic design. What is geomorphic design? Well, geomorphic design uses information from natural environment to guide post mining landscape shape. For example, hill slope length, curvature, drainage density, distance from drainage divide to start of the channel, and other features um, can be determined from the natural or the post mining environment. This can be done a number of ways. It can be done using um, CAD design tools, um, but the mo the, there, there are bespoke design tools out there that allow you to, the, to, to, to do this in, a, in an organized framework. And, Geofluve um, is, a, is a model, as a program, uh, a design tool that, that takes this information and allows you to, 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 to construct a landform along geomorphic principles. You input the drainage network, slope length, slope angle, channel position, widths and sinuosities um, with the information sourced from local analogues or old mine sites. If, if you have suitable sites, suitable old sites around, or like a lot of the work that, 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 that I've been involved with, with Jose Martin Duke, adjust the landform in Geoflu until the landscape is optimised. And we do that using a, a landscape evolution model. So in summary, Geoflu provides a framework for, the integrated, uh, to, for, to, for integrating geomorphology or geomorphic principles in a CAD format. It's a really neat, good package. So the design process uh, that we use is we, we this, this um, flow diagram might be a bit busy, but we take a landscape design um, from the Geoflu program, and then we convert that into a file format that we input into a digital elevation model, in our case, Siberia. We then run the Siberia model with calibrated erosion and hydrology parameters, mostly for 100 years, because most problems are going to raise there that will be will, will arise within the first 10 years um, and 100 years is a reasonable time frame to, to run the model to see any 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 longer term problems we then assess the landscape evolution model outputs in terms of erosion rate erosion type um, where the if there's going to be gullies where the gullies are what are the depths of gullies and then we then can either accept the landform as being fit for purpose or we can go back into geofluve and, and modify, modify the landform and then go through this process again. So it's, 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 a, it's a dynamic and, and an iterative process to, to optimise a landform design. So just quickly go through a, a case study of, um, of um, where we, we have um, used and assessed a geomorphically designed landform. This is a, um, a mine, um, just a, construct, a mine waste rock dump constructed in a single lift. This is what this mine waste rock dump looks like in digital elevation model format. Um, nothing, nothing special about this, this particular landscape, but we were very interested in how a geomorphically designed landscape would stand up over 10 years, 100 years. Now, this landscape was constructed according to geomorphic principles by the mine operator, by the mine operations team, and they did a fantastic job. The landscape's about 12 hectares in size. Um, it was constructed in a series of small subcatchments with relatively short slope lengths. Um, and this landscape, when you see this landscape, 
looks very good. It has the appearance of a natural landscape, um, aesthetically very pleasing. The question we had was how robust is this, this geomorphically designed landfall? Um, so what we did is we set about looking at that, that geomorphically designed landform, but we actually improved or it, um, optimised that landform by this iterative process where we took that geomorphically designed landform, put it through Siberia, saw where it was eroding, and then took it back out into, um, into geofluid and adjusted the landscape until we, until we reduced, our, reduced our erosion rates and our gullying to the minimum that we could. We can then compare this to a typical linear slope and contour banks landscape. And then we thought, well, look, there's a big push to look at, look at natural landscapes, taking natural landscape topography and, in, and using that as a um, mine rehab design. So what we did is we took a, a natural landscape from the, the mine lease and literally shoehorned that onto the same uh, land, on the same footprint as, as the geomorphically designed landscape. So that's the geomorphically designed land, landform as built by land, mine staff. This is our improved geomorphic design. And what we found was that we could actually increase the, the volume of this landscape and increase the steepness of the hill slope. Um, and we could increase the, 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 the concavity of the, of, the, um, of the streamlines and still uh, result or still produce a, um, a lower erosion rate. So Jose Martin Duke has a real interest or passion for um, for uh, sinuous channels. Uh, he wanted to put in a, seri uh, a sinuous drain at the base of the, the landscape. Um, I don't think that's practical here at the scales that, that we operate in Australia, but in Spain that might be possible. But in the end, that that didn't have much an effect on the overall outcome. That's the the linear hill slope. And with contour banks that you saw earlier in that animation. This is the natural landscape taken from the mine lease area. In terms of the design constraints for this project, all landscapes were fitted with the same footprint and the landscape volumes. We, 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 we allowed ourselves to adjust the landscape volumes such that we could potentially put more volume into that landform, but also keep erosion low. And, we ran Siberia for, for 100 years. So this is the geofluid that our landscape has built. And what you can see here is uh, we have a series of gullies that run run down the, down the hill slope. Um, the gullies deposit material in the channels. So most of the, most of the gullies um, are, are on the hill slope with, with the deposited material preventing the, the, the large scale evolution of those gullies. But the erosion rate on this particular, on this geofluid based built landscape is, is quite low and commensurate with the surrounds. Now this slide's a bit busy, but um, it's important to put all the, the different landscapes together. This is the improved geofluid landscape. What we have is less gullies, less erosion. The contour bank landform, which you saw before, has extensive gullies. And similarly for this, um, the natural landform that we, that we shoehorned in. So putting that all together in terms of, in terms of numbers, um, the improved geofluid landscape has, has the lowest erosion rate and also the lowest uh, um, gully incision and also the lowest amount of, of deposition which fits with a, with a lower erosion rate. But what we were able to do here was that is actually increase the volume um, of this, this improved geofluid by a bit over 10%. So we're able to get more volume in, but still still reduce, still keep our erosion rate low. So it shows you the, the, the ability or demonstrates the ability to of this iterative approach where you can you can increase volume and still keep your, um, your uh, erosion rates low. So wrapping the geomorphic design side up. Geomorphic design can improve erosion, erosion stability as well as increase landscape volume. Um, the methodology allows options to be tested and also I'd argue that visual amenities enhanced and biodiversity likely to be increased due to the, the, the increased complexity of the landform. Um, but counter to the positives, uh, geomorphic design offers a rehabilitation option. It's a good method. 
it can work, but it may not be suitable in all areas or all sites due to volume or footprint constraints. Other options may need to be viable, and I showed you before that simple linear hill slope with good topsoil that 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 did not erode; it was it was stable. But the method that we've developed here um, is a method that 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 you can use to evaluate various designs and other options can be evaluated within a landscape evolution model framework. So um, moving on, um, now we're gonna move on to a uh, discussion of the case study of the RA range of mine. The range of mine has been um, a main driver of the development of our landscape evolution models because of um, the, 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 the high environmental constraints on the site. So um, we've invested a lot of time at this site and um, um, I'm gonna talk through the history of the models and the modeling here and where we're up to with the models as a, as a case study. So Greg, so, you've, got about, you've got about 10 minutes, Greg. Okay, right, thanks, Matt. Um, so the RA Ranger Mine located um, about three hours drive east of uh, Darwin. Um, located in the monsoonal tropics, around about 1,500 millimetres of rainfall a year. Um, since I've been up there, rain has varied from about 800 millimetres up to 2,600 millimetres. Um, the rainfall energy in that, in that area is up there with some of the highest rainfall energies in the world. So erosion and, and managing erosion is absolutely critical for mining. Highly prospective for uranium and other minerals. Um, DRA um, is the... The range of mine was one of the largest producers of uranium in the world and now in closure phase. The big issue with Ranger is it's high environmental scrutiny due to it being surrounded by um, Kakadu and the Ramsar, list, Ramsar listed wetlands. And the big, the big constraint for the mine is uh, the, the, the legacy issue and particularly the tailings and the requirement that no contaminants were focused on tailings to leave the site for 10,000 years post mining. And that's just a huge, that's a, that's a, that's a big number, a huge undertaking. And one way you can assess landscape designs is using landscape evolution models, which is where we come. The site is a typical, is, is, a, is a mine with normal features in terms of there's nothing, there's nothing unusual about the mine. Um, it has two, two pits, uh, pit one and pit three, uh, tailing storage facility, waste rock dump, mill over here. And um, I'll come back to this um, control landform, research landform a bit later. Mining and processing is now complete. Rehabilitation is underway with, with lease rel relinquishment in January, 2026. So, um, we're, we're flat out at the moment looking at um, design options for this land for, the, for closure landforms. We're going to focus on this red box here, the Corridor Creek landform um, or landscape. Um, it's it's one of the first areas to be to be um, rehabilitated. This is the this is the Corridor Creek landform as it is now. Um, the pits being filled in with tailings. Um, it's going to be capped and reshaped to uh, uh, a design such as this and this landform is one of the first options that we've been provided with. So this is a theoretical design at the moment um, for us to examine and see how this landscape or this catchment is going to behave. We've been fortunate to be involved in a, um, or, or to have available a, a um, trial landform that, that has been constructed on site to, um, to develop parameters. Um, and understandings in terms of rainfall runoff and sediment transport for various various materials, various surface treatment, like different ripping options, and also reveg. And we've been collecting data on this site for the past ten years, which we've used to um, to calibrate our models. So just quickly, seeing time's getting away, and I've probably talked too much already. Um, we've um, we've um, have um, this Corridor Creek uh, landscape, which as I say, been at our focus. And we've run this landscape through the um, 
through both the Siberian and Caesar models with a range of both rainfall and climate scenarios. And what we find is, and this is the landscape at 100 years, what we find is the landscape at 100 years shows gullies that run up the main landform and the gullies start to run up, up, the, uh, up the hill slope to where the tailings are located. Running the model out to 10,000 years, what we see is that the gullies continue to grow, but we see that there's extensive deposition in the, bottom, in the, in the channel base. Um, and at, and at 10,000 years, we have a catchment that, that has extensive channel evolution and a lot of deposition in the base. Overall, what we find is that there's incision of up to 12 metres um, on the hill slope, um, but that's constrained by the extensive deposition that's in the, in the base of the channel. The other issue for this site is, is the sediment that's coming off the site. Um, when we look at when we look at the amount of sediment that's coming off, we need to compare it with a background value. Um, and the dotted lines, the green arrows, are the background levels um, for the area. And what we've found is that it takes about 2,000 years for that design to settle down. And even after 2,000 years, the amount of sediment that's coming out is still bouncing around that, that upper level. So what we've also done is to check the validity of these models, and, a, and it's an issue I'll come to a bit later uh, at the end of the talk. We've run the model out to 10,000 years, and what we, what we see here is the landscape of 10,000 years, and you can see that the landscape has evolved into, a, into what, what you would say would be a, a perfectly reasonable, plausible landform. And what's really interesting is that the model is actually reworking this, this, um, this um, deposited sediment in the base of the channel. So the indications are that the model is doing everything right. Um, there's been a large amount of work done um, on climate variability, um, rainfall variability, and the, uh, the impacts of different materials and different, different surface treatments, which, which is several hours discussion in itself, which I'll leave for, for later talks. But the model outcomes here show that the modeling um, the model, the modeling, all the modeling, whether it be Siberia or Caesar, suggests that the landscape will erode by gully erosion, and that the erosion rates are higher than background. This is a, this is a um, theoretical landform at the moment. Uh, the final landform is still being developed, so this information has gone back um, to, the, to the mining company um, and, and the landscape, um, the, the civil engineers to. to as, as part of a, a, the package of information so that they can now develop strategies that can be to, to, to reduce the erosion and re reduce the gullying on this particular site. So just quickly moving on to data needs. Um, this is something that's, um, that, that um, is a requirement for all these models, um, land, all landscape evolution models and all models in general. Landscape evolution models are not perfect. Um, they provide insights into what may occur. And like all models, they need reliable inputs. That is landscape data and also model parameter data. Big requirement for landscape evolution models is a digital elevation model that represents the landscape. Without correct representation of that landscape, water and sediment will be routed incorrectly and you'll get incorrect erosion rates, incorrect erosion position, incorrect gully. The DEM requires sufficient detail to capture hill slope lengths, curvature, drains and benches. Um, and also, if we are to work out erosion rates from, from comparing uh, one DEM ca captured previously to a later one, high density, high quality data is needed. One of the issues is that all mines now are collecting survey data. And what we've got here is a laser scan. Um, on the right hand side. Laser scan and digital photo photogrammetry are brilliant at capturing uh, landscape surfaces, but they don't do a good job at seeing through vegetation and manual or on ground surveying is, is time consuming. LIDAR is ideal. Um, most mines are capturing LIDAR of their sites now um, as it can measure both vegetation and the ground surface and we can work out erosion rates and, and, and calibrate our models from this data. However, almost all sites that I've been involved with in the last few years are collecting terabytes of, of um, data with little control um, or, or not collecting sufficient points for, for, for erosion monitoring. And, and a lot of the data is unusual, unusable 
for erosion monitoring and, and, and calibration. There's a real need for control points um, and sufficient point density for, for this work. And it's, 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 a, it's a point that's uh, it's an issue that's, that comes up at least a couple of times a week for me at the moment, that there needs to be sufficient points to capture the feature of interest. Here on the right-hand side, we've got a LIDAR capture of, um, of this particular landform and the point cloud there is sufficient to, to capture the shape of the overall landform at two to three points a square metre. But if we're interested in, in measuring and monitoring uh, gullies and even finer scale features such as reels, we need 20 to 30 points a square metre or more. And we also need control, we actually need um, control points at that site so that we can constrain these the accuracy and reliability of our values. Um, the models also need model erosion parameters, all those parameters that I talked about in the, um, in the when I talked about the equation. The models can be run with general parameters. Um, however, the general parameters will only give you a general in indication of behaviour. And many areas in Australia don't have even general parameters. Um, at present, each mine site requires costly and time consuming parameter determination, which can be tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and even if there is uh, site specific data collection, the, the, the data collection, the trials are ad, ad hoc and the information that, that's provided is, 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 is not as good as what it should be. There's a lack of general parameters and knowledge for, 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 for the industry. And there's a real need for a series of national research sites where we can collect long-term data um, to, to support rehabilitation. And these sites would be located potentially in Queensland, the Bowen Basin, the Gulf, Gulf Country, Cape York, the Hunter Central West. And I can go on with, a, with, with ideas as to, as to where um, we, would, we, could, we could collect data that would be specific for, for various industries. And this national data set would provide insights into post-mining behaviour, reduce costs, um, um, and also provide a, a means of best practice data collection and overall reduce cost to the industry, reduce environmental risk and improve environmental rehabilitation outcomes. So, Few slides left to just wrap this up um, in terms of where, where this work is going. Um, for the modeling, there's two big issues. Is the model formulation correct? Well, I would argue that with the testing that we've done and the field data that we've collected, um, the models are by and large okay. We've compared the models to field data, um, erosion rates and gallying, um, We've compared for longer term for, for 100 years and a thousand year type, type of reliability assessments. We've compared models with other models, Siberian model with the Caesar model. Um, we've also compared erosion predictions against other models, such as the RUSLE and WEP. And, and I'm confident that the model maths, the model form, formulations are, are, are okay. Is the model parameters, are the numbers that we put into these models correct? This comes back to the to the, to the national test plots that I mentioned earlier. Yes, I'd say they are at the calibration time scales. However, we're collecting data at one to 10 year type time scales. And I'm confident that the data that we collect is okay out to probably a hundred years. But what happens after that? Um, yeah, really we're 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 inferring. We, we, we've got no, we've got no data. We've got no proof. And the reason why I say that is this is a, this is my, this is a rock um, on the one of the trial plots at the RA Ranger mine. That's my boot. I've just tapped that, and that's fallen apart. And you can see that it rapidly disintegrates. But there's an armour surrounding this particular, particular highly weathered rock. We know that vegetation evolves. We know that vegetation affects erosion. We know that vegetation affects the subsurface. We know that vegetation and weathering and armoring affect erosion. In fact, if we were to calibrate our models on the first couple of years from the data at the range of trial plots, rather than this data that's now out, that's up to six years, we're now out for 10 years, 
we would be out by an order of magnitude in our in our erosion predictions, and we will be we 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 will be an order of magnitude higher. Therefore, what we need is a model that predicts not just the surface and the subsurface, but also what happens below the, the, the subsurface as well. And that brings us to the latest model, which is the SPAN model, state-based soil production and pedogenesis model. Now, this model is very much in the development phase, but the SPAN model, um, based, on, based on knowledge of physical and chemical weathering and soil production functions, can predict the whole soil profile. And initial work that we've done has shown with, with a with a level of qualitative confidence in the range of mine, that the model is able to predict um, not just surface erosion and deposition, but the armoring of the surface and also the evolution of that, that, that profile below the surface that we, we can only infer at the moment as to its and as and as to its unto it, excuse me, unto its evolution. So with the goal being to have a model that that links surface geomorphology and soil processes to predict whole of landscape evolution, where we can take understandings of our pre-mine landscape soil, uh, we can construct, we can, we can cr create our own post-mining landscape soil that we can develop based on our knowledge and our, our models and our predictive ability, ability um, to generate a post-mining landscape that geomorphically integrates with its surrounds. So to wrap this up, um, with technology and planning, we can construct a self-sustaining integrated landscape. I'm confident that we can do that. The process of physically constructing a landscape is relatively quick. However, the process of landform evolution, both the surface and the subsurface is, is, is slow. Landscape evolution models are valuable tools which can help in the design and assessment process and in, uh, reduce environmental risk for the mining industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. We do actually have a good 10 questions here. I think some of them were kind of answered towards the back end of your um, presentation, particularly around um, how does it get how does it model get calibrated around soil types, um, vegetation establishment, how vegetation matures, how does that impact upon that? But what I'd like to do in the interest of time is actually probably utilize these questions as the basis to start our panel session this afternoon. Uh, where I might throw those questions to you and, and any other ones that come along as well. Sure. Com comfortable with that, Greg? Sure, Matt. Yep, all good. Yeah, no, that's correct. No, I really appreciate your time and um, yeah, found that a very informative uh, presentation. And just as a reminder, we have actually um, in the chat, we've actually put a link to um, that paper that we've published on our website around the use of LEMs, which does have quite a, uh, quite a bit of information that Greg put together for us. So thank, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Matt. Good. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our next speakers. Um, let's put this down here. So our next speakers is, is uh, Paul Amity um, and Jason Desmond from, from Glencore. So Paul is the uh, Mining Engineering Manager uh, for Glencore Coal Australia. Paul has worked as an environmental practitioner for approximately 20 years in government um, and consulting and more so in mining roles. Paul is currently responsible for overseeing mine closure and rehabilitation across the New South Wales assets of Glencore Coal um, Assets Australia. And uh, Jason, Jason is a Bachelor of Environmental Science and Management from the University of Newcastle and has worked in a variety of roles throughout his career, currently being the manage, Environment and Community Manager at Mount Allen Glendale Operation. In 2015, he gained his Open Cut Examiner's Practicing Certificate to gain a thorough understanding of mine legislation and practical experience of mining operation. Jason has 30 years experience working in the coal industry in New South Wales and Middle Earthless Mines in the Northern Territory. Jason has been the um, Environment Community Manager at um, uh, Glendale for the past two years, supervising a team of passionate environmental professionals who've worked for Glencore and Tees. He has a passion for mine rehabilitation and a legacy left after mining and is not afraid to complete tasks outside of the mine in order to strive for continuing improvement in the, uh, in the space. Uh, so the, um, Paul and, and Jason's topic for today is the successful rehabilitation and mine closure at Glencore, effective risk, man effective risk management. Thanks, Paul and Jason. Thanks, Matt, and, and thanks for the introduction. I, I'll probably just clarify for everyone, and, and a, a lot of people probably out there wondering when I got promoted to the uh, engineering manager's position. 
I haven't received that paycheck yet, unfortunately. So I'm just a mere enviro uh, for those who know me. Do know me, sorry. Uh, and I, I look after rehab and mind closure. And uh, look, I, I just want to start by saying thank you for the uh, for the opportunity to talk today. I've got to admit, it's it's a very hard act to follow after someone like Greg. I was happy with the the original agenda where I didn't have to follow Greg, but um, super interesting discussion there and and certainly a, a great list today and and it's great that we're we're having these conversations so look I'll probably tone it down a little I, I'm not a, a technical person um, we, we'll give an overview of our our rehab and mind closure system and how we're looking to reduce overall risk I suppose throughout that process and certainly harps back to what I think Matt and, and a few people have said today about doing rehab and doing it once um, I think being a simple person, it's easy to to keep these principles back to basics, I suppose, is what we're trying to do and do it well. So I'll give an overview of our systems, but you don't want to listen to me all day. So I'll actually hand over to Jason, who's one of our, our practitioners on the ground, and, and he'll talk about our rehab report card stuff. But I'll, I'll jump into it. So look, I think a real eye-opener, I don't know whether it's just for me or it's generally the industry is that the objective of our rehab and closure is is achieving relinquishment and it's really interesting and there's a lot of debate around that and and trying to achieve that it's such an interesting subject we've come a long way in a short period of time um, so look achieving relinquishment really does reduce risk that that's the ultimate business risk and reputation risk the legacy that we leave for our for our future generations so Look, to, to try and reduce that risk as we go, and this is a, a very high level risk, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about consequence and uh, that sort of stuff, but um, we, we've developed a system, I suppose, around minimising risk during that process to try and get a good outcome, and we see that as good risk management. So I'll talk about a couple of um, high level standards that we have. Don't worry, I won't talk about them too much. Uh, the focus of the presentation today is really on this, this re rehab report card system that we have in place, get into Jason's example and then uh, a bit of a conclusion around relinquishment. I, I won't trouble the scorers with the, the afternoon tea time either, don't you worry. So just a quick one, uh, we have an overarching uh, set of standards for Glencore uh, across our business and in particular uh, Glencore Coal Assets Australia. One of them being the environment standard, and that, that sort of sits at the high level across all of our environment and community aspects. Two of those, and two very important ones, particularly for me, obviously, are um, a rehab and closure. So that really sets the framework of, of how we manage these aspects. But firstly, the rehab standard, I suppose, and really, you know, rehab is not a define science. There's so many different ways it can be done and there's not one particular way that's right. The aim of our rehab standard is about consistency across our business and I, I hope people see that from the outside that our sites, whilst they do do their own things, it, it's also very much all heading in the same direction. So there's a number of requirements under that rehab standard that Jason might even have a whinge about these later, but we're quite strict in what we ask sites to do and just just generally there we ask the sites to have a rehab strategy and management plan which which most sites do. Uh, we also have an annual rehab and closure plan which really sets out that that rehab program for the next 12 months, the areas that are going to be rehabilitated, KPIs and performance driven KPIs for the whole whole site around achieving that rehab. More recently, we've introduced closure into our annual rehab and closure plan, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But we also have, similar to the guys who spoke before, we have quality control and, and also self-assessments of our rehab towards the end of the year, and our guys review their own performance, and then uh, the corporate guys come in and, and assess that uh, to, to evaluate that performance. Um, from a systems point of view, we also have an annual rehab monitoring procedure whereby it's again about consistency, whereby we might have uh, half a dozen different ecological consultants coming to our sites to do that monitoring, but we want it done in a consistent fashion. So that's then fed in more recently to the rehab report card, which, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail in a second. 
Um, probably the next element, and, and it's not a great uh, discussion for today, but it, it does come in at the end, is around rehab certification. And that whole process is really driving us to towards achieving that certification across our various operations. The closure standard as well um, sort of fits into the rehab or rehab fits into closure as a facet of closure. Really for us, there's been a, a bit of a rethink about this over the last couple of years and that stemmed from wanting to really integrate assessing closure into business planning. Um, we wanted to tie that into the business cycle and get the business to recognise that those risks need to be managed now or identified now so that we can manage them and minimise that uh, and not wait until the end, I suppose. So under the closure standard, each site has to have a closure plan. And you'll see on the right there, there's various phases of the closure plan that they need to have. And that determines what level of, of detail that they have to have. Um, we also have, sorry, we have the annual closure risk assessment which I talked about, which feeds into the, the life of mine review, and we have the closure control group. So just on the rehab report card, I'll, I'll probably hand over to Jason to, to talk about it in detail, um, but this is really a performance uh, scorecard of how our rehab's going. So, Jason, I'll hand over to you, mate. Rightio, thank you, Paul. So for those of you who don't know myself, um, I'm the Environment Community Manager at Mount Owen Glendale Operations. Uh, it comprises of the Mount Owen, Ravensworth East and Glendale Mines, situated between Singleton and Musselbrook and the Hunter Valley. Various parts, uh, sorry, the complex forms part of a suite of mine sites um, owned by Glencore from the Hunter Valley. Uh, various parts of this complex, being MGO, uh, be owned by different stakeholders and operate on different approvals over the last 30 plus years, um, with Glencore only taking ownership of all three areas in the early 2000s. So in terms of development consent approvals, uh, there's two separate consents um, with differing approval conditions. Uh, we've got the Mount Owen development consent, so that's approved to 2037, while the Glendale development consent uh, is approved to June 2024. So at the moment, we're currently seeking an extension of that approval out to 2044 uh, by the Glendale Continued Operations Project. I uh, apologise now, there is a fair bit to talk through with this slide. Um, I was only allowed four slides, so I didn't, didn't have one more than Paul. Uh, but in terms of context for our site, um, mining um, has been open cut mined um, since you know, the 1970s. Um, one of the oldest areas on sites, the Swamp Creek Colliery, um, situated at Ravensworth East, um, with rehabilitation dating back to the 1990s. The rehabilitation for our complex um, is quite unique. Um, we have various ages, various types, uh, your standard 10 degree slope rehab. And then we've also got some natural landform design we've started to incorporate um, over the last couple of years, in particular up at Mount Owen. In terms of post mining land use, um, there's a question around this earlier. Um, for ourselves, again, a very complex complex. Um, the final land use comprises of open grassland for agriculture. Um, we've got our woodland shelter belts or habitat corridors. And then we've also got the establishment of woodland areas, um, generally consistent with central hunter ironbark, spotted gum, grey box forest, um, EEC. So that also includes the intent for ourselves um, to try and establish 518 hectares of this EEC um, rehabilitation type. Uh, on average for site, we rehabilitate about 100 hectares a year across the complex. So over to the, the more sexier side, the rehabilitation monitoring for us. Um, rehabilitation monitoring, so that's completed annually, um, which is what Paul spoke about earlier. So we've got the GCAA rehab monitoring procedure, which falls under that standard or the suite um, of criteria under the overall complex standard. Um, with this, we've, we've got a monitoring procedure um, the rehab monitoring includes your yeah, initial establishment monitoring. Uh, so what does that comprise of? That comprises of your rapid assessment, um, walkover style rehab for rehab less than three years of age. And then it ranges through to your long-term monitoring for older rehabilitation greater than three years old. So 
within those rehabilitation areas, there is transects as well. Um, and they're based on your BAM methodology in terms of your overall um, density of those transects installed throughout. Uh, with, with ourselves, um, a site like us, when you have a look at that image, um, there is a few areas or a few polygons that don't complete the site. Um, the reason being, this is quite a new process. We are starting to integrate um, across a lot of Glencore sites. Basically over a three year period, um, you should have a full rehab report card um, for your site. So going back to, I guess, your rehabilitation polygons, um, those as such for your rehab report card are based on aggregated results. So what do I mean by aggregated? Um, rehabilitation areas are completed annually, um, like most sites do. They create a defined polygon as such. Um, your aggregated results are then determined via um, adjoining rehabilitation polygons. You have various years um, with hopefully similar time range, similar seed mix, and then also going back again to your final land use criteria. Uh, monitoring on site, you know, why do we do it as such? Um, it's completed to ensure you know, we meet the requirements of your mining operations plan and rehab strategy. Uh, monitoring for us um, has been completed you know, by various techniques, just like a lot of mine sites um, situated in Hunter Valley, New South Wales and elsewhere, um, various techniques. Um, over the last several years uh, with ourselves having you know, more of a hybrid style of rehab report card, um, which we've used mainly in the last four years. So between 2017 and 2020, um, ahead of this rehab report card implementation. So I guess this is the point where I put my hand up and take a bit of credit for work done prior to myself um, coming onto site. So take a bit of credit in terms of trying to really drive that rehabilitation monitoring process. Um, as you can see from the, fl the flow process in the slide, um, the annual monitoring is a very dynamic process. Not only provides a simplistic overview, overview of the rehabilitation um, via the four categories in the prior slide that Paul had, um, it also aims to drive continuous improvement, not only at our site, but across all Glencore sites. So how do we end up with the rehab report card output? So the first step you see there on the left-hand side, desktop studies. Um, with these, um, based on you know, my experience over the last several years, these are now more and more extensive than ever um, due to the benefit of technology. I'll definitely be honest, I'm, um, I'm not the most tech savvy person out there, um, but to put it in really simple terms, yeah, desktop studies now, essentially desktop field monitoring before your field monitoring actually occurs. So enormous benefit to whoever's selected as um, your ecologist or you know, person out there doing the monitoring as such. I guess in regards to this step, um, it really highlights those focus areas to the person completing the field work, um, such as you know, slope, erosion, bare patches. And then that can, I guess, fine tune or make that more targeted across an overall um, rehabilitation polygon. Uh, the other things um, it can identify with your desktop studies are things such as soil sampling require. Um, it may even initially flag you know, your rework element as part of that as part of that rehab report card. And what I mean by that, um, you may be going back now incorporating this rehab report card on older areas, and then you see things straight away such as slope conformance not being met. So risk rework identified straight away. Um, a key component here, probably touching a bit on what Greg was talking about earlier. Um, it's more and more important um, for ourselves to have really thorough rehab data and metadata as well behind our GIS. The other key aspects um, are in terms of any you can provide in terms of your most current or highest resolution imagery, LIDAR, you know, definition of your LIDAR, etc. The other thing, um, you definitely need to make sure your correct final land use layer is provided. Otherwise, you may get some unfavorable results. Uh, in terms of that, don't laugh. It is quite easy to have um, a final land use layer. You overlay that, provide it to the person doing your monitoring. But it has changed over time due to various project modifications um, over the time of you know, year approval. 
Uh, the second step, so doing the work, the field monitoring. Uh, this is very, again, very extensive within your rehabilitation polygon uh, for your monitoring year. The technology improvements I just spoke about in step one, um, they're definitely yeah, ensuring the likelihood of missing key rehabilitation issues is extremely low um, compared to years gone by. The walkover inspection or rapid assessment that is completed, um, because a lot of people will say, how do you do that monitoring, I guess, um, for us in your young rehab, one to three years of age, um, it's just a walkthrough, quite rapid assessment, um, just to provide a really high level assessment of the rehab condition across that block you're monitoring. Um, and going back to ground truthing, you know, the findings of your desktop assessments. Uh, touching on your long-term monitoring, so this is monitoring um, greater, than, greater than that three-year period, so four years onwards. Um, that's going to your plot transect-based monitoring. So there's multiple transects throughout a rehab polygon um, that's collecting you know, your more detailed scientific data um, and picking up trends such as uh, vegetation, community establishment, development, um, and self-sustainability. Uh, step three, data management. So evaluation of the walkover results. Um, there's several rehabilitation transects, um, as I said, throughout each polygon. And then that gives you an overall polygon value. Um, so it's a very holistic approach with the key issues identified. Uh, step four, the rehabilitation performance or the rehab report card output generated, um, which is what Paul's pretty keen about talking about earlier. Um, the outputs that come out of this um, are a map and associated tables, which class your rehabilitation blocks on site. And it's very simple, keeping things simple, you know, trying to be simple people, simple processes. Um, it'll spit out that data um, into a traffic-like style of, of system, which is very easy to interpret. So I guess internally for ourselves, this quite clearly shows um, a consistent approach in terms of the rehab standard. You know, we're setting uh, amongst sites in Glencore. And the other thing it does save is your senior company representatives um, reading through your long ecological reports, um, as Paul mentioned earlier. Mind you, I don't mind reading through those reports still. Um, <laughs> I guess this, the, the, key, the key message there is this report card very much simplifies the, um, the rehabilitation monitoring process. Uh, step five, rehabilitation planning. So report card results don't lie. Um, that's the key thing. The results generate a focus on the controls um, to identify the risks. We keep talking today about risk management, controls, being proactive. Um, the results out of this generate your focus on your controls, the risks identified, and then also then you can seek improvements required, um, which are presented internally to drive subsequent years, you know, rehabilitation planning, uh, such as budget requirements in order to complete the works. Uh, the one, one key driver out of this process is it proactively drives work being completed during the operational phase rather than closure. Uh, one thing people may ask with those blocks in the image, why don't we do monitoring on all rehab blocks across all years? There just is minimal value monitoring older sites for the sake of monitoring. Uh, in terms of a practical implementation on site, so everyone's probably thinking what the hell is this rehab report card all about? Um, a lot of the time we tend to provide examples of excellent rehab in these forums. However, you know, an example of rehabilitation monitoring process uh, for our 2020 rehab monitoring. Uh, the program identified an area, which you can see on the screen, um, that was several years old. Um, the results determined the score of the area wasn't in alignment with previous years. The 2020 scorecard for us um, showed the area narrowly scraped into your maintenance category. Um, so just above rework, why? Um, the field work observations, um, look at your overall rehab score. However, there were several transects that fell within the rework category within that polygon. What did this trigger? Um, so we didn't just park the 2020 monitoring on a shelf collecting dust. Um, yeah, we essentially used that data and it triggered ourselves to complete more detailed you know, investigation or assessments um, via the use of a drone coupled with a thermal camera here. Um, and that highlighted you know, some warmer areas um, within the rehab and triggered rework um, in line with our mop tarp. 
key thing out of this is um, we identified such risk during the operational phase. So not at the end of the mine life, but during the operational phase, um, we've reacted, completed maintenance within the area um, and implemented proactive measures, you know, such as change to mining practices, like a simple thing like a procedure um, in order to continue progressive rehabilitation towards you know, relinquishment. Uh, as discussed earlier, um, the rehab report cards, um, the outputs will now feed into our internal annual rehabilitation and closure plan, which Paul touched on. Um, the key thing out of this plan for myself sitting on a site level, um, it really drives you know, your budget requirements for the next year or several years. Uh, the results of the rehab report card, they are an internal tool um, and they're just one component in this annual rehab um, and closure plan process. So for ourselves, um, the annual rehab and closure plan for site can also include things um, such as risks or improvements identified you know, via industry workshops, so Glencore, non-Glencore, um, inputs from other sites, uh, ecologists, rehab practitioners, um, our annual life of mine planning process, which we do every year, the annual closure risk assessment process, um, so like Paul was mentioning earlier, the closure component has really now started to, you know, drive the outcomes from this, this actual internal report. Um, and also internal um, feedback via the GCA inspections that happen every year. So if we're not doing what we say we're doing, so when Paul comes out with his big stick and pretty much, you know, <laughs> wax, wax it on people like myself to um, make sure we're doing, doing what we say we're going to do. Um, the other thing, sorry with that, uh, and also with that, that report, um, the annual rehab closure plan, that, um, that actually takes into account feedback, you know, via external feedback, um, such as things from the more recent target assessment programs, which have been touched on earlier. Um, overall, I guess, the key thing out of this plan, um, I'm a very impatient person. I need to remind myself that things don't happen overnight, um, but a plan's definitely in place, and it's saying that fulfills um, confidence, I guess, in people within Glencore um, above myself. Uh, a few examples. So going back to the rare report card at, at MGO, um, it's very much outcomes driven. So how do we know it works? Um, based on ourselves having the aggregated rehabilitation polygons over the last several years, um, it was the best pilot site for the rare report card process you know, to be rolled out. Um, to other New South Wales Glencore sites in 2021. What's a key thing we do need to ensure? Uh, consistency. Consistency in the monitoring undertaken, um, the scores generated. How's that done? Uh, via a specific rehab report card procedure. You know, so any site personnel, ecologist, um, rehabilitation practitioner, they can really use that um, to input standardised data. So, and also a common report card um, worksheet as such has been provided um, and used consistency, uh, consistently across all New South Wales Glencore sites. Uh, with these images here, in terms of the practical um, implementation, so the top image um, is an example of your maintenance output. So this is an older overburden dump. Um, it's proven to be safe, stable, um, however, it's very much pasture dominated, um, requiring maintenance activities to ensure alignment with the final land use. So this is then required um, ourselves to go back in, do quite a bit of um, extensive weed and your dominant pasture control um, prior to infill seeding again, which is occurring now. So 2021, um, just keeping in mind, the mine's in operational phase well ahead of the end of the approved mining, which is approved out of 2037. Gents, you've got about two minutes. Yeah, it won't be long. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the bottom image here, that's an example of your acceptable output. Um, this older woodland area, this was completed back between 2007 and 2012. Um, it's deemed to meet the completion criteria in line with your rehab report card. Um, as such, it's now driving ourselves to try and compile um, supportive evidence, um, such as a spotted tail problem little trial trial cam in the corner there um, for an approximate 80 day area, hopefully be certified. 
the key message, like Paul said earlier, um, or the key driver, I guess, behind this whole rehab report card process um, is for all Glencore sites uh, to progress towards meet and rehab objectives, um, resulting in progressive certification during the mine life um, rather than waiting until mine closure. Thanks, Jason. And, and look, guys, and thanks, Matt. I'll, I'll quickly wrap this up. As I said at the beginning, achieving re relinquishment is really that, that ultimate prize, as I've said there, and, and we're looking to, to do that and, and reduce that risk, um, not just at the end, but during our operations. And it's a good segue from Jason into towards the rehab certification. We've been fortunate enough to have two areas signed off last year. We're also looking at more opportunities this year, and Jason's side is one of those opportunities. That rehab report card has really been instrumental in us identifying simple people, identifying opportunities for those areas to be certified rather than read through wads of ecological reports, which are super interesting. Uh, no offence to anyone. Um, a quick discussion point, and this will most likely come up in the in the panel discussion as well as well around residual risk. Um, obviously, that there, there has to be maintenance beyond relinquishment, and and all of our landforms, our rehab slopes will require maintenance at some point. And there's probably a lot of people having a bit of laugh when I use that word maintenance, but I'll, I'll continue to harp on that. Um, Look, we really aim to meet that, that approved closure criteria and what our approved final outcome is. But then I'm going to throw it out there that we want to look to then transfer those general land maintenance requirements onto a future landholder for whatever future industry may, may follow mining. Mining's only a temporary land use, and I think there's a whole other topic here of future land use and how we transition into something else. So um no doubt some some discussion about that later so um and i've covered that last point there so i'll i'll shut it off matt if that's all right yeah no problem and listen i think that is a really good topic to have a bit of a chat at our panel session this afternoon um just quickly noting that we've got um just 10 minutes to the break um just very quickly how is data managed and used in decision making and I guess, what's the lock, the uptake from the general managers and production managers? Um, have they have they generally uptaken or is it a KPI driven process? Oh, Jace, I, I might throw that one to you. I, I, I think it's been in place now for a number of years and, it, and it, there's no denying it's driven performance, but it's, um, I think I'm back on screen now. Um, it's now become part of our culture, but uh, rather than me just spruik that from the corporate level, Jason, I'd ask you to give your insight. Yeah, I, I agree there, Paul. So in terms of ourselves, um, it's quite clear the outputs um, of the data, you know, via your monitoring um, does really spell out the reasons why we are doing what we're doing. Um, there probably is... You know, a few, few older heads in mining that think, you know, what we did do many years ago is sufficient and we shouldn't have to go back into areas and they probably don't quite understand the reasoning, which we then have to, um, I guess, educate them on the process um, in terms of meeting those final post land use requirements. But I know for ourselves where I went back on about it with data, um, it is quite critical on our site. So in terms of quality control, like Eric is via our survey team. Um, so any sort of ingoing, outgoing, there's one stream there for quality control. Um, and it's also maintained very frequently. So we've actually got a consultant that assists ourselves maintaining that um, at the end of the month. So month, monthly basis, checking what we're doing and making sure that it is um, you know, validated, remaining current um, and adequate for site. Oh, very good. So thank you very much, gents, um, for this afternoon. We are going to try to wrap this um, overall conference up at four o'clock. So um, we're just going to have a quick um, eight-minute break now to um, to three o'clock, and we're back here. I'll be finishing or wrapping up on what's what's reasonably practicable, and then we'll have the panel session after that. So um, thanks, Jason and Paul, uh, for, the, for that talk. Cheers, mate. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so uh, reasonably practicable. So this is a fairly new concept um, in terms of the rehab space, while it's been around in the mine safety space for quite some time and embedded within the, the mine safety legislation. This is something that we've, we've brought in as part of the regulation. And if you go through the reg, essentially it's these three key areas um, where reasonably practical comes in. So clause 4.1, one, 
The holder of a mining lease must take all reasonable measures to prevent, or if that is not reasonably practicable, to minimise harm to the environment caused by activities under the mining lease. Clause 5, the holder of a mining lease must rehabilitate land and water in the mining area that is disturbed by activities under the mining lease as soon as reasonably practicable after the disturbance occurs. And Clause 4, the, uh, clause 6-4, the, the holder of a mining lease must identify and record any reasonable foreseeable hazard that presents a risk to the holder's ability uh, to comply with subclause 1, which is the, the holder of a mining lease must ensure that rehabilitation of the mining area achieves the final land use for the mining area. So I, I will say up front, I don't believe that this is going to be a dramatic change um, to a lot of sites where they're really good at showing that spatially on the ground rehabilitation is up and behind the active disturbance area. Um, I think where you'll see the majority of, of change um, or, or focus areas is really ensuring that rehabilitation progresses through the phases um, and that key knowledge gaps as well to achieving final land uses are actively sought um, to actually address those, those knowledge gaps. What are the key objectives um, um, of the reg? So here is, is rehabilitation will need to be undertaken progressively through the operation. Leaseholders will need to demonstrate um, that rehab is progressing through each of the phases and we define that within the regulation. Leaseholders will need to, be, to demonstrate that they are actively managing land under rehabilitation to ensure that the final land use for the mining area is achieved. So that's through your monitoring programs. I'll give some um, examples of that a little bit later. And these holders are actively addressing knowledge gaps to achieving the final land use. Now we do actually have some, some new guidance on that. Um, and there's a link to that there and we'll put that link in the chat. Uh, but again, just encouraging you to continue to look at our, our website because um, as, as we're heading towards um, the end of the transition period, there'll be a lot more information that goes up on the website. But I will be going through that today. So what is reasonably practicable? Um, in short, courts have found that the term reasonably practicable must be determined objectively. A leaseholder must do what is expected of a reasonable person in the leaseholder's position. Cost is generally not considered to be a relevant matter when determining what is reasonably practicable. Um, However, having said that, unless the cost is grossly dis disproportionate to achieving the intended outcome. So the key elements in determining what is reasonably practicable. So the key thing is what was known or ought to have been known by the leaseholder at the time, what was reasonably foreseeable to the leaseholder at the particular time, what was possible in the circumstances, that is, what could be done, and whether it was reasonable in the circumstances to do all that was possible. So what is reasonably practical can change over time. Um, and as we start to see new technology and strategies for, for, for rehabilitation evolve, um, I think reasonably practicable um, and what's expected of that will also continue to evolve. And this is where we will be publishing on our website re more, more and more rehabilitation information releases. The key uh, fundamental part of our role is where we identify good practices is actually publish that so we can get some broader uptake across the industry. And again, a, a key objective of today. So when we're looking at preventing or minimizing harm to the environment, so this obligation under the reg is consistent with the objects of the Mining Act. Uh, protection of the environment is also covered by other legislation such as Environmental Planning and Assessment Act and the, and the PL and EL Act. Now, as I said, as, as part of the um, uh, consultation on, on, the, on the rehab reforms, um, the regulator will be looking to take a, a whole government approach to this. So in terms of if there's an incident that occurs on site, it's really looking at what tool exists, what is the best regular tool across government to utilise to actually address that issue. And I think we're getting a lot better than over, the, over the previous years. But also this condition also provides the basis for issuing of Section 240 directions, which are aimed at preventing and or minimising harm to the environment. <clears throat> so in fulfilling this obligation, leaseholders should consider the nature of harm or potential harm, um, as per the meaning under the PLEO Act, the environment in which the mining activities and rehabilitation are being undertaken, current leading practice and state of technical knowledge, and the likelihood of possible measures being successful to prevent or minimise harm. So preventing or minimising harm to the environment means that the greater the risk of harm, the greater the need for effective risk controls to be implemented to, to manage the risk. Now being public knowledge, I guess a great example of that was around the tailings slip um, or the tailings failure at Cadia. 
um, to protect the environment there, they had to construct quite a significant bund um, in case they had further failure. So that was that was certainly proportional to, to the risk associated with that tailings there. If it is not reasonably practical to prevent the harm, the leaseholder must minimise the harm by reducing the likelihood and the consequence using a range of risk control measures. So determining compliance with this condition takes into consideration impacts to the environment as approved under the development consent or permitted under environment protection license. So it is acknowledged that um, under an environment protection license, you will have certain pollution limits that, that you're allowed um, uh, or that you must be within and similar within the development consent. So determining compliance needs to take that into consideration as well. Now, what are examples of what is reasonably practicable? Now, I'll just cross your fingers and toes here while I navigate my way around here. Okay, so this is the fact sheet that's on our website. And I've broadly taken you through this first part of it here. But in the back end of this um, fact sheet, we've actually delivered some um, examples. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, um, but again, we will we'll continue to update this as, as we get further examples. But if you look at um, must take all reasonable measures to prevent, or that is not reasonably practical, to minimise harm to the environment, you look at some of the, the specific examples of scenarios that can occur in mine sites, such as tailings dam failures, landform failure, including landslips and erosion, uh, groundwater discharges from underground workings, surface water discharges off site, contamination. Examples of reasonably practical measures to prevent harm to the environment by mining activities relating to these type of scenarios include, but are not limited to the following. So an environmental risk assessment that is relevant to the mining operation has been undertaken using suitably qualified and experienced personnel. Suitable controls to prevent environmental harm have been implemented based on the outcomes of environmental risk assessment. Specific monitoring programs have been implemented to establish the effectiveness of environmental controls. And potential impacts on the environment are monitored and assessed. And trigger action response plans have been initiated based on the results of the relevant monitoring programs. So that's on the prevention. In terms of where, um, where an incident has occurred, so it would be reasonably practicable to minimize the harm caused by mining activities for these type of scenarios by implementing incident response management plans as soon as reasonably practicable, which could include as relevant the following actions as a minimum. So you have notification, ongoing communication to landholders potentially affected by actual or potential offsite impacts to ensure that measures are rapidly implemented to avoid or minimize harm. An example of there is potentially the notification of downstream users. Um, if there was a discharge or something in, into a river system is to, is to notify them in advance so they can actually remove their pumps so they're not, not contaminating their land with that, that water. The implementation of specific mitigation measures such as containment structures and all materials to minimize the migration of actual or potential environmental harm and then the implementation of remedial measures to rectify potential impacts. And in the event of significant incidents, um, it would also be considered reasonably practical to implement uh, an incident management team involving suitably qualified um, and experienced personnel to coordinate uh, the development and implementation of measures to minimize harm to the environment. So certainly keeping a record of um, measures that you've adopted in that space would um, certainly be due diligence to, to demonstrate in terms of how you're fulfilling that obligation. Just go back to where was before. In terms of uh, rehabilitate as soon as reasonably practicable. So once mining operations um, in a particular area of the mine have been completed, the area must be rehabilitated to achieve approved rehabilitation outcomes in a timely manner. So we would we do recognise that for some operations, such as underground operations, where their surface disturbance is really limited to active pit top areas, we do recognise, for example, that. Um, they're active right up until the time of closure um, and sometimes similar with, with metalliferous mines. But where, where um, areas have been completed, then our expectation is, is you actually start that, that rehabilitation process. A leaseholder must demonstrate that it is fulfilling obligations throughout the following implementation phases. So the decommissioning, landform establishment, uh, growth mean and development, ecosystem and land use establishment, and ecosystem and land use development. So you can see there's a greater emphasis to make sure that we're, we're training right through to close out. 
Now, rehabilitation is not limited to the on the ground physical works, but may include planning and management activities that are essential to achieving sustainable rehabilitation outcomes. So you heard Andrew Hutton earlier today about the um, closure planning process. Um, that is our expectation, that as you're actually leading the closure uh, to demonstrate progressive rehabilitation to fulfill this obligation, you really now need to start to engage with those type of activities so that when you get to closure, there's not this lag in terms of the commencement of closure works, which is still trying to um, address all of these knowledge gaps. A not exhaustive list of relevant matters, matter, matters to be considered is whether the land is being used for mining operations or operating infrastructure, the completion of mining operations in that area, the size and complexity of the area, the suitability of weather and environmental conditions for rehabilitating the land and water, the resources required to achieve approved rehabilitation outcomes, and reasonably foreseeable hazards to achieving the rehabilitation of the mining area. The rehabilitation process continues until the approved rehabilitation outcomes are met. So this is something that we really want to stress uh, to industry that um, once you see the area, that's not it. You really need to make sure that you're actually looking at that area, monitoring it, um, utilising the results of that monitoring to actively manage that to its closeout phase. And I think Glencore showed a, a really good process that they've implemented um, to have oversight of that, that active rehab area. As such, the implementation of corrective measures to address issues identified for monitoring data is another relevant matter in consideration of the timeliness of rehabilitation. Costs or the availability of resources or equipment alone are not relevant factors for delaying rehabilitation. So examples of how to comply, um, leaseholders must plan rehabilitation disturbed areas as part of the mine's life cycle and ensure that equipment and resources have been appropriately allocated um, to undertake this task. Uh, share my screen again. Now, some further examples that we've provided in terms of rehabilitating as soon as reasonably practicable. So, we're looking at the, the decommissioning, landform establishment, and growth and development phases. So, where mining activities have ceased, it would be considered to be reasonably practicable to commence rehab within the decommissioning and landform establishment or growth and development phases, depending on the type of mining domain. However, it may not be reasonably practical to commence the rehab of disturbed land where the land is subject to further mining operations. Um, for example, the activities can be done under a valid development consent. So examples may include, but are not limited to the following. Unshaped overburn dumps where future emplacement material is scheduled under the approved mine plan. So this is where there's a bit of confusion about temporary rebed, temporary revenge versus permanent rehabilitation. So in this, in this instance, um, I know the EPA are very strong about the control of um, uh, exposed land dust. Um, so this is where you'd be actually um, making sure that you're, you're temporarily stabilising those areas. But, but we do not view that as, um, as, as rehabilitation. Surface infrastructure such as the washery, machinery, material storage area that continue to be utilised as part of the underground mining operation. It may not be considered to be commencing rehabilitation as soon as it's reasonably practicable, where rehabilitation is delayed on the grounds of future operations that are not, not subject to available development consent um, or application process. So um, I know I've had conversations with various operators in the past about, well, what are you doing with that facility over there? And I said, oh, we've got that as part of our future plans. But if you can't demonstrate that you've actually got an active application or you've actually in discussion with the appropriate um, authority or planning authority about the use of that area, um, then that's where we'd be looking to push you towards more of the um, progressive rehab. In terms of the ecosystem and land use establishment phase, so progressive rehab may be impacted by climatic or seasonal conditions. It may not be reasonably practicable to rehabilitate a certain land because of extreme heat, bushfires or drought during summer months, uh, prolonged rainfall or storms during weather months. However, it would be considered to be re rehabilitating as soon as reasonably practicable when actions were undertaken to mitigate the effect of the climatic or seasonal conditions, including the following. So ensuring that all rehab phases in the um, up to the ecosystem establishment phase had been um, completed. So for example, um, you may delay your seeding from December through to March because you know you're going through a very hot, uh, dry period. Um, but you've done everything up until that point in time and you can actively see how you reschedule those activities to, to, recur, to occur in March. 
um, where revegetation has been delayed, targeting the next day in consideration of climate, the forecast climatic conditions. Uh, where prolonged unseasonal conditions such as drought are expected, um, another, another thing here would be preceding the revegetation, such as seeding, with a contingency to undertake supplementary seeding and planting where vegetation does not establish following the onset of more favourable seasonal conditions. So we have seen sites where one particular site has delayed, um, where another site has continued on through those conditions with seeding, but noting, noting native seeds, for example, just sit there sometimes until the conditions are right. Um, and, and up comes that, that vegetation when those, those seasons are, are, are okay. So sometimes it comes down to the methodology using as well. Um, certainly potentially avoiding tube stock, for example, in those type of scenarios and going to receding would be a better way to do it. So these are, these are factors you need to think about. Um, a delay in progressive rehab may also occur as a result of the failure to establish the target species associated with the rehab outcome such as pasture vegetation, establishing an area proven to be returned to a native ecosystem. As such, a matter that would need to be considered in determining whether rehabilitation has commenced as soon as reasonably practical is whether the vegetation species mix specified in the approved rehab outcome was actually utilised as part of the program. So that's something that we'll be looking for as part of our target assessment programs. In terms of the ecosystem and land use sustainability phase, the achievement of approved rehab outcomes may be, may be delayed due to poor performance of areas where rehab has commenced. So examples of those potential risks would outline in our, our risk, risk guideline. Um, but it would be considered to be rehabbing as soon as reasonably practical if actions were undertaken to enhance rehabilitation performance and facilitate achievement of rehab outcomes in a timely manner. So that would be implementing an inspection program um, to identify actual the potential actual or emerging issues that have the potential to delay revegetation establishment. And I think we just saw a really good example of that in terms of those annual walkover inspections and that report card process. Uh, implementing rehabilitation monitoring programs to establish whether rehab performance is on trajectory uh, towards meeting approved rehab outcomes. And this is where you might need to get specialist advice, uh, particularly where you're going back to complex native ecosystems. Um, implementing corrective measures uh, to address issues identified through rehabilitation inspection programs. But in terms of general considerations, in some instances, there may be knowledge gaps uh, that exist that may delay commencement of rehabilitation. So our expectation is that you actually got programs in place to address those knowledge gaps well in advance of, of closure. So just wrapping up uh, presentation now. Again, I think this is a really good example in the ecosystem and land use development phase. We've seen really good case studies where um, some, some mines are actually actively grazing these areas, um, which demonstrates that land can be utilised for that intended purpose. But the actual use of grazing itself um, is really good for that uh, agricultural ecosystem as well. So we would be challenging companies really to, to, to look at uh, adopting this type of practice. Uh, and this is an interesting one, and for the engineers on the line, they might get a little bit shirty with me here, but um, essentially I see these surface storage areas. Um, I, I kind of refer them to as engineering handbags. The bigger the, bigger the storage area, uh, the more crap you're going to put on them. So um, really challenging the engineers to actually have a look at you know, what you actually need for your future operations versus what can be actually tidied up and, and removed your scrap. And, and, and keeping those areas and rationalising them through that operational phase. In terms of what is a reasonably foreseeable hazard, um, a reasonably foreseeable hazard is any hazard that is a reasonable person in the same situation is aware of or ought to be reasonably aware of. Determining whether a hazard is reasonably foreseeable needs to be considered objectively. And examples of how to comply here is a, re a rehabilitation risk assessment has been conducted and is relevant to the mining operation. Monitoring programs are in place to establish the effectiveness of rehab controls, as well as the performance of rehab. This may include routine inspections, as well as monitoring the performance indices, nominated by the rehab completion criteria. Quality assurance programs are in place, and that was a really good example from uh, Mount Pleasant this morning, in terms of the type of systems that we'll be looking for industry to, to implement, based on the site, site risk and the complexity of their landscapes. And the results of monitoring and quality assurance programs are recorded. Another really good example of a reasonably foreseeable hazard is the occurrence of Cassius salina in the Hunter Valley. Um, you know, that has 
that is a real potential hazard without controls that could affect the timeliness when you achieve your final land use. So that is, that is an example for the hunter. The regulator's approach to compliance, which is my last slide here, is that um, assessment of compliance against condition will consider, we'll be looking at the annual rehab report and forward program, um, looking at rehabilitation key performance indices that are generated through the mine rehab portal. So looking at annual disturbance to rehab ratio. So these are all indications of, of, of how sites are progressively rehabilitating. And it'll be also a fundamental uh, component or assessment criteria as part of our plan inspection and, and target assessment programs. But again, um, trying to ensure consistency across all of our inspectors here, our compliance enforcement process is that we have a lot of internal governance processes with our um, uh, rehabilitation securities panel and other panels where we discuss a lot of these issues that come up so we can actually collectively understand about how we, how we as a regulator will address these issues. We will be looking to, to utilise Section 240 provisions um, to direct leaseholders to undertake specific actions where we feel that um, um, rehab is not progressing uh, to where it should be. And alleged non-compliances um, are generally managed through the regulator standard investigation processes. So that's a, a quick overview of the um, reasonable practical um, guideline. Um, expect potentially some more questions to come through through the panel session. So without further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen. And um, if we can invite all panelists um, back in um, for our session. Okay, so welcome back everybody. Um, I'm gonna start with Greg. Greg's, Greg's back on back deck. You just need to turn your camera on, Greg. Just trying to get my camera going. Yeah, yeah no problem. There we go. So we do have a, a few questions for you throughout the day. So uh, this question was from Michael Franken. So how do you parameterize Siberia if you don't use simulated rain to determine the critical shears for real and intra-real erosion and WEP? Yeah, good question, Michael. Um, the parameterization, well, we have a database. The first, the first fallback position would be the database of parameters. There is a, there is a basic level of parameterization for all models. Um, there is a database available within the, the um, Siberia program that uh, allows you a first pass yet crude assessment. The second, the second part of the answer is for the Siberia model. Um, if you what, you, what you require to run that model is a particle size and a rainfall. And the parameters that you need to then adjust are if you don't have hydrology data, um, you need you, you you can then just do a risk assessment by adjusting manning end value and accruent number, and you will get a range of outputs. Um, one of the one of the issues with these models is you do need field data for a, for an accurate output, a reliable output. The more field data you've got, the more reliable output you you will get. Other ways to calibrate these models um, are rainfall simulators and flumes where we get materials off site and we, 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 we place these materials in a flume. Um, we can generate quite good um, calibration parameters using flume results. In fact, the work that I showed um, with that site A and site B in the Bowen Basin, those gullies, those parameters were generated from, from, from flume. Um, Flume parameterization, um, and I've done quite a lot of other unpublished work using flumes to calibrate both Siberia and Caesar. Um, the answer is the more parameters, the more field data you've got, the more accurate and, and all reliable your predictions are going to be. Greg, I think um, as a regulator, we've we've recommended to a number of sites um, potentially looking at soil erosion monitoring. Um, now that could be quite complex or it could be quite basic, but um, yes, yes. how valuable do you think that would be um, to do across the industry? Um, and that was, uh, yeah, really good question. Um, and that was the point of my, um, that, that small section I did on, on, on um, surveying. Um, you're flying, you're flying your site or you're collecting survey data. Um, it's not a, it's not a, a huge effort to, to refine that data collection such that you're getting much, much higher detail, much, much, much better quality data. So you can you can actually use 
your DEMs to, to demonstrate the fact that, that, that you aren't getting any erosion. You, you have defensible data that your site is, is, is stable, um, which, would, which, which scientifically stands up. The other end of the spectrum is that you do have gullies. They are moving, they are eroding. Um, you can use that data to monitor your gullies. You can work out your erosion rates. And also from that data, you can calibrate an erosion model, a landscape evolution model to make some predictions. And then from those calibrated parameters, you can then redesign your landscape so that you're not gonna, you're not gonna get data. So the survey data is, is absolutely critical. Um, and I was involved in a project Talking, talking about a project last week um, where there's terabytes of data and while it's fantastic from a, from a vegetation monitoring point of view, um, the LIDAR data is, is just, just uh, too inaccurate to use from, a, from an erosion monitoring point of view. So we've had to, we've had to spend more time and more money to, to, to reproduce data that, that, um, should, that, that we should already have. Very good. And Greg, I'm, I'm, I'm picking you at the moment, but I'm also going to pick on Chris Rudens here as well, just to give the regulators perspective on this question. Um, this is a question from Damien Ryber. Um, so hi, Greg. Do you, do you think there's any value in running LEM on older, constructed and vegetated landforms? Or does its um, strength lie in being performed at the landform design phase to inform, verify the stability of the landform design? I'll start with yeah. you, Greg. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, good question. Um, look, if you've got a landform that's been stable for 10 years, you've got a good vegetation cover, there's no, no indication of erosion, um, there's, 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 there's minimal reeling, minimal gullying, all post mining landscapes are going to show some form of erosion. Um, but if, if, if the erosion is minimal, you've got a good vegetation cover, there's no evidence of, of vegetation dieback. Um, I would think that that it, that it's that, that that landscape is okay. Do you do you need to to burn tens of thousands of dollars on on calibrating a model and running a model um, if you if your landscape trajectory is 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 showing a positive trajectory? I would think not. Chris, you, you want to give some intel on that, and and I'll get you to kill two birds with one stone here. So um, there's another so a question from Matthew Harding: Is there a standard modelling time period acceptable to the regulator? Um, so, so to answer the first question, um, I, I believe I did cover that in my presentation that, that there, there is, I think there is an advantage in running these types of models or running an assessment over older landforms. And I, I agree with Greg with what he's saying. If, if your landform is showing signs of being stable and there's no indication there's an issue, well, there's probably not a lot of benefit in doing that. Um, but what we are finding and what we would be made aware of is that by running these models over an older landform, it helps you to identify areas that might be a, of a higher risk. And the way we've described it to some minds is rather than chase your tail, rather than constantly repair a, a damage in a, an erosion structure or a, or a blowout in a contour bank, why don't you be, why don't you become proactive in understanding where those high risk areas are in the works you can do during this, you know, the earlier phase rather than waiting for it to fail and repair it later on. So it's like more of a proactive approach to those sorts of things. Um, the other advantage about running a, an LEM or it could even be a static model or something else is that it gives more confidence to the regulator that the landform that you, that's actually being constructed is going to be stable in the long term. It gives us more confidence that when you come to us and you ask for a relinquishment, um, the more evidence that you can provide at that point in time to show us that not only is your landform stable up until the period that you, you know, you, it's, it's been in place, but you've even done further work to demonstrate that it will remain stable into the future, especially if it is a large, more complex landscape or one that might be prone to, um, you know, those high risks that I described before, that will give us more confidence in being able to sign off on relinquishment at that stage as well. Um, with regards to um, standard timeframes, I, I know that when we've issued directions for mines to undertake a landform evolution model, we've used standard timeframes of a 10, 10, 100 and 1,000 years. Um, 
not to say that we're going to say it, you know, I, we want to see a, you know, it's a, a demonstration of your landscape being completely stable at a thousand years. Once again, come back, comes back to the point that I said before, we expect all landforms to erode, natural landforms erode. But we just want to have an understanding as to as you run that model as to what will happen and where those potential high risks will be. And I think once you get those extended time frames, it gives you a better understanding of what's going to happen. Um, the other thing I did raise when I was when I gave my presentation was tailings facilities. And once again, I think tailings facilities are a special domain. Um, you know, we, when we talk about all landforms eroding, um, when you have erosion on a on a, on a tailings facility with minimal capping, say it's one or two metres, we, we can't afford, uh, we, we don't want to see that capping material depleted to a point that the tailings, um, the tailings is exposed in a, in a short time frame. We, we, we look at extended time frames. Um, NCOLD um, has a recommendation of a thousand year design, um, the design life criteria for closure for tailings facilities. And so um, from that, I think that's where we get the, you know, the, the number of one in 10,000 year, um, you know, rainfall events, you know, making sure that um, these facilities are built so that they can, um, yeah, be, be stable in the long term. Oh, very good. Thanks, Chris. Um, just to, to mix it up a little bit, um, <clears throat> I'm going to throw a question to either Jason or Paul. This is from uh, Chris Wavell. So Jason... How do you weigh the various components in the rehab, such as say erosion versus species diversity pathway when you evaluate the scorecard or does failure in any one aspect take you into an intervention zone? Do you want to repeat yeah. that again? Or? Yeah, if you could, sorry, Matt. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the question is, how do you weigh the various components in the rehab such as erosion risk versus species diversity, when you evaluate the scorecard, or does failure in any one aspect take uh, take you into the intervention zone? Yes, so very very good questions. I did touch on it earlier um, in the presentation. So for site, when you're talking about erosion, um, you usually link back obviously to your slope conformance. So that's an element done in your desktop phase. So prior to your field monitoring, um, that there. Um, Chris can actually identify areas that are non-conforming or there's issues raised um, via your rehabilitation. So prior to even your field work, that can then throw um, the scorecard for that particular area into your rework, um, you know, or, or um, what was he talking about, remediation sort of phase. We need to step in and do maintenance work in that area. So that's why to actually have a look at your extensive field work being completed. Yeah, very good. Um, and there is a, there is a flow chart. I probably probably didn't oops, touch on sorry. it earlier. Go, Paul. You're right, Paul. Sorry, mate. I was just going to say quickly to there, Chris, that each aspect, be it erosion or or species diversity or species richness, whatever that may be, has a has a critical value and a critical weighting. And I'm not going to start describing the numerous meetings with a lot of ecologists and the like that were, were gone through to work out those weightings, but each aspect that is ranked on the report card has that, that value and the, and the associated weighting, which changes as you move along the rehab phase. Very good. Um, I might take this next one and, and I'll, I'll answer your question, Karen Fogarty, um, in regards to, um, you heard a lot today about the physical approach to rehabilitation and how how are we as an industry bringing in addressing the social values uh, held by the community for mine rehabilitation and i note that um and, and really appreciate the feedback you gave us on the on the rehab reforms um i guess the scope of the rehab reforms and, and our our role as a regulator under the mining act is is really around that physical um aspect of rehab um rehab as defined by the mining act is the the the, the treatment and management of, re, of, of land or water um, but I guess in terms of the, the broader framework for mine closure, um, you've got to look outside that and, and look at the, the development consent process as well. So you'll see in the development consent, there's, there's um, issues around social aspects. You'll see some of the objectives there um, around social aspects of closure. Um, so that's, that's handled more so at the, um, at the planning or the, or the local um, planning level, um, but certainly um, they may influence the actual rehab outcome, which is what we regulate on the ground. So 
I hope, I hope that answers your question. Um, my hands up at the moment. Paul, I know you've asked me to ask this. Um, did you want to have a bit of a chat about your um, your residual risk issue? Yeah, look, and you're probably a game man giving me the the microphone, Matt, I suppose. But um, look, I, I won't harp on about it, but uh, a lot of good conversation today around around the future of mining and, and post mining as well. We're talking about long long term time frames. There's a couple of key issues, I think, with with some of this work, and it, it's by no means a criticism, but th th there's got to be some account around us as land managers intervening into these issues as well. There's there's almost an assumption in a model that there's there's no monitoring, there's no maintenance, and I'm I'm sorry to harp on that word, but the the then added aspect to that is that. There's no guarantees that when we as the mining industry deliver that final outcome and meet that criteria, that that, that product is going to remain like that for a, a degree of time if no one maintains it. It's the same as, you know, my little farm here, someone's got to maintain it. So I guess that's where I'm going. That And the bigger picture then again is about uh, transitioning into another land use and that future landholder taking on a responsibility of, you know, let's call it general land maintenance or whatever that may be around um, erosion, weeds. Um, I, I think there's a, a lot of discussion to be had about how that's facilitated. There's a number of other uh, forums or, or discussions. I was on one yesterday about the, the regional strategy for the Hunter Valley and, and that's great, but We've got mechanisms here that we really need to understand how that risk gets transferred. I won't use my used car analogy, Chris, today. I, I know you want me to, but I, I won't bore everyone with it. But look, we, we really, as an industry, the community, the government, everyone needs to work together to understand that we need to move towards something else, but we need to understand how to facilitate that. Happy to be challenged or, or questioned for sure. No, listen, it's a really good question and, and Steve, jump in any time. Steve, I'll jump in any time, but um, I, might, I might start off. I guess when you look at um, an obligation set and a consent, whether it be going back to an agricultural land use or a native ecosystem, um, yes, we recognise that those systems, like any of those natural systems, will need some type of management. Um, essentially what we're, we're aimed to do um, in, in our space is to make sure that any risks uh, reduced to as low as reasonably practicable before we, we sign anything off um, and it's met the completion and it's met the obligations in, in that consent. Um, but as a whole of government, yes, there is some work underway at the moment in terms of looking at transitioning, um, but also, um, and I know Meg's, it's in their space at the moment in terms of you know, what to do with residual risk and we don't have an answer on that just yet, but that's some further work to be done to that. But in terms of transitioning, um, it's it's a it's a cooperative process. I would put it down to because oftentimes mining companies are the owners of land. It is their their asset, and they're looking to how do they dispose of that asset post closure. Um, mm. And and I think the secret to that is making sure you actually start that dialogue well in advance of my closure, um, because there are mechanisms under the Act where you can change land uses through consents, and then subsequently change requirements under under a uh, re uh, rehabilitation management plan, for example. So um, not, not, a, not a conclusive answer, but it's something that, yeah, I agree we need some further comments on. And if you want to add on that one, Steve, at all, or happy with that? No, I think you've covered it quite well, Matt. I've got nothing further to add. Good. Um, just looking through the, the questions. I'm trying to mix it up around a little bit. So um, a question from Michael Franken here is, um, what is the rehabilitation expectations around care and maintenance projects? Um, listen, I'll, I'll have a first crack at that. I, essentially, when we're talking about care and maintenance, um, I'm assuming you mean that companies or, or sites are going to a care and maintenance while they're evaluating future resources, for example, or the market may have dropped that they've actually put their 
their project on hiatus for a period of time. So um, broadly, ob rehabilitation obligations continue. Um, so they, they don't disappear if they go into care and maintenance. Um, and I guess through that care and maintenance process, we will be expecting again, um, their companies are actively um, trying to address those knowledge gaps. Um, so for example, if they've got tailings dams and they're still not sure about how they're going to cap a tailings dam, um, then we would expect that you're actively looking at that. You're actually implementing those studies. You're doing the risk assessments so that at the end of your care and maintenance phase, um, where you'll either go two ways, continued operations or go to the closure, we're not looking, looking at that lag um, before you go into that, uh, you're trying to address any lag of, of commencing those works. Um, and certainly, I guess, I think the provisions under the regulation now in terms of commencing rehabilitation as soon as reasonably practicable, um, I think we're on stronger ground now to challenge companies as to whether or not, um, yeah, we're, we're looking at future operations. I think we've got more leverage now to say, well, hang on, um, show us what you're actually looking at doing here so we can draw a line in the sand sooner rather than later. So do you want to say anything else there at all? Yeah, look, Matt, I agree. I think um, care and maintenance on face care and, care and maintenance on face value. I don't see that as being a reasonable excuse to to carrying out rehabilitation. So it'll be a case by case basis. But um, you know, in my mind, I totally agree that rehabilitation needs to occur and be ongoing, even due care and even through care and maintenance periods. So it'll be something that you know our, our inspectors and our compliance staff would assess on a case-by-case -case basis and, and make a determination around whether something was reasonably practicable or not. Very good. Um, Will Mitri, you're on board? There you are. Just a quick question for you, Will. Um, this is from Mark Harrower. Let's go back to it. So question, Will, what, what shape data is to be laid onto the portal for the AEMR? E.g., we provide noise monitoring reports, creek monitoring reports, etc. What would this data get loaded in as, as points file? Um, can you repeat that? Sorry, I was just crossing That's over. Okay. That's all right. So, so what shape data is to be loaded under the portal for the AMR? For example, uh, they for the noise monitoring points, creek monitoring points, they use um, point data. Um, what would you expect as part of the AMR? Although we're not requiring AMRs to, to come onto the line, but yeah, part... no, thanks, Matt. I got that now. Um, so you're referring to monitoring data, which we currently don't have a requirement to submit environmental monitoring data, such as noise monitoring and um, other other, I guess, point specific monitoring data. What we're looking at from an annual report and forward program point of view is the progress of rehabilitation. So where your rehab is up to, where, where your disturbance is for your, your site. Um, and we've got uh, current, current landform contours and the three forecast years. So jump onto the guideline document um, for the mine rehab portal and you'll see the, the, the requirements for the submission of that spatial data. But at present, there's no requirement to submit uh, monitoring data for, for noise, et cetera. Um, and I don't, we don't have any current um, plans in the pipeline for any additional data requirement. Well, thanks for that. Now, in the interest of sharing the love, um, so a question for you, Michelle or um, Chloe. So uh, this is from Griffin, uh, Griffin Taylor Dalton. So regarding the rehabilitation work at Mount Pleasant, how successful did you find the installation of habitat features within your rehab areas? Did fauna species utilizing these features, re re um, did they come back relatively quickly? Um, did you notice an increase in comp uh, competition among fauna species? Also, did you just use old hollow, hollow bearing trees or did you install nest boxes too? But I'll start with that. So, um, yes, the fauna species have utilised the habitat features extremely quickly. We've had galahs and other birds using them as um, nests and roosts within a couple of weeks of installation. So it's the habitat trees, fallen log piles and rock piles that we use on the rehab area itself. We have also installed nest boxes in some of our connectivity areas 
and we're tracking how those are working as well. Um, I'll hand it over to Michelle to go into a bit more detail of the fauna on the habitat trees in the rehab. Thanks, Chloe. So our rehab's quite young. Um, so we haven't undertaken detailed fauna studies yet to look at competition between species. But as Chloe covered, um, basically, as soon as we stood these trees up, regardless of the remaining progress of our rehab, so topsoil placement and ripping and seeding, um, bird species were already moving trees. Um, on the rehab, no, we haven't used any nest boxes. We've been very fortunate. We have been able to salvage a significant number of habitat trees. Um, we place in two habitat trees per hectare on our rehabilitation areas where possible, with the idea of facilitating um, wildlife corridors, not only across the landscape, um, linking in with the broader areas, so the Hunter River and other mine site rehabilitation, but up through the rehabilitation area um, as it transitions from our native woodland into agricultural areas. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, Paul or um, Jason? Just a quick question for you. Do you carry out all your rehabilitation reporting activity yourselves or do you seek support or engage consultants for some of the tasks? Was that from a consultant? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll probably, I'll probably throw to Jason, Matt, but most of our sites engage consultants and contractors. A lot of our physical rehab is bulk push is done by ourselves but then the, the final trim is usually performed by our contractor uh, and obviously we extensively use consultants in terms of monitoring and maintenance as well um, so yeah quite the the gamut Jace did you it's, want to add anything to that mate yeah the the only thing I'll add to it is it is a very again very extensive process um, what I mean by that we have weekly planning meetings on site in regards to rehab um, we've got monthly meetings that make sure there's alignment with you know your weekly plans and then your oncoming monthly plans um, and then they flow through the annual plans you know which is the stuff I was talking about earlier um, around your annual rehab enclosure plan which is reviewed by uh, Glencore the likes of Paul. Aside to that uh, from an internal perspective um, Glencore obviously likes to have a lot of plans and a lot of assurance that sites are trending in the right direction um, for ourselves, we've even done some recent work all the way to the end of the mine life at Mount Owen and beyond into the closure period down to the detail of um, you know, what material movement of BCM and dozers we're looking at to shorten that closure period. So utilising the services of um, Chris Baygood, who was on earlier, he um, yeah, has come in and made sure there's conformance to date versus our conceptual landform design. Very good, thank you, uh, Jason. Um, this, this is a question from Nathan Cooper and um, I'll point it your way, Greg. So is there scientific evidence comparing the stability of the creation of native vegetation cover to more aggressive and robust improved agricultural pastures that may have been present immediately prior to mining? Keeping in mind that the land surface landform will be highly modified when compared to the landform present at the time the same land area may have last been covered in native vegetation. You're on mute too, Greg. Yeah, very, very good question. Um, it's been something that I've been working at for quite a few years now, trying to back figure what is a, what is a natural erosion rate um, at the various areas where I've been working Arnhem Land, uh, around Ranger, here in the Hunter Valley, um, um, Western Queensland and also uh, Pilbara and Western Australia. Trying to back figure natural erosion rates is, 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 is fraught with difficulty because we've, we've modified the landscape extensively. Um, the only natural data I have for the Hunter Valley is um, some two catchments that are controlled by the New South Wales Forestry Corporation that, that, are, that are pristine. So I have, I have data for the eastern slopes of the Barrington Tops, which is, which is not mining country. Um, the ability to back figure a natural erosion rate is, is, is largely gone for the, for the, the, the grazing country here, here in, um, 
here in New South Wales and here in the Hunter. Arnhem Land, different, um, still pristine, still natural. We have, we have good, good numbers on, on background erosion rates there. However, what, what we've been doing here in the Hunter and elsewhere is using techniques like um, cesium-137, uh, natural tracer, to work out um, erosion rates uh, prior to, um, prior to uh, mining um, and using those erosion rates um, that are averaged, the, the cesium method uh, averages erosion rates over a 50 to 60 year period. Um, and we can use that number as a guide to, to, to indicate what a, a post mining lens, landscape should be aiming for in terms of an erosion rate. So it's so the erosion rate on the post mining landscape is commensurate with the surrounds. So um, in terms of natural um, or, or pre European erosion rates, very very difficult to do. Like I said, the only data that I that I know of is data that I have for, for the Crewe State Forest, um, Arnhem Land. Um, actually, I do have a little bit of data for the Mount Isa area. Um, but the rest of the data is for, for grazing country that's been extensively cleared um, and, and, and modified over the last 200 years. Um, right. so. Very good, thank you, thank you Greg. Um, I might just take this final question and I'll, I'll hand over to Steve or to, to wrap up, but just before I get to the final question, um, for those people who have actually lodged questions, um, we will get back to you on, on the specific questions that you ask. So um, just because we didn't get to it right now, um, we will we'll close it out. Um, but I just want to just touch on the, the question from Andrew Butler here, which is um, just saying a good comment from Paul uh, to add to the threat to that thread. Designing something as a walkaway solution for a thousand years is just not possible. Uh, we would not expect roads and bridges to be designed to function without ongoing maintenance over that period. They have a finite design life and durability. It is possible to use the same idea to provide ongoing management requirements for those structures. Um, can measure without risk, like a management program, schedule the cost associated with implementing that program. So that this could be the basis for residual risk, um, which may translate to a payment fund for the future landholders to understand ongoing requirements, liability. So um, just as a high level um, answer to that one, essentially, you know, we haven't landed on um, a design life for certain um, structures on site. I mean, we would be guided very heavily on, um, for example, ANCOL guidelines around tailing stands, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, 10,000 years, I think we're talking about for those type of facilities. But, you know, you look at that, that's really based on risk in terms of what you're actually trying to hold in some of those facilities. Hmm. But agree with your point, I think, um, primarily, I mean, why we're looking at this type of modelling is to actually understand what that risk is so that we can, you know, reduce that risk to as low as reasonably possible and then actually understand what that risk is. And that will feed into any discussions we have in the future about residual risk and how, how we deal with that. So, um, yes, I agree with the concept, um, but yeah, rest assured that um, we're, we're not concrete in terms of that design life yet. Is there anything else I've missed on that one, Chris? Um, no, no, I was just gonna say, look, we, we look to those guidelines as guidelines to help and the industry accept the guidelines. Um, you know, to use a recent example, um, you know, when we look at surface water management on a tailings facility, and if there's a drainage structure or, or, or spillway or drop structure that's built to a certain capacity to handle a one in 20 year event or one in a hundred year event, my question is, well, what is the consequence of a larger storm event? What happens if you get a, a significant weather event and what was the consequence to that structure um, if that if that that water management structure can't handle it, um, keeping in mind, you know, we I refer to that thousand year design life for Ankol. Um, so we we ask those questions, and it and it all it always comes back to a risk assessment. We want to understand what the risk is, what is the risk control, and and just borrowing on your words that you said earlier, Matt. You know, it's it's about um, minimising the the maintenance and the, um, you know, as reasonably practical, the ongoing maintenance and risk that would exist um, post-closure. So we're going to ask those hard questions now so that we get the best outcome. Very good. So, Steve, I might hand over to you for a bit of a, a wrap-up. Thanks, Matt. And uh, if I could start off, firstly, Matt, by thanking you for chairing today's forum. Um, you've done an excellent job and um, we all appreciate your efforts in... Um, making it run so smoothly. So, so well done, Matt. 
Um, secondly, if I could just thank all the speakers in the panel, um, your technical expertise and knowledge in your fields has contributed to a very successful day in my mind. Um, I've certainly found all of the presentations um, highly interesting and informative. Um, I'd also like to thank those behind the scenes. Um, so Bronwyn and Joanne, um, who are behind the scenes, who have, um, they're, out, they're in our industry engagement team. So they've assisted with all of our publications and promotional and marketing material. And of course, running today's event and, and driving um, this virtual platform. So we really appreciate your efforts as well. Um, where to from here? So from here, we'll be um, um, editing all of the presentations into um, sizable, uh, manageable chunks, and we'll be publishing those on our website over the, the coming weeks. So please keep an eye out for those and we'll promote those through our newsletter. Um, we'd encourage you to distribute um, those links and, and the, the, today's presentations to your networks and your teams internally at your, at your relevant mine sites um, so that others can also learn and benefit from today's um, today's forum. Um, just a quick reminder that if you are interested in having a uh, engagement session with our team around uh, transitioning to the rehab reforms um, for large mines by the 2nd of July next year, please send us an email and we'll be in touch to organise uh, an engagement session. Uh, and just finally, um, as you exit today's event, we will um, You'll, you'll see a link to a survey and we'd really encourage you to complete that survey to provide us with some feedback about today's forum so that we can make uh, improvements uh, and, and respond to any ideas you may have about how we can make these sessions uh, and these types of forums in the future even better um, than today's. Um, so finally, I just wish you all well in these difficult times, stay safe uh, and be well and uh, just to reiterate, we look forward to working with industry uh, into the future and, in, and bed down the rehabilitation reforms. So thank you, everyone, um, and take care.